Ja. Sorry? Sorry? Ja. Yeah. Alright. Ja? Ja, I'll uh, I'll send it on to Josh and Ed, yeah. Oké. Okay. Good morning from Bristol, where visibility is quite low and bad this morning, but landing lights are on and welcome to a runway with a difference, because throughout the next maybe three hours or so, you're going to see something rather extraordinary happening here in Bristol. Celebrating Bristol's aviation history, we're going to be bringing you a show that you probably won't have seen before. Well, the landing lights are on, tray tables stowed, and what else is there next to do? Bing bong, pitch air, flight 001, 
please all passengers pass through to the departure lounge. Your flight is waiting to board. This is Pitch Air Live. Welcome to Pitch Air Live, where we're in an extremely unusual arrivals lounge here, as you can see. Isn't it looking pretty spectacular? Over the next few hours, we're going to take you on a journey that really, I hope you'll never forget, where we're going to introduce you to some very interesting people that are going to make this possible and see a plane that really, should it be in the sky or should it be here? Well. It will be here a little later on. It's a 727, and we'll find out more about that a little later on today. But first of all, let's just uh, explain what's going to happen. First of all, this 727, which is currently at Kemble in Gloucestershire at Cotswold Airport, is being transported today via a lorry down all the motorways to Bristol, where it's going to end up here in a very foggy Brislington and it's going to be situated out the back here. Uh, and we're associated today with the Great Western Air Ambulance, so we'll give you more information a bit later on about how you can help raise money for the incredible charity. I'm going to take a seat here in my arrivals lounge, or is it a departure lounge? I'm not quite sure. Where throughout the show today, I'll be introducing you to some very special guests and hearing a little bit more about how aviation in Bristol is so well known around the world and also meet some people who know a little more than I do about this incredible 727. Follow us through this journey by going onto Twitter and using hashtag Pitch Air Live. And that's where you'll find us throughout the show. Before I show you around the studio and introduce you to my colleagues here to my right, we also have Johnny Palmer. Now, Johnny is at Kemble Airport in Gloucestershire, where the 727 is currently getting ready to get on the road to us. So let's go and join Johnny now and find out how things are going on. Johnny. Thanks, Chris. So I'm down at Cotswolds Airport right now, and in just a moment, I'll be going round this fence here, down to where this pile of old aircraft is. And in a few moments, we're gonna start up the engine of this massive lorry and drive the fuselage across the runway to the crash gates there. And then we're gonna turn out onto the main road and start the journey of pitch air on its way to Bristol. Back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Johnny. Great. And we'll be going back to Johnny throughout the morning here, probably until 12 o'clock. But we're not going anywhere. We're gonna follow his journey with the 727 all the way to Bristol. And we're gonna show you inside it. This uh, plane has a rather lively interior. Uh, and we'll tell you why a little later on. The plane that is coming to Bristol is a 727-100. It was originally commissioned by Japan Airlines in 1968, uh, and then it was turned in the 70s into a VIP plane. And it has a rather unusual interior, which I must say uh, uh, will surprise you a little later on. Think of the 70s and think of the odd colors that you would associate with that era. Uh, this plane hasn't lost any of that. Before we move on and talk about the plane itself and introduce you to some guests, I want to bring in Jamie and Lucy, who are over there looking at social media. Why is this plane so special? Well, Chris, we're going to be learning a lot about the plane today from here, the information uh, station and the social media check-in desk. So this plane was really developed to bridge a gap between uh, smaller airports with shorter runways. So there's something really, really cool and interesting about this plane, and it's all to do with the flaps on the wings. We're going to be hearing lots and lots about flaps today. Um, and the reason that these flaps are so interesting is because it made the plane really, really nimble, so it could take off and descend 
really quite dramatically. So really fast um, uh, descents and takeoffs. So uh, we're going to be hearing lots more about the plane and all its little interesting bits and bobs. But over here with myself and Lucy, we have our eyes firmly on social media. Um, and Lucy, quite a lot of people are already watching and engaged, aren't they? Anna Perry, who is the CEO of GWAC, mm -hmm. um, the Great Western Ambulance uh, Air Service. So she has tweeted saying, one of the great things about being part of GWAC is the amazing and completely random things that happen. So stay tuned this weekend for hashtag Pitch Air's incredible journey. And to be honest with you, random is definitely one way to describe what's going to happen today, I would say. But random has kind of taken on its own form, hasn't it? In the last year alone, unprecedented, random, extreme. Well, those, those are the words. I mean, I'm just happy to have trousers on for the first time in probably two years. I'm just happy to be out of the house. And, and I, honestly, I feel like I'm in the business lounge at Bristol Airport. And it's, it's really exciting. And uh, it's going to be a really exciting morning. So if you do want to be part of it, uh, like Lucy said, there's more than 100 people watching is that on Facebook and then there's 25 about on YouTube that's set to build so if you are watching along and you do want to get involved it's really easy to do so how do they do that Lucy yep so you just go to Facebook and you follow us at pitch or you go to Twitter follow us with pitch UK on Twitter or go to our LinkedIn with pitch again on LinkedIn you can sense the theme here <laughs> um, so we're live on Facebook and on LinkedIn and we are live tweeting as well so just use the hashtag uh, pitch air um, and we will, you know, we'll read out your tweets. And then there's one more thing that we're going to be doing here, which is uh, picking up on some really interesting stories that have happened to these Boeing 727s. So Lucy, give us a flavour of what's to come. Yeah, so some very odd and peculiar things have happened with this uh, particular aircraft over the years. Um, so just a taste of what's coming up. We've had um, thieves um, hijacking the plane. Um, we've had planes just disappearing and not actually being found. So we've got a few really interesting stories yeah. um, to keep you interested along this journey. There we go. So Johnny, if you, you're hiding anything about this plane, we're sure to find it out yes, from we the will information know. We will station. Find out today. Uh, but Chris, there's, there's lots to come and lots more interesting things to uh, find out about this plane. Which, and you're going to be talking to some experts too, aren't you? I am indeed. Thank you, yes, uh, very much indeed. Uh, coming up in a few moments' time, I'll be talking to... Tony Carey, who is a former Royal Navy petty officer who specialised in aeroplanes just of this sort, and uh, a fascinating bit of history as well. He knows everything you could ever want to know about the 727. Now, just before we move on, and before we go back to Johnny, who's at Kemble, just about to set off down to Bristol now, let me tell you about uh, the charity, the Great Western Air Ambulance. Now, you may have seen it fly overhead a number of times. It's the green aircraft, the helicopter, and a few years ago a helipad was installed on top of the, the uh, Bristol Royal Infirmary because it could land there and take patients from accidents and all sorts of incidents across the Avon area uh, in much quicker than it would be if you were to travel by uh, road ambulance. Now it's so important that we help the Great Western Air Ambulance Charity survive. So we're asking you today to please help out and donate three pounds by texting AIR to 70085. That's 785, 70085. And three pounds will be given to the charity directly. The cost of that text is three pounds. So the terms and conditions are on our website. Search Pitch Air on the internet. Uh, the f well, the Great Western Air Ambulance is just so important to us here in, in Bristol and uh, it's great that uh, we can be associated uh, here on this show with the charity because today it's all about celebrating Bristol's aviation history and we've been to meet those at the uh, Great Western Air Ambulance. Take a look at this. My name's Dan Davis. I'm one of the trainee uh, specialist paramedics in critical care down here with Great Western. I'm new to the unit, um, so I joined here in August last year um, and I came from another ambulance service, so actually I've come from London. I've been a paramedic or I've been working for 16 years in London uh, and actually flew with HEM services in London and with Essex and Hearts and I was one of the advanced critical care paramedics in London as well. So I've kind of moved down here for 
a change of job and a new challenge and a change of lifestyle as well. Um, but I'm kind of going through the same trainee process that all the other guys are going through down here as well, learning the ropes, learning about um, how SWAST work as an ambulance service, but how the, um, the air ambulance works and getting experience kind of working down here. So I, one of my roles is a, as a helicopter technical crew member. So I fly in the front of the aircraft um, and before we actually get to the patient is my role is to actually help the pilot with navigation, uh, with comms in the air, uh, plotting the routes um, and actually just the, the safety around kind of us flying as well. So that's a, that's a new skill for me as well. So the, the pilot does the kind of all the flying and kind of, but I need to understand what all the various dials are in the front, um, can help out with navigation. Um, if you can imagine like if we're, we're mid-flight and we get cancelled on the job but then get redeployed to another job, I've got to then plot everything while we're in the air, replot a route, send it across to the pilot and then kind of work out where we go from there as well. Great Western are providing a critical care team from 7 o'clock in the morning until 1 o'clock in, in, in the following morning, either in, in the air or on cars. The aim is we're bringing the hospital to the patients, so we're going to the, the, the sickest patients that really need their intervention in the first hour of their medical incident or their, their traumatic accident or their traumatic injury. Um, so what we're bringing is the ability of the, the, the treatment that, that these patients will receive in a hospital and we're bringing it to their bedside or to the roadside. Um, so whether it's surgical intervention or medical intervention, um, we can do things above and beyond what the, the road paramedics are able to do. It's a fantastic charity. You know, as I said, we are utterly reliant on kind of, you know, the donations that we receive from all around our, of our region. You know, we can't do it without you. We're here to kind of serve everyone we can do in the region that we go to, but we, you know, we, we certainly can't, um, we can't operate without the sort of donations we have. And one last question. Yeah. 77 as an office, what do you think? I think it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, we, we were looking at, literally just looking at it this morning and uh, just thinking, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, we, we were just talking about somewhere to live. I'd, I'd live in somewhere like that, to be honest with you. So to have it as an office would be, would be awesome. So I'm looking forward to coming and seeing it if possible. Brilliant, thank you very much. All right. It's a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Well, it's a great story, and we'll hear more from the Great Western Air Ambulance as we go throughout the show today. Welcome to Pitch Air Live. We are here in Bristol, welcoming a 727 to Brislington, where it's going to take up its position here, just behind the studio, and we'll show you where it's going to go a little later on. We're going to also go live to Johnny Palmer, who is with the plane and follow his progress from Kemble in Gloucestershire all the way to Bristol, down the M5, then the M4, then the M32, then the Ring Road up here to Bonville Road in Brislington. Now to hear a little bit more about what this plane is and where it's from and a little bit about its history, I want to bring you, uh, introduce you now to Tony Carey, who's from the Royal Navy, spent many, many years in the Royal Navy. I'm sure we'll get to know each other over the next couple of hours or so, Tony. <laughs> Um, but I want to know uh, from your side of things, because you're a petty officer. So I was a chief petty officer. Chief petty officer, oh, I yeah. beg your pardon. Uh, you would have known a lot about aircraft in your time. So yes. 727, tell me about it. Was it well, a good plane? When it was designed, it was designed for a specific purpose. The 707 was designed to, to, to mass transport, really, get people to the big airports of the world quickly. The only problem was they couldn't then get into the smaller airports in the Far East and in the Caribbean. So um, the 727 was then designed. And the thing about the 727 was it, it was designed with a new concept of flaps so that it, it, it could actually descend amazingly rapidly. This rather backfired on Boeing because what they didn't do was train the pilots to get used to this rapid descent. So they had these pilots who had been trained on the 707 sitting in the cockpit of the 727. Oh, yeah, here we are coming to Hong Kong or wherever. Doing this rapid descent and not realizing that when you've got <coughs> however many tons, 80, 100 or whatever it is, tons of aircraft descending it rapidly, although it's under control, it does take a time to stop. And they, in, the, in the States, they actually had three crash in three months when it was new. And they suddenly realized that 
menorah, we haven't trained the pilots properly. So that it was then, you know, so Boeing have enough problems now with the 737. They had problems with the 727. Um, it, but basically, that was just a training issue. And once they had got over the training problem, um, the aircraft then became amazingly popular. Originally, it was designed to sort of sell four or 500. And in the end, they sold something like 1,800. It was a very, very popular aircraft. And um, f fundamentally flew from the very early 60s right the way through till I think the last flight was something like 2018 or 2019. And that was a Dutch, uh, uh, a Dutch aircraft, I think. I can't remember. I think it was Dutch. Um, uh, so it, it's a huge uh, time span, you know, nearly as long as a 747. Um, but I, from what I understand now, with the the aftermath of the of the pandemic, that the 747 is probably a lot of their, a lot of companies have put them in a, a field somewhere and are trying to forget about them. Mm. So if Johnny has a project in about ten years' time, <laughs> there are plenty of 747s. The need a home. <laughs> I think we'll need a slightly bigger area than what we've got out here. And we'll show you where the 727 is going to go a little later. So don't go anywhere because it's pretty special. It's going to go outside on some shipping containers and you should be able to see it from the road as well. Now, you mentioned that the 707 was an incredibly noisy aircraft and the 727 was brought in, as we've learned already, as a kind of stopgap between uh, the larger planes and the smaller ones that carried maybe a few. So this aircraft also had very loud engines, didn't it? Yeah. Why? Well, that's fundamentally, it was, it was just of the design. Um, what, what you had really was a tube with this gas turbine engine in and once you got it going, you were sucking in a lot of air. You were doing a lot of energy, uh, importing a lot of energy into that air and then blasting it out the back. And that was an exceedingly noisy bit of kit. It wasn't until Rolls-Royce developed the RB211 with this massive bypass shield that um, actually then the noise was greatly reduced. And so the RB211 was its pathfinder, but I mean, these, this was, um, oh, I forget which, which I, I, it's, it's in my notes, um, but yeah, the aircraft, the, the engines that uh, the 727 yeah. had, three of them yeah. tail mounted. I mean, they weren't in a very sensible place anyway, to be truthful, they had a job to get to. Mm. Maintenance on them was a nightmare. If you had to change the center engine, that was taking half the fuselage away mm. because it, it just accessing, it was a nightmare of a job. So. Fundamentally, it wasn't a very good design, but it became in, it eventually, as I say, a very popular aircraft. Um, and I believe that we have some video uh, that we filmed in the week of uh, the 727, which is uh, coming down to Bristol on its way. Um, it hasn't got any wings on it anymore, because obviously they've been removed. So they've got those stubby little wings on both sides. So we will see that when it arrives. Um, but it's still got its wheels. We've got uh, a couple of them here, as you can see, yes. and they are incredibly heavy. And we'll talk about the undercarriage and the wheels, etc., a little bit later on. And uh, we'll go through the insides of the plane and look at the cockpit as well, because that is quite something. The cockpit is... Um, now, there's another point about the 727. Yeah, because it had three engines, it required a cockpit crew of three. It had to have two pilots and an engineer. And the idea was that if there was a problem, number one pilot would work with the engineer to resolve the problem. And number two pilot would carry on flying the plane. Engineers don't come cheap. And that was another additional cost <laughs> to, the, uh, to the aircraft. So there, it, it really sort of it built in sort of several issues. Um, and the undercarriage that we're seeing now, as you can see in the big screen behind us, here it is. There's the plane, such a, a, a beautiful bird, really. Um, how much did these planes weigh? Because they must have been a pretty heavy uh, weight back in 1968 when they came into service. I haven't a clue, but I can tell you. <laughs> I know a man who does. No. Um, and and it's, it's in, I, I've got the data for you. Uh, if, you know, All right, we well, we'll moment, come back I'll, to that I'll a little later. And you. actually, we'll set that to the social media guys as well as a task. If you can find out how much a 727 weighed with the wings, that's with the wings. As you can see, R-77 doesn't have the wings on it because it's being transported down here. It doesn't also have 
the, uh, the T-shaped tail fin, uh, but it also, uh, as you can see here from, you can see it on the screen, uh, we're missing the, the end um, tail section, but we have got the, the cone outside here, which we'll visit a little bit later on. But here it is. It's pretty spectacular, isn't it? It's been living at Kemble up in Gloucestershire for the last eight years, waiting for a new owner that is now Johnny Palmer. And talking of Johnny, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, he's setting off from Kemble soon to try and get down here, isn't he? Johnny, uh, what's going on? And Chris, another deviation to the plan. I was on the wrong side of the airfield. I was over there, but it turns out there's no gate over there. So we're out on this side now, which is the A429. And soon our guy Steve's gonna drag the aircraft around. He's gonna open up these crash gates and turn here onto the rows. I just hope we don't get stuck on the first corner because soon we have to get this same thing through Sirencester. Film crew behind us here, Laurie and Lorne, they've been filming throughout the day and their content's gonna be sent across to the news agencies. If you're a news agency and watching, get in, get in contact, we'll send you the footage. Uh, yeah, and I'll keep you updated on what happens. Back to you in the studio, guys. Okay, that's great, Johnny. Thank you very much indeed, and we'll be back with him shortly. Now, I think we've actually got an answer to that conundrum. How heavy is a 727? Guys over in Social Corner in the Arrivals Lounge, what's yes. the answer? So, so the, 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 the Mark 100, because the, the, the later variant was is a little bit larger, so I think we've got here that it was just shy of £170,000. So that's 76,700 kilograms. That's what um, the internet is telling me. Does that sound about right? Does that yeah, sound right? Yeah, yeah, a little bit less than 100 tonnes, but um, <laughs> near as damn it, really. You know, so what's, um, yeah, so 75 tonnes, that sort of order. Well, I, I wouldn't yeah. be able to do the conversion now, but I, we're not going to weigh it, so that'll probably be the, the best that we'll get today. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much indeed uh, to both of you. Um, we're uh, going to stay in touch with Johnny over the next two, three hours, and I can tell you that it, it's it's looking quite close now. He's about to set off from Kemble. Just a, a couple of more questions to Tony, who's joining me here uh, in the studio. A, of course, a former uh, Chief Petty Officer with the Royal Navy. Let yes. me get that title absolutely correct. Um, in terms of the 727 itself, it had this tri-engine formation at the back of the plane. Now, I imagine if you look at a, a normal, I say a normal because they are more routine now made where the engines are on the side under the wings, um, how did that affect its flying ability? It, it shouldn't make a great deal. For, for example, if you're flying what we're going to call a conventional aircraft with one end pod underneath each wing and you lose an engine, as happened last week in, uh, in the what is it, States, yes. wherever, um, immediately you, you, you would have significant asymmetrical uh, thrust. So, yeah, this engine's going to be dragging like mad. This one's going to be thrusting away. Control, I would guess, would be rather challenging. But with that bit of kit there, everything's at the back. It, it's, I wouldn't have thought there was, you know, you, if you were to lose an engine, it, yes, you would lose power, but you, I don't think you would be in the problem that you would have the problem that you would on a, on a conventional mm. aircraft. Um, I don't know, for example, if you were to lose two engines, how you would lose two, I don't really know, but if you were, I guess it was possible that you might be able to control the descent on the one engine, but they weren't particularly powerful. Um, they weren't the greatest of engines, as we found out. The, these new bypass engines, they are marvelous bits of kit. And, you know, engine, engineers, it's the nearest thing we get to sex is when we stand inside the intake now and we put our arms up this and we can't touch the walls. It's fabulous. And it's a, a wonderful feeling. Very, very impressive, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And we'll go more about the engines a little later on. Pratt & Whitney was the maker of the, awesome. the manufacturer of the engines on this 727, but of course, here in Bristol, it's well known around the world that we have Rolls-Royce that's based here, and they make the engines for many of the Boeing planes, uh, as well as Airbus that's based here as well, a factory over in uh, Filton. Uh, okay, we'll pause there, Tony. Thank you for that. Just stay where you are, because we've got more facts coming your way, and uh, uh, a chat a little bit later on uh, as well. Now, uh, let's see if we can go back to Johnny, who is trying to leave a Kemble at the Cotswolds Airport. Johnny.
a little car, a people can... Oh, no, they're moving the aeroplane already. The aeroplane's moving. It's not supposed to move. I've got to rig up the cameras. So, Joe in the studio, producer Joe, this might mean we don't get our live streaming. And also, it might be that our Zajis have gone missing. But that is actually the aeroplane moving. How cool is that? This is mentally exciting. Look at that. The aircraft's actually moving. And here's where I try and do some filler time. So, Chris, you might want to turn my mic off and you do the talking. Or you can keep listening to my smooth Australian tones. So, there it is. Steve Cook, Cook Transport in the distance, dragging an aeroplane out. We've got three vehicles with us. I don't know if they're the police escorts. They're not police cars. But it does look like they're kind of quite serious looking dudes who are going to probably be the escorts down the motorway. Here it comes, guys. Right, I'm going to turn this camera off in a second because I've got work to do, try and desperately get the tracker and the live stream working. So to reiterate, the plan was I was going to get here this morning, get in there, fire up the inverter, get the... Um, 4G modem working and run the live camera screen, but Steve, the transport guy, hasn't messed around. He's got straight in there. I am told that these people are pretty hardcore. They just don't mess around. They do things an hour early, and it's always ahead of schedule, um, which is kind of what you want, I suppose, when you're, when you're moving an aircraft. Okay, so I've got to jump on board, try and get the stream work, get in the cab, and I'll see you soon. Back to you in the studio. Johnny, great. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll be back with Johnny, as you can imagine, throughout the next couple of hours or so. Uh, a mad Aussie uh, trying to track a plane down in Gloucestershire. Uh, you couldn't make it up, but uh, it's going to be exciting. And if you are an aviation expert, uh, please do contact us. I'll give you some information of how we do that a little bit later on. Uh, if you're watching from wherever you are around the world, why not get in touch with us and tell us where you are and uh, what you'd like to say about the 727. We're holding back a lot of what it looks like because we want to save it for as long as possible until you see it arrive here. Probably, well, we're thinking in a couple of hours' time. It's coming from Gloucestershire down to here. It's about 40 miles or so. Uh, but uh, just to bring you up to date with uh, the social side of things, let's first of all go across to Jamie and Lucy, who are keeping an eye on Twitter. Over to you guys. Lots going on, lots of people excited, um, lots of people getting involved online. Hashtag Pitch Air if you've got any questions for us over here at the information station. Um, but we've got lots of people watching on Facebook, Lucy, haven't we? And people um, wondering about where the plane is. You can may maybe yes. let... Oh, um, that they're asking um, about how they can watch it and how they can get involved and that sort of stuff, aren't they? Yes, so we've got loads of people commenting on our Facebook Live video. Um, a lot of people saying where they're going to be uh, standing or situated to try and catch a glimpse of the plane as it makes its journey down from Gloucester. Um, we actually have Julie jaffa fen -Gowing. Apologies if I've said anything incorrectly there. Um, she's hoping to watch from a bridge in Dursley. So that's really exciting, Julie. Please definitely grab a picture if you can. Um, send it on Twitter or Facebook. Use the hashtag Pitch Air. We would love to see the actual plane in motion going down the motorway. That would be amazing. Um, we've got a lot of people asking if there's a tracker aboard, um, the route of the actual plane. Um, we're going to divulge all of that, I'm sure, very soon, talking about the actual route that the plane is going to be going, um, whether there's any problematic twists or turns in that journey. Fingers crossed the plane isn't going to get stuck. <laughs> um, and yet we've actually got someone called Mark Lawrence. He's wished us the best of luck. Thank you so much, Mark. And he is watching from Canada. So that's pretty amazing amazing isn't it someone from Canada watching our plane how fitting for a morning like this a truly international celebration because I mean it's been a pretty uh, crappy uh few months, couple of years maybe for, for most of us. So doing something like this is really um, making me feel a bit more positive for the future. But I've just got a, a question here from Richard McGee, who um, maybe Chris, you could answer this. Um, or you've been alluding to it so far. He's asking, what does it look like inside? Has it been stripped? Now the inside is what I'm most excited to see about this plane. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I have seen inside it, and it's uh, pretty spectacular. Uh, if you imagine uh, an old 1970s house, uh, and it was a VIP plane in the last section of its life, so that might indicate what the insides might be like. It hasn't got the rows of seating. You need to stay tuned, because I'm going to show you what it looks like. So, actually, here it comes now. So, in the screen behind me, 
you can see that it's a pretty much adjusted plane now. It's got uh, some sofas, uh, some chairs. It's even got a dining room table there and uh, some really comfy seats that you'd normally find in first class. Uh, ashtrays, because of course, dating back to the 60s and 70s, you could smoke on board planes. And the cockpit that uh, Tony talked about uh, a little earlier on is there. This is the view from the windows as you're sitting there as the first officer or captain of the 77, uh, looking out. Uh, can you imagine what it must have been to fly this, this incredible beast? Now, the interesting thing, we'll talk about this in a moment, but this plane had an air stair, which is unusual now because in the... In the 70s, what you used to be able to do is that you would turn up at your plane to get on it, and you'd go across to the back of the plane where a staircase would lower down like this from the back, and you would ascend through the, the back side of the plane, if you like, not through the windows. Um, Tony, is that unusual today to find those sort of planes with that access? Yes, it is. In fact, um, th there's a point made about this in, in the the various bits and bumps I've got there. Um, I think there's a, it, it, there's a, it develops a weakness in the design of the airframe, as, as far as I could understand. Uh, otherwise, I mean, it, it seemed quite commonsensical. You know, you could load at the front, you could load at the back. And I, it was a, a trait, I was out in Hong Kong in the early 70s at Kai Tak when the Bader Meinhof terrorists bought in a load of aircraft, or bought in one particular aircraft to Kai Tak while I was there. And this had the, this drop-down. Um, so, so maybe it was a 727. I don't honestly remember. It was, we were a bit busy at the time. And um, I remember this particularly because, um, yes, the, the, the back end of the aircraft was where all the activity happened, when the activity happened after that. So um, maybe it was a 727 with this facility to drop down the... the, the it's quite unusual, isn't it? it? Yeah, you don't see it now. I mean, as you know, people, we, we always load ridiculously through the one door, um, which means that loading an aircraft can take, well, if it's a big, one of the big ones, you know, it takes an hour, yeah. you know, and you think, oh, good, we're on our way, sit down, 45 minutes later, you're still loading, you know, you haven't moved an inch. Yeah, so it is unusual, yeah, sure. Yeah. But I... I Specifically why, I, I mean, I would guess it was a weakness, but I can't think of other, any other reason why not. Well, we're going to show you around the plane a little bit later on, so uh, let's not spoil the surprise. Tony, thank you very much okay. for the moment. It's just gone half past nine. You're watching Pitch Air Live, and we'll be later on in this hour looking at the tracker that's live at the moment, where Johnny and the team will be bringing the aircraft to the motorway and bring it down. So there is a tracker. We've had a couple of inquiries about that, and we'll be showing the tracker in the large screen behind me here in the arrivals hall at Pitch Air in just a few minutes. But first, we need to go back up to Gloucestershire to find Johnny to see what the latest is. Johnny. We'll, uh, we'll come <laughs> Right, Johnny's phone is upside down. Uh, and you can see he's, uh, it, well, he's an Australian, right? So he's got to work upside down. So at the end of the day, this is sort of normal for Johnny Palmer. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, come, we'll come back to Johnny. We'll, we'll come back to you in just a minute when you're the, the, the right way up, I think. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, well, welcome back to the, the arrivals hall here at Pitch Air Live. Uh, we are live, and uh, I do hope you can stay with us for the next couple of hours or so. Anything can happen, and that's the whole point of what we're doing today. It's fun, and it's uplifting, and we can now look ahead to what will be uh, hopefully a fantastic year after the coronavirus has passed us by. The aviation industry throughout the world has been affected by the pandemic in such a, a horrifically and also cruel way. The airlines in the UK have been grounded. Many airlines have also seen share prices fall as air traffic is reduced and forced people to stop going on holiday. In the UK here, it's actually illegal to go on holiday under the Coronavirus Act. Now, that hopefully over the next few months will change. It means that we can get on our, our flight to our sunnier climes to get that suntan that we so desperately need. And also, uh, before that, hopefully a haircut. 
uh, which is afflicting uh, all of us uh, here. I understand that we can actually now go back to Johnny, who might be the right way up. Johnny, over to you. Okay, guys, it's all happening now. The fence is opening. The truck's been started up. The coppers are getting very serious now. This is like, don't mess around. It's not fun. Don't laugh. Um, so I'm kind of keeping away from them. So they're going to go on ahead. And what they're going to do is make sure that the intersections are closed so traffic doesn't come across. And then in a moment, I'm going to jump on board with Steve, the driver, in his cab right at the front there. So let's just stand back and capture this spectacle. I guess it's going to be a slightly long form piece now. And let's try to not get hit by cars because this is actually a pretty, pretty um, busy A road here. So there it is, pitch air, Boeing 727-100 series. You've probably heard all this before, but 1968, Japanese airline, and then it was um, kitted out as a private jet for we think a Saudi prince and then a whole series of other people that have flown it over the years. Last flight, 2012, down to Filton Airfield in Bristol, and then transported finally by Rose to Kemble Airfield, and now it's back on the road again. So I'll be honest here and say this is not actually the first time this aircraft's been on the road. So I better jump in that cab in a moment uh, to catch my lift, otherwise I'm going to be left behind. And that is no fun. They did say it's going to be a slow operation though, so um, yeah, let's see what happens. It definitely needs a wash as well. So probably next week or the week after, we're going to get the pressure washer up there and use some traffic film remover to take off all the algae and the filth. And it should come back like a really nice, white, crisp look. And then in time, we're going to get some artwork done to it, but initially just some branding. Bit of a crowd gathered here, don't worry, everyone's very socially distanced. Good sunshine, good weather, nice and warm as well. Quite a few masks on too. We've had a few of the national photographers down here as well today from um, Reach PLC doing some shots and also one of the guys from Associated Press too. So hopefully this story will bring a few smiles and a few rolled eyes to, a, to some people in the Sunday papers tomorrow. <laughs> For me personally, this is awesomely excited. Two years of like fighting and battles and learning and education and paperwork. Oh, the paperwork. And now it's all happening. This is just insane. I've never seen anything like this before. And if you're wondering what that hole is, that's the S duct. So what happened was there was a third engine in the middle of the aircraft and its air intake came from the top of the fuselage, got sucked around in an S duct and then out through the jet engine. So actually, when it's fully constructed, that will be sticking out about an extra 12, maybe 14 foot out the back there. This is just epic. You don't see that every day, do you? Look at this. There's a few creaking sounds there. It's not gonna roll off, is it? Let's hope. This is chaos. Check it out. <laughs> Imagine coming down this road. Look at that. Be like, oh, there's something blocking the road. This is insane. There's a good shot there, mate. I'll stand on the road for you. Yo! Oh, I'm being bossed around. Better do as I'm told, or they'll be big trouble. These are some serious dudes. They proper know what they're doing, and I'm being told to get in the cab. Check that out. Bunch of 747s. From what I hear, they're all for sale, too. This is Steve. He's the main man. I've got to do what I'm told with this guy. He's serious. Thanks, Steve. It's like a chauffeur, too. <laughs> right. Whoa. Okay. Okay, now we're in the cab. I'll get the mask on in a second. This is cool. Go. Go. Signing out. Back to you in the studio. Right. Johnny, thank you very much indeed. Now, this is where it gets exciting here on Pitch Air Live because the tracker is going live. And we can introduce you to the live tracker that you can watch at home on your phones or on your computer and see the plane as it leaves Gloucestershire heading for the M5. Now, before we uh, hear any more about the history of it, let's think how we're gonna track it. Over to Jamie and Lucy. Yes, that does seem to be one of the most popular questions, doesn't it, Lucy? So hello to uh, Helen Hopkins and Alex Threlfall, who are very excited to actually see the plane. So Alex says he's waiting patiently around junction 14. 
um, and Helen is just asking, wh where is it? Where is it? Um, so we do have a live tracker today, which will help explain the route and help you to know where you can catch a glimpse of this plane because it's it's really exciting is it the, the viewing figures jump as soon as people catch a glimpse of the plane so at uh, least explain the the tracker to us and and the route in which this plane is going to go on yes certainly i will so um the tracker is actually inside the plane i believe um and it's just getting ready it's just leaving as we saw johnny uh to depart on its route so it will actually leave cotswold airport which is where it is right now and it actually goes and heads towards Sirencester, loops around Sirencester and heads up, he uh, heads up, <laughs> it will head up the A417. So on the A417, it's a straight route. It kind of does a few little curves around Badgeworth um, up to Gloucester, and then it will eventually get on the M5. So the M5 is the largest part of the journey that it will be taking and hopefully a lot of our viewers are going to be on bridges along the way and we'll be able to get some snaps of it. Um, and then once it's come down the M5, it will come off onto the M4. Um, it will come around Bristol uh, on one of the A roads, I believe, and it will be heading to our yard. So really exciting to see uh, to see the developments of its journey. Absolutely, it's it's going to be one of the most spectacular things that um, a lot of people will have seen in in a long time. Just looking at, at the comments that are coming in, we've got Jasper uh, Larson here. He says he's watching from Denmark from a company. Wait for it, called Seven Two Seven. Who? wait for this, have a 727 out in their front oh, no yard. Way. So Jasper, uh, Jasper, sorry, forgive me. If, if, if you um, are, are there right, right now at, at your workplace, do send us a picture of your 727 out in your yard because there's gonna be so many pictures of, of ours, um, no doubt on the way. So please do, if you are planning to stand on a motorway bridge and watch this plane as it shoots down, well, we hope it doesn't shoot down. We hope it goes oh, steadily no. down. Flies down, <laughs> Flies down, maybe. <laughs> uh, the, the, the M5. Do you, um, send us those pictures in. It's hashtag pitch air. But I, that's what I've been seeing. What have, what have you been seeing on the socials? Um, so, again, a lot of people asking where it is. Um, a lot of people um, saying what time is it leaving. Um, one lovely person called George Mason has said, it's my, birth um, my girlfriend's birthday and we're going to watch it from the M5. What a great way to spend your birthday. I wouldn't have said that a year ago. Don't think anyone would have said that a year ago, but now it is actually a really exciting thing um, to watch and to be a part of. Well, we, we do what we can and we do hope you're in, enjoying this morning so far. An interesting morning for me, you know, never mind any anyone else. This has been um, very, very informative and exciting. And uh, Chris, the information just keeps coming where you are because you, of course, got an expert to talk to all day. We certainly have. Indeed. Uh, Jamie and Lucy, thanks very much indeed. Uh, now, uh, just to also let you into uh, another part of the show, the 727 is arriving here in Brislington. Uh, it's coming down the M5, as you heard. In fact, we've got a camera out the back on the roof that I think we can take a look at now, just to show you where it's going to eventually end up. So there are the shipping containers out the back of the Pitch Air studio, and it's going to be lifted onto those shipping containers at some point tomorrow. Uh, if you follow us on Twitter, hashtag Pitch Air Live, uh, you'll be able to see the pictures and the video of that happening. And Johnny won't be upside down. He'll be the right way up, but he'll be back here in Brislington, as he will be, hopefully, in about a couple of hours' time. If you were to drive that route from Kemberley, Gloucestershire, you might have noticed from the tracker, it'll take about an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes, something like that. Of course, it's going to take a lot longer because it's on the back of a low loader uh, lorry. Now, Tony Kerry is a, a former Royal Navy uh, chief petty officer, uh, aviation expert, my guide to uh, the 727 and others. Now, we were looking at the trolley. I call it a trolley. It looks like a trolley, doesn't it? A supermarket yeah. trolley, really, that's bringing this plane to us. Why is this so special? Well, I think the trailer itself is probably 70 feet long. The aircraft is probably about 60 feet long. Um, Johnny reckons that the weight of the aircraft alone is about 15 tonnes. Not a great weightage, but the length of that um, trailer is immense, you know, really. And, and you think of it in these little Gloucestershire lanes, getting around some of these corners. And, you think, and Johnny said this week, um, 
that it wasn't, didn't have rear wheel steering. And I thought, well, that's it. It's going to be stuck up at M McDonald's up there yeah. on the A4. Yeah. We're never going to get it down here. <laughs> But in actual, I've just noticed that as it was coming out, it came out backwards and it does have rear wheel steering. So that, um, uh, that and that's a clever bit of kit in itself because yeah. this day and age, yeah. it, that's all computerized. Whereas in my younger days, there would have would been a man on the back with a steering wheel. You know, it's that, that, that's how life has gone on. But so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it coming down, particularly when it comes to Brislington, because that's the first real um, maneuverability, maneuver, maneuvering uh, challenge it's going to have coming off of the A4, coming down and turning into, uh, whether it's going to come straight down Bonville Ro uh, Emery Road into Bonville Road, or it's going to come around Broomhill Road and then come down Dixon Road or whatever uh, the, the plan is. But um, yeah, the, the, when the, I've just seen the route and I'm thinking, my God, they've they've got bird lip to, to negotiate. Now they that have. roundabout they there have. is they have steep. That yeah. is very steep. Yeah. I mean, there are accidents there every week. There are accidents there. The A four one seven is blocked because of an accident. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's just one of those things you get used to hearing. And yeah. um, so to watch that go round there, I think that would be a highlight. If anyone's interested in transport, get yourselves up to the roundabout at the bird lip, at the, um, what's the name of the pub there? I forget what oh, it's called. Oh, yeah, it'll come back to me in a minute. Yeah. See if you pub. can find out the name of the pub at the bird lip, uh, yeah. Emblem Roundabout. Um, we'll come back to that seven, in a minute. Seven, we'll spring, go seven minute. Springs. Right, okay. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I think that would be exciting because that is a very steep hill. Yeah. But ac obviously accessing then, uh, accessing the M5 is yeah. easy because you've got big, wide right. junctions. Okay, Tony, just pause there just for a moment. Now, I can see from the tracker that uh, our wonderful 727 aircraft is uh, now at Sirencester. So uh, we'll be going live to Johnny, signal permitting, probably we'll get better signal as we head towards the motorways, the M5, et cetera, but we'll try and go back to Johnny uh, a little bit later on. But I must also tell you that Pitch Air Live here is proud to be associated with the Great Western Air Ambulance, where today we're asking you to help keep the charity going and keep the helicopter in the air. It's such a vital part of our emergency services here in the West Country, and it will fly to various different parts of the region of Avon and Somerset, uh, and, and it will rescue people if the, the normal ambulances can't get to. And it really is such a vital, vital resource. So we're asking you to pick up your phone and donate just three pounds to the Great Western Air Ambulance Charity. You can do so by texting the word AIR to 70085, that's 70085, text the word AIR, and it's just three pounds, comes off your mobile phone bill, it's the cost of the text. If you want to opt out afterwards, then you can do so by texting STOP. The terms and conditions are on the Pitch website, search for it on Google. So uh, next here on Pitch Air Live, we are live here from Brislington in Bristol and welcome if you've just joined us, if you're watching here in the UK or in fact around the world. We are marking a very special moment for Bristol and aviation history for this city, a city that is renowned for its aviation. It's had aircraft built here for decades, dating back to 1969 through the 60s, the development of, yes, that famous Concorde plane a combination of British and French engineers coming together at Filson here in Bristol. But before we uh, go on to uh, the more where we track the plane uh, here in uh, Gloucestershire, uh, let's uh, first of all uh, try and uh, go over to the uh, air ambulance. Where let's find out a little bit more about the charity that you're helping uh, to uh, keep going today. This is the Great Western Air Ambulance. Let's catch up with them now. I'm uh, Dr. Jules Blackham. Uh, my day job is I'm an A&E consultant at Southmead Hospital, uh, where I've worked for uh, the last 10 years. I've been involved with Great Western Air Ambulance since it first launched in 2007. We started off in cars for the first year and then progressed on to a helicopter. We've worked through a number of different aircraft of varying size until we've got our current one at the moment, which is our biggest and best performance one we've had. Most of my work is in the hospital, working in the emergency department, and I fly uh, three to four days a month on the air ambulance with a critical care team here. 
course come through the ambulance service in a normal way and we'll get dispatched by the special operations desk or HEMS desk which are based down in Exeter. That'll either be through the HEMS desk team picking up whether this sounds like a job which requires critical care or it's a ambulance service road crew on scene who wish to have additional assistance and will ask us to go out and provide additional assistance to them. The critical care paramedic gets a phone call and we'll, we'll take the details of the call and we'll get dispatched from there. We decide there which route we go, whether we go by air or by road, and the decision to that comes down to a mixture with what the pilot feels around the environment, the weather, our, our distance to the job, and what we feel during the, that time is the quickest way for us to get to scene. So we look at what's our best way of getting to the scene, and then subsequently when we're on scene, we'll decide what's our best way of moving the patient. So we often fly to jobs, but then choose to take the patient from the scene to hospital by road. So what we wanted to do was get the specialist team to the patient as quickly as we can, and then we will decide on scene what we feel the best way of moving that patient to the right hospital is. Air ambulances in the UK are charity funded. Without the money which the public gives, we wouldn't exist. The uniforms we wear, the uh, additional equipment we carry, the aircraft, the cars we're now getting are all provided by the charity and the background support they can deliver. So the facility of this fantastic air base we're based out of, great geographical location for our patch. We've got the right resources in the right place uh, that allows us to get to the whole of our patch within a very timely manner. Cheltenham over to Swindon or down to uh, Western in around about 15 to 20 minutes from the dispatch. Boeing 727 is an object yeah. okay. It's a fantastic idea. It's a, I love the concept of it. It's something very, very different. And it's a great use of the old aircraft. There's a number of places around uh, which we fly over who uh, recondition and try and uh, do repair work on the old aircraft and putting them to some use as opposed to them lying derelict in the field. It sounds like a brilliant project. And it is such a, a brilliant charity, uh, so please, please do donate. It's uh, £3, and if you pick up your phone now, then just text the word FLY to 7085, and we will be uh, working with them throughout this broadcast. And it's such a great charity, and you never know when you might need them. What a great emergency service. Uh, coming up in a few moments, we're going to be going live to Johnny, who somewhere between Sirencester and the M5, uh, signal permitting. We're being sent videos left, right and centre from him, so we'll uh, try and keep up to date with where he is and what's going on. Uh, get in touch with us on Twitter, hashtag Pitch Air Live. And uh, we have a team here who's monitoring the social media. Before we go to the social media team, the arrivals lounge here at Pitch Air, as you can see, it's a fantastic setup that we're in. It's coming up to uh, 10 o'clock here on a Saturday morning. The weather forecast for Bristol, lots of low cloud around. Uh, I would uh, certainly take care if you're flying today. Uh, one person who isn't flying but is joining us uh, live is Josh Rom. Now, Josh is an entertainment correspondent and hopefully will uh, be able to tell us a little bit more about sort of the kind of people who uh, are, uh, would fly on the 77, especially this old one which is uh, kitted out in 1970s, uh, well, let's say, uh, decor. Josh, good morning to you. Good morning, Chris. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, Josh. Now, uh, you've done a bit of flying in your time, being entertainment correspondent. Uh, you've, I've also just been speaking to you a little bit earlier on about the idea that uh, the 727 was quite uh, a well-known aircraft in the 60s and 70s, wasn't it? Uh, but well-known not just for people who fly on it, but also for a couple of quite significant incidents. Just take us through one that you've been looking at. Yeah, there was one incident where um, a, couple of, a couple of people who weren't actually authorised to fly a plane, they needed an extra crew member in attendance with them. I think there was three people. Um, there was a 727 that was originally grounded that was taken out of commercial service all of the passenger seats were taken out and they flew this plane um they literally took this the, the three people that i said took the plane were took off 
from, I, I, I forgot the, oh, I forgot where they took off from, but they took the plane off without talking to air traffic control. They took off with no lights and they flew it across the Atlantic. The plane at the time was being used um, to transport fuel and there was a significant amount of fuel on board and um, the plane disappeared without any sort of um, communications. Um, the family of the people flying on board were completely bemused um, because they didn't know why the, um, the, the, these workers um, took the plane where it flew to. Um, the plane was reported to fly across the Atlantic, um, but it has not been found since. There have been no communications from the people on board and um, no debris has been found from the plane either. It's a very unusual story, isn't it? Uh, that's happened a couple of times. We'll hear about another incident uh, that involved a 727, which uh, the plane completely, like you say, absolutely vanished. Uh, and uh, Tony, you were uh, quite uh, renowned to, to know a bit more about this as a Royal Navy petty, chief petty officer. Um, it, can, can planes just disappear like this? Surely yes. in, in this day and age, they can't, can they? Yes. Um, well, they can't totally disappear. If you look back at the M Malaysian aircraft, uh, Malaysian Airways aircraft that disappeared allegedly over the South China Seas. Rolls-Royce and other aircraft uh, uh, engine manufacturers, they have devices on the engines that actually tell the company how often, how much the engine is being used. And they send back signals all the time. Nothing to do with the pilot. So you could rip out all the radio uh, information in the aircraft, but this, the engines will still keep sending off this information. And so um, ordinarily, uh, or in, in that particular case of Malaysian Airways, they knew full well that something had gone wrong in the, in, inside the aircraft. And the aircraft was actually then seen to be flying due south. And eventually, when it ran out of fuel, it, it plummeted into the sea, we assume, because there's never been any, uh, anything really ever found of it. Um, Yes, aircraft can disappear, particularly, I think, of that era when there wouldn't have been the digital tracking systems that we have nowadays. Um, I think that Josh was telling about the, um, that particular case, which always made me laugh because, I, I mean, just, these two guys just stroll up, jump in the aircraft, and <laughs> shoot <laughs> off down the runway and disappear. Yeah. Uh, I think there's also, um, in, the, in that same article, um, ever, a story of one that's found in the Sahara Desert, burnt out. How did it How? get there? Yeah. How? You know, and, wh and why burn it out? Um, yeah, uh, we, uh, th I mean, there, there, there are theories as to why and how and when, but you don't necessarily know. And so if you were able to uh, disengage these tracking devices from the engines, yes, your aircraft could disappear. Excellent. All right, Tony, that's, that's interesting information. And uh, we're going to talk about more of these incidents as we go through. Uh, Josh, as a showbiz correspondent, um, what kind of person might have flown on board this VIP plane? This was in the 70s and 80s, and uh, we've got some internal shots of, of the plane now that we can show you. And the decor inside is, well, let's just say, rather colourful. Yes, yeah, so um, in the 70s and 80s, I think it's fair to say that uh, the airlines decorated uh, the interior of the plane according to the fashion of the time. And eight, the, the, the period of the 80s is known to be a bit bold, a bit brash. Um, on, on sort of some of these airlines, you can expect... Um, a lot of business travellers would um, fly on this sort of airline. That's kind of where the whole idea of business class would actually have come from because there would be business travellers who wouldn't necessarily want maybe a product that was as... Um, as lush and as lush as his first class, but they would want something nicer than economy. And that's where the whole idea of business class came from, was um, a class specifically um, suited to these business travelers. Then of course, VIP, you can imagine all the movie stars flying onto these airlines, um, going from um, London and Paris over to New York and Los Angeles. Um, and they want to fly in utter style. 
Um, it's well known that the airlines back, at, as, especially in the 60s and 70s, as well as the 80s, their in-flight uh, catering service was pretty extensive. Um, the airline Pan Am was known especially for um, an absolute bespoke sort of service with freshly made roast beef on the airline carved in front of you. And I mean, listen, we can go on and on and on about the service um, related to Concorde um, supplied by uh, British Airways and Air France, couldn't we? Exactly. Okay, Josh, thanks very much for now. And uh, we'll be looking inside the plane when it arrives here in Brislington in Bristol in the next hour or so. But right now, it's 10 o'clock and you're watching Pitch Air Live. You are indeed watching Pitch Air Live and a very warm welcome if you've just joined us. We're here all the way through probably until 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, who knows? Welcoming Johnny Palmer and a 727 to the studio here in Brislington in Bristol. Of course, a city famous throughout the world for its aviation with a home of Airbus where many of the Airbus A330s uh, uh, wings have been made. Also, Rolls-Royce make their their engines here, and also uh, the uh, GKN factory at Filton as well. We are renowned for our excellent aviation in this city of Bristol, and I hope you can stay with us as we carry on going through. Now, uh, you've seen a little bit of the plane. I'm trying to keep a little bit back from you because we want to save it really until the end when you eventually see it arrive here, uh, and we're going to hopefully go on board when it gets here because it's on this uh, long looks like a supermarket trolley with wheels that change different directions as you drive. So hopefully it will make its way up uh, towards Birdlip and down. We will have the tracker uh, up on the screen in the next few minutes and uh, hopefully go live to Johnny when he gets some phone signal and see where he is and what the story is from Gloucestershire. But first of all, uh, let's have a chat with the crew who have been helping get this whole feat organized. It's taken months of preparation to try and get this aircraft ready for transport. It was meant to happen back in January, but it got delayed because of the snow which hit here in the West Country. So let's meet the crew for Pitch Air Live. Oh. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Joe Hall, uh, I'm venue manager here at Pitch. And this is a 727. <laughs> I thought it was a crazy idea, but now it's all come to come to life and we're here and it's happening and you know, all the wheels are in motion. So it's gonna be really cool. It's gonna be wicked. Can't wait for it to get moved. That's gonna be a good day. Yeah, I think it was like probably about six months ago when he first mentioned it. And you know, you know what it's like with Johnny sometimes he says some stuff and you're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you're not gonna buy a plane, are you? And then, uh, yeah, I should have known better, really, and, and here we are. I still don't think it's going to come off, but I think we need to have a go. I think it would be quite fun. Um, yeah, it's pretty big, uh, and it's over the top and extra extravagant, but I think that's kind of fun, isn't it, you know? Johnny was in the office a lot, and we just hear kind of rumours of an aeroplane and Johnny was really really enthusiastic about getting an aeroplane <laughs> and um, to be honest I didn't think it was going to happen because it's such a massive piece of engineering to pull off I, I it, you know it just seemed a bit unreal um, and then we got closer and closer and it's uh, it's November now and I think probably about September I was like okay this is this is possibly going to happen um, but it wasn't until a couple of weeks ago when Johnny actually bought the aeroplane. It was like, oh, <laughs> we're going to have an aeroplane in an office. I can't wait. I think it's going to be, well, I said to Joe outside a minute ago, I reckon there's about a 10 to 15% chance that this is going to fall off the containers and uh, 
come crashing to the ground. So I can't wait to see it happen. Either way, <laughs> there's definitely going to be some uh, chuckle vision to me to you moments, I think. And it's huge. It's massive. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how they move this from the airfield it's located at now to our warehouse. Um, I'm hoping that I get on the um, one of the escort vehicles or something to go and follow it down because um, I, I wasn't imagining it to be this big. <laughs> um, I knew it was a 77. I should have known how big that was. But really, when you see it in person, it's massive. I am really, really keen on the idea of keeping keeping the wings uh, or reattaching the wings after after we get it back um, and reattaching the landing gear properly uh, for several reasons. One, aesthetically, it would it would work so much better um, rather than just looking like a bit of junk. It would actually look like an aircraft. Uh, but second, in terms of holding it up, uh, you know, it's it's meant to carry 60 or 70 tons dropping down on the tarmac, you know. So it should be just fine to uh, to hold it static on some containers. Uh, it's a little more tricky because it means we've got to reattach them after they've been hacked off. Um, but I, I think we can make it work, you know? I wasn't really sure what to expect because I know this airplane's been sat on the tarmac now for probably close to a decade, if not longer. Uh, it's going to need a lot of work to get it into something that I would want to uh, spend some time in. It's all right when we're in a field having to poke around and fiddle with the electronics but if I was a client and I, I came in and looked at this in its uh, current state I wouldn't be that impressed I don't think. As for not having wings I think I always assumed it wouldn't have wings because otherwise I don't I don't know how you get it to Bristol with the wings on um, <laughs> um, but yeah I, it, you know what it's actually cleaner than I thought it would be. So some people might think it's just a plane. They're completely wrong. This thing is absolute beauty. Like the engineering and the design behind aircraft is the pinnacle of the most magnificent, stunning machines that humans can make. Everything about them, the, the, the meteorological aspects of it, structural, the technical, the fluid dynamics. These things are like machines of absolute beauty. And this aircraft totally personifies that. And the interiors, although not from my era, is stunning. Like, it's exquisitely crafted. It's just beautiful, the whole thing. It's magnificent in its elegance. Johnny, thanks very much. And Joe, I hope you've had uh, a little insight as to why this is happening and why we're so excited to receive this 77 here at Brislington in Bristol. Now, we can go live now to the camera on board the 727. There it is, and uh, as you can see, we're just struggling with the signal up there because it is not far, I understand, from Birdlip in Gloucestershire, where, uh, yep, there it is. You can see the, the lorry in front with the lights flashing away there, a bit of a, well, I have to get Johnny to clean that windscreen. Get your, get your wipe out, Johnny, that's, uh, that's a, a pretty mucky, but it looks like it's kind of working its way through now uh, to make its way back here to the arrivals hall at Pitch Air in Brislington. Um, we also have a tracker, which I know many of you have been asking about, and the tracker is now live, obviously because of the signal in Gloucestershire, and I don't know whether you've ever driven through there, it's like parts of Dorset, really. It's so difficult to sometimes get a decent signal. The tracker is now, in fact, working, I'm told, and uh, we can see that uh, Johnny and the plane are somewhere now uh, north of uh, Sirencester, is it? I can't, so I'm just looking at the map, I can't see him up there. If we roll up a bit, is he, there he is, there he is. He's now, what's that, the A417, is it? I can't, I can't see it from here, but it's, uh, it's right up there. That's the hot air balloon roundabout. It is one of the tightest turns on the journey, except when you get to McDonald's here in Brislington. Now that's going to be one to look at, I tell you. But if you want to get on to have a look at the tracker, check out now on Twitter, search hashtag pitch air. Talking of Twitter, let's go over to Jamie and Lucy to find out what people are saying online. And I understand there's a lot of talk about bird lip. Yeah, it's, it's so weird that you come to us at this point because the, the conversation is all about bird lip. You asked the question a little earlier on about uh, what is bird lip, what is that pub? Well, it is the air balloon pub where it looks like the plane is right now. And uh, Ross Berry has commented to say that his nan 
lives in the air balloon cottage um, at the Bird Lip Hill. So um, she, he's asked us to give uh, his nan a wave. There it is. Uh, I'm sure the guys on the ground in Gloucestershire are going to be doing the same. Um, so a couple of shout outs too. So hello to Val Cobain and her 14 year old do uh, daughter Jessica. Um, Adam Smith says hello to Ricky who is waiting on the M5 bridge near Gloucester and Jan the Battery Man who's watching from the Gambia. So hello to you. If you want to get involved, it's hashtag pitch air or get involved in those Facebook comments. But Lucy has been um, doing a bit of sleuthing and we've got something quite interesting to show, haven't we, Lucy? Some, some better action shots than the onboard camera that, that we just yeah. sort of saw. Yes, indeed. So I'm hoping this is going to come up behind me in just a moment, potentially. Um, but we have at Dawson PW on Twitter. Um, they have got onto the Highways England uh, camera system that is on the um, A417. Um, and we've got an action shot of the plane going round a corner and going down into um, another part of the road. So hopefully you might be able to see this. I'm looking at our tech team, wondering if that's... Uh, yes, it is. It's up there. Perfect. Okay. Um, so this is the first shot. Um, if you can see it up on the screen. Um, yeah, there so it there it is. So it's just coming down. And if I flick through, you can see it turning into the road. Flick through again. There it is. It's well on its way. And then there it is just underneath the camera. It's on the move, so isn't that exciting? That's been captured by one of the highway cameras. Well, I mean, it's, it's such a good job that you guys are on the ball today, because as you saw, our onboard camera there needs a bit of work. We'll hopefully get that um, looking a bit better. But thank you so much uh, for getting involved, Dawson uh, underscore PW. If you want to do two, it's really easy to do so. Hashtag pitch air. We want your questions, we want your shout outs. And if you've got something like that, um, then that makes mine and Lucy's life a lot easier. I'm sure we'd be well, more grateful for, for would. like that. We would. We'd be very grateful indeed, especially if that guy um, who works at 727 can send us a picture of his yes. plane. Yes, Jesper in, in, in Denmark, I think it was. Let, let us uh, know what your plane looks like. So uh, hopefully, Chris, it's going to um, look fantastic when we finally get it out there. A bit strange without the wings, though. It does look strange without the wings. It looks a bit like a toilet roll, I suppose, <laughs> going down a, a, a road. Uh, I'm just hearing, actually, from the guys who are uh, with the plane that there is a, a pretty substantial traffic jam forming behind the plane itself as it heads up towards the M5, where it will join the motorway and gradually, gently slide down the motorway here to uh, Bristol. If you uh, see the plane pass your house, Take a picture of it and tweet it to us, hashtag pitch air live. Or if you're on motorway bridges, then send some video across to us as well. It'd be great to see some of the video of it basically out and about before it makes its way to its new home here. Now, a little bit um, earlier on, we, uh, I spoke to Tony uh, about some of the incidents that uh, the 727 were involved in throughout the course of its life, not specifically this 727, but 727s in general since they came into service in 1968. Now, on the line now is Ed Hall, and Ed recently uh, flew on a 727, has lots of experience about it. Good morning, Ed. ...sevens to, to fly on, I'm afraid. There are some in, uh, in freight use, but I, I did fly on uh, one of the last ones to fly uh, in Nigeria of all places. So um, they were being used as internal airlines uh, there. Of course, I mean, one of the things about the 727 that, that you've been talking about, but is so interesting is that because it's of a period before uh, a time when we had airports that have all the facilities you expect now, the air stair at the back of the aircraft was incredibly important because it meant that you could load and unload passengers uh, anywhere that you could land. And that's still true in lots of developing countries. So um, uh, the ability to get on and off the plane uh, uh, in that way was great. So I flew from Lagos to uh, Maiduguri, which is uh, uh, a challenging city to visit at the moment, but um, uh, back in the mid 2000s. And uh, yeah, you, 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 we, we boarded normally, uh, but uh, as we landed, we were told that we were going to um, uh, exit the plane, a uh, deep plane from, uh, from the rear. And, and, you know, they lowered the air stair and we, you walk along the aisle going backwards down the plane and then uh, down the stairs and onto the tarmac. Um, 
Uh, what was it like to board the plane like that? I've never boarded a plane from behind, always from the side door. And as we've discussed so far so this morning, there aren't many now that exist that offer this way of getting in. It's a very narrow corridor, isn't it? Yeah, oh, it is. I mean, it's because uh, the, the, the plane, I, I think, is pretty much the same size in, in terms of the, the cabin as a 707, the earliest of, the, of these Boeing liners. So, you know, you're talking about a 3-3 configuration with a narrow aisle. So the, the, the stairs are not really wider than that. So, you know, you, you walk down that narrow aisle in the middle of the plane heading towards the rear. And, and then, you know, th there's a hole in the stairs uh, because it's lowered down onto the tarmac from there. Um, so, yeah, it, do, it does feel really odd. I mean, there are other odd aircraft that, that, that do these sort of things. Air stairs are not that uncommon, in fact, but, but they tend now to be you know, hidden in the plane in different ways. So they come out under the door where you uh, normally expect to, to board or, or deplane, not, not you know, the, the rear of the plane lowering down in that way. So, um, yeah, it's not a normal passenger experience anymore, but it, it's, um, uh, it was quite, it was quite an, uh, a magical thing to experience because it felt like something from a different period, different generation. It almost does, doesn't it? And uh, you've got uh, some information on um, one of the 737s that was involved in a, a rather mysterious incident uh, back in the, in the, I think it was the 70s, wasn't it? What was, what yeah, 19, 1971. Yeah, 1971. A, a, a chap who called himself Dan Cooper turns up at uh, uh, the airport in Portland, Oregon, uh, books himself a ticket, gets on the plane uh, to 727. He's flying to Seattle. It's only a short flight. Um, and, and once there, uh, he... He ordered a whiskey and tonic, or bought bourbon and uh, bourbon and, and water. He ordered a drink, uh, and the, uh, the the stewardess was then handed a note uh, saying they had a bomb in his briefcase uh, and that uh, they needed to land, uh, which they did. Uh, and uh, he negotiated a ransom, and his ransom was two hundred thousand uh, dollars and four parachutes. Um, and uh, which, whether that was because he wanted multiple parachutes or he didn't trust them to uh, give him a, a parachute that hadn't been tampered with, or whether he was trying to give the impression that he was part of a bigger uh, group of hijackers, no one really knows. But uh, eventually the, the $200,000 and, and four parachutes were delivered to the plane and it took off again. Um, uh, he said to the pilots that he wanted to go to um, uh, Mexico uh, but that he wanted to fly low uh, and he wanted the landing gear deployed, um, which the pilots pointed out that on that basis they wouldn't be able to make it uh, uh, all the way to Mexico because they'd be using a great deal more fuel uh, to fly that inefficiently. So they, they headed to Reno, but not long after they'd taken off, um, uh, the crew were all in the cockpit and, and, and locked there, and he's alone in the cabin. Uh, and uh, they see the air stair is being deployed and they feel the plane depressurize and uh, uh, D.B. Cooper, as he subsequently became known as the FBI hunted him for, for decades, uh, disappeared uh, over the Pacific Northwest. And um, many years later, some of the money was found, but most of it never has been. There are a couple of films about uh, what happened. No one really uh, knows. There are you know, conspiracy theories galore. But what we do know is that uh, he, he disappeared by opening the air stair of a 727 while it was in flight and uh, stepping out the back of the plane. Uh, it, and uh, both him and uh, most of the $200,000 was never seen again. Absolutely fascinating. What a tale. Um, and talking of the plane itself, because you've flown on it, um, just because this plane that we've got coming here is kitted out as a VIP aircraft, so it has a very mm. different interior. What were the seat arrangements inside on the one that you flew on uh, most recently? So I, I, the, the plane I went on was, was uh, I think it was three and three. Um, it, it did have this rather amusing, uh, or amusing is the wrong word, but unexpected uh, announcement when we boarded, uh, which was, as I say, as a domestic flight in in Nigeria and there are 36 states in Nigeria and most of them still have royal families um, so as a courtesy if there are members of one of those families on board uh, when they start the safety announcement they'll say you know your royal highness ladies and gentlemen you please make sure your tables folded away and, and all the rest of it so um, you quite often on, on domestic flights in, in Nigeria get those um, unexpected your royal highnesses at the beginning of safety announcements um <laughs> uh, out of courtesy and i remember on that flight from from lagos to madugari uh you know we, we got a, a a good you know bundle of your royal highnesses before we started uh, uh, being told to to put our seat belts on ed that's great thanks very much for those stories and i'm sure we'll hear from you a little later on as well ed hall there
joining us to talk about the 7 to 7. Uh, we're just hearing now uh, that we can go live to Johnny Palmer, who is uh, just joining the M5 in Gloucestershire. Johnny, uh, we can see you. And uh, how is it going? Are you, in fact, uh, there to tell us? There, there he is. Johnny, how? Welcome back. Uh, Johnny, what's the situation then, as far as you're concerned, up there in Gloucestershire? Looks like you're near the motorway. Johnny, you're on mute. Johnny, you're on mute. The age-old saying of 2020. Uh, hey, can you hear me now? I've got you now. Go for it. So where are you, Johnny? I'm on the M5 interchange right now. If you look behind me there, we're on top of the motorway, and we've just come from the A417, I think it was. That's right, the A417. Uh, what was traffic like behind you? Well, behind me, not so good, I'm guessing, because when we came past the queuing traffic, there was about a mile and a half of queued cars up towards the um, air balloon roundabout. Wow. And what about the traffic in front of you? Do you think you're going to get on the motorway OK? Uh, what speed are you going to do? Uh, pretty slow, about 20 miles an hour. It feels like, because we're blocking the road, everything's backed up behind us. So from our point of view, it's a very leisurely, nice, empty road on a Saturday morning. But I think the experience for those that's behind might be somewhat different. And what was it like coming up through Birdlip? That's the conversation that's going on on Twitter at the moment. It's been probably that quite hairy. Yeah, that was that was hairy, man. I mean, that um, air balloon roundabout, we actually had to do a whole lap of it to be able to come off on the first junction. And also, we had an emergency situation because there was an ambulance that had to get past. But the police were fantastic, and they managed to rush that ambulance around really, really swiftly. So they're still maintaining good, good public services, even though we are blocking some roads. So as far as you're concerned, you and your driver in the cab there, how long do you think it will be before you make it here to Bristol? That is the big question everyone is asking. Um, two hours, four hours, who knows? But you know what? We're on the M5 now. If I was driving home in my car right now, I'd probably say, yeah, I'm like, you know, half an hour from home. But, you know, we are going slow and there's a lot of uncertainty on getting around these roundabouts. Right. OK, Johnny. Well, look, I'm not going to let you get on the road now so you can start your journey back down the M5 to join us here in Bristol. Not too long. Johnny, take care and uh, strap in and make sure... Uh, you uh, don't uh, speed or go too fast up the motorway. Thanks very much indeed, Johnny. See you soon, guys. See you shortly. Now, one of the other aspects of today uh, while you're watching Pitch Air Live is the Great Western Air Ambulance. We've partnered with them to help raise money through today's TV marathon to try and uh, help the charity keep going. If you want to donate just three pounds, please do so to 70085. That's 70085. Eight, five. Text the word FLY. You can, uh, just a small, tiny donation will help them keep flying. And you never know when you might need the air ambulance. Uh, it's always going to be available uh, if you are stuck somewhere and a road ambulance can't make it. So please do help uh, with us today, uh, the charity, um, and donate three pounds. We have been with the Great Western Air Ambulance over the last week and um, been out with them to meet some of the crew and have a look at the aircraft. Take a look at this. My name's Jim Green. I'm the uh, senior pilot for GWAC here. I've been here for seven years. Before that, I was uh, a pilot up in Aberdeen uh, in the North Sea, taking people out to oil rigs. Before that, I did a bit of uh, instructing and sort of charter work, but I've always been a civilian pilot. You know, in order to become a HEMS pilot, you tend to need quite a specific set of experiences. Um, so they want you to have um, kind of a lot of pilot in command time and then low level flying. The most useful thing I think you can have is landing in confined areas. Everyone does a little bit of that as part of their uh, uh, commercial training, but it's very different from you know when you actually do it for real uh, at a HEM site. Okay, so this is a, uh, an EC-135 helicopter it's called. Um, it used to be Eurocopter, it's now Airbus, they got bought out a few years ago. It's twin engined, um, it weighs just under three tonnes. In my mind it's one of the best kind of aircraft for HEMS um, and for a couple of reasons. First thing is that uh, it's got quite a high rotor disc uh, and that means that you know, when our crew are getting in and out, rotors running, which they do all the time, it means that it's quite safe for that. And then it's also got this shrouded tail rotor as well, so you can see that that's kind of uh, encased. And a lot of the you know, places we're landing, they're quite bushy, long grass or things like that. Um, and that just adds an extra sort of layer of uh, protection on there as well. 
the typical setup, so normally we have, you know, myself, obviously I sit this one which has got the controls, um, but um, although it's a single pilot operation, the paramedics are trained to assist me with a lot of the navigation and some of the radios and, and uh, bits and pieces as well. And also they're an important lookout. Um, so they're, they're an essential part of the HEMS team. We can't do air ambulance without, without the, one of the HEMS crew members, the paramedics on board. Um, and uh, so that's how they, they kind of differ from the doctor as far as we're concerned. The doctors are in the rear and they're classified as medical passengers because we're flying them to the job to assist the patient. Um, but the, the paramedics are trained to kind of assist us with all of that as well. When you get a day like today um, and we can get a job anywhere, um, you know, it's, it's a really nice job and it's not that challenging at all. Um, but we get all kinds of exemptions to, which allow us to operate in very poor weather um, and, uh, and things like that, which means that you know, sometimes if it's very low cloud and raining and stuff, we might have to negotiate our way around some, some hills and not be able to see very much. Uh, and that's when the paramedics really come into their own because they're able to just, you know, think ahead a little bit, start looking at routes around some of the high ground on the maps and, you know, and, and plan, for, plan for that. Um, final question, 727 is an office, I think. I think that's awesome. Yeah, it's really, really cool. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah. thank you very much, Jim. Um, no worries. And it is really cool. And you must stay watching Pitch Air Live over the next hour or so. Who knows how long it's going to take because eventually Johnny and that plane will arrive here in Brislington and you'll be able to see it live here on this stream. Uh, joining me in the studio uh, have been quite a number of uh, different guests on Zoom and also here in person. Uh, we'll talk to Tony again, who's a petty, chief petty officer from the uh, Royal Navy, now retired. Uh, a little bit about uh, some of the um, other aspects, the mechanical aspects of the plane itself. But let's talk to Isaac Dale now, who's a structural engineer who joins us on Zoom. Um, good morning, Isaac. Uh, thanks for speaking to us. Uh, we can see you up there. Welcome to the arrivals hall here at Pitch Air. Um, I suppose the first question from me has to be, what's so important about a 727? Why is it so interesting? Good morning, Chris. Well, it's a um, it's a very interesting project. It's not something that's um, that you see too often. A plane being renovated into offices and being supported on shipping containers. So it's a it, yeah, it's an interesting project to be a part of. Has it happened anywhere else in the world? Have people converted these planes into other things? Um, I, as far as I'm aware, I I, I don't think so. Um, there may have been some renovations in the past, um, but. Probably not to, to this scope. What sort of problems will the team who are going to turn it into something very interesting like offices or indeed an event space, what sort of problems will they come up against? I guess so. the, the work for the structural support system has, has already been carried out and the steel work fabricated, but the actual lifting of the Boeing 727 onto the structural steel work, which is fixed onto the shipping container, I imagine would provide the... Um, biggest challenge. The 727 itself is going to arrive here today, but it's going to be lifted by crane onto the shipping containers tomorrow. In fact, we've got a camera outside that you can see right now, which is where it's going to eventually be lifted on to those shipping containers uh, with a crane. That's happening tomorrow. We'll be making sure that we tweet out photos and, and videos uh, to the Twitter account uh, at pitch air. You'll, you'll be able to uh, find out a bit more about that with our social media team a bit later. In fact, you can see there, there's the nose cone that will be reattached when it arrives here in Brislington. It's going to be really, really exciting indeed. Um, Isaac, um, as far as the cockpit is concerned and all of the sort of electronics in it, do you know if any of that will still be uh, moving, obviously not working, but will you still be able to sit in and pretend you're flying the plane? <laughs> Um, well, I imagine you'd be able to sit in the cockpit and have um, and enjoy that experience of feeling like you're flying the plane. But the actual, um, obviously, all the engines and the, the important parts that would be used in the actual flying of the plane will, will not be in use. Although there will be electrics fit, fitted in the plane for, for any kind of um, the supporting of, of the events within. I suppose the big question has to be, Isaac, is the metal structure underneath it going to be strong enough to hold it up? Well, it, um, 
definitely should be. We've we've designed it to the best codes of practice, and um, it's sat on shipping containers, which themselves are, are very strong. And on that those shipping containers, we've got a steel structure which is supporting the the plane under its its loading and also supporting it against wind loading. So if if the lifting goes well, then the the future of the plane should be shouldn't shouldn't be an issue. It should sit well on the structural steel work that it's been fixed to and it should be very, very safe. Excellent. Great. Well uh, we hope to have a, a look inside it when it arrives and obviously we'll be looking at it as it arrives and then tomorrow put on top of the structure there. Isaac, thanks so much for joining us and uh, we'll stay in touch, I'm sure, and find out some more information uh, from you as we go through about what exactly is in, basically how this thing is going to happen, where this plane is dragged all the way down here uh, on the M5 to Bristol and then, as Isaac said, lowered gently onto that metal structure just out the back here. We'll go out a little bit later and have a look. I had a look in the window just there uh, a moment ago and uh, if you're in Bristol watching then you'll know that it's incredibly foggy this morning in fact in aviation terms I think it's called low cloud I don't know. so just before we move on you're watching pitch air live here let's go across to uh, the social media team here in the studio in well not the studio maybe better to say the arrivals lounge here at pitch air to find out what people are saying out there Jamie We've just had, literally just a second ago, me and Lucy both found it and turned to each other really excited because uh, Michael Giza has tweeted what we believe to be a picture of the plane intact. So um, you'll have seen from the, the, the footage today and the live pictures, um, our plane, as Chris um, described earlier, looks a bit like a toilet roll because it's missing a nose, the engines and the wings and, and parts of the, the tail too. Um, but thanks to Michael Giza, if I'm not sure if we can get it up yeah, on the Yeah, let me right just now. try and find it for you. Bear um, with we've me, got. Tattoo. Uh, a picture of what we believe to be the plane in all of its glory. So this, when we, when we get the picture up on the screen, will be what the plane uh, would have looked like when it was intact and um, belonged to Japan Airlines. So, um, I it now. <laughs> so I, I put it in the, the WhatsApp group. Oh, did the you? Link uh, oh, yeah. there we so go. So we'll, we'll we get go. that picture up. So thank you, Michael, um, for sending us that. So I, I think that's what we're really seeing today. We're seeing people who are really genuinely interested in aircraft, the history yeah, of, of these sorts of aircraft. And they're really coming out today to, to show us their interest and getting involved in the conversation in that hashtag pitch air. But let's see that picture, shall we? Yeah, definitely. So here it is, um, hopefully. The team. There it is. So, uh, as you can see, copyright Richard E. Flagg. Thank you very much, uh, Michael Giza. So, yeah, there it is. It's got its tail, it's got its wings, it's got its engines. I wonder what year this photo was taken because it looks glorious, doesn't it? Well, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure we'd know. When, I think it last flew in two, 2003, early 2003, if, if my memory is serving me correct, but as we saw there, it was, you know, a sight to behold. It was a nice looking plane. And, um, I, you know, Tony's talked about this and, and the, the sort of the differences of these planes with that sort of T-shaped tail and those three engines that um, you don't usually see. But when I first, when I was preparing for this and, and I was first getting ready to, um, you know, get clued up on, on, on this sort of plane as you do for these sorts of things, I realised that that, that picture of a plane is how I would have drawn a plane Maybe not the three engines, but definitely the, the sort of T-style tail. That's how I drew planes as a child. So I don't know, um, you know maybe I was really interested in, in Japanese airlines. I, to me, it feels very Thunderbirds-esque. Oh, yeah, especially well, with the I mean, three engines. Like the architecture design of that tail. Mm -hmm. um, Thunderbirds was, what, 60s, maybe? And this was around the era this plane was being uh, made. So may, I don't know, maybe there's a crossover in architecture design. Maybe it was inspired by the Thunderbirds. <laughs> Potentially. You just don't know, do you? And, and there's already part of the plane um, here today in the yard, isn't there? The nose cone is already here. Yes. Yes, so early this morning when the tech team arrived, uh, we went out into the yard to survey all the mist that had appeared. Some of us questioned as to whether that was a tent, because as you can see, it's got that same shape, but no, no, it is in fact the nose of our plane. <laughs> and what we can see there is the beginnings of what's going to be a really uh, exciting addition. So tell us about what's going to be going on on, on the shipping containers because you can see a, a little bit of colours yes. that you're, you're choosing, aren't you? Exactly. So you can see a few colour 
swatches, is that the correct yeah, word? I think yeah. So, yeah. Um, of all the different blues um, that we are potentially going to have across all of those containers there. So it's going to be a beautiful sky. Um, I can't speak. Sky. Skyscape. 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 That was what I was going for. Yeah. Um, with lots of clouds. I think we should have a mini suspension bridge in there, <laughs> but we'll see. We'll find out what the artist wants to do. Oh, um, and, and just on the artist, it's a pretty um, special artist. So, so Jody, who is famous for that huge Greta Thunberg mural in, in, uh, on the side of the tobacco factory in Bedminster, he's in charge of what's going to be appearing. He is. So Jody has actually done the artwork in our offices here in the studio and has also done the facade on the front of our building. Beautiful floral patterns and then an interesting design going up to our offices. So he's going to come back and he's going to do our containers for us um, to help lift our plane into the sky as it were. So we're really excited about that. Fantastic. And just a quick look at the Facebook comments. Um, hello to Alison Tiru. I hope I'm saying that not uh, correctly, who says, can we have a shout out to all the wonderful ladies of the Brislington WI who are watching with interest? Maybe we can come and have a walk around when in situ. Well, hopefully, um, COVID measures permitting. Uh, Greza Fass says, shout out to the cameraman in the studio. Uh, I think I'll extend that shout out to the whole team who are doing such a fantastic job here. And then Sarah Crisp says that she's waiting on the M4 a bit early, she thinks. I don't know, can you update, Sarah? Um, Sarah, we are almost on to the M5. We're almost there, um, making our way so, down. We'll be getting an update from Johnny very soon, I'm sure, to give you the exact location of the plane. Um, if we have time, our friend Jas Jasper has actually sent uh, pictures of their 727 that they have. Uh, was it Denmark? Uh, I don't actually remember. Um, so sorry, was, Jasper. <laughs> yeah, if we're getting that wrong, Jasper, my, my um, comments have gone. But just to update you on, on, on what Jasper's talking about. So they, um, he works for a company called 727 and they actually have a 727 in their yard, I believe. Uh, we, we've got a picture to, to throw up. Maybe we'll get to yes, that. Yes, so Jasper has actually sent us three photos of their beautiful plane, if we can get that on the back screen potentially. So one is a snowy scene. Um, showing uh, the plane in situ in their field. Um, and then we have another one um, showing the back of the, the plane. Again, that beautiful tail um, that unfortunately our plane won't have, but maybe we can get it to be recreated. And then also looks like they've got a little uh, barbecue in situ with a beautiful plane and the sun and the blue sky. So yeah it's making me feel very excited about uh, what our plane is going to look like in the yard when it eventually arrives definitely and i, I don't know if tony could have um seen by looking at that would that have been this the same plane that we're going to get delivered here the mark one or or the, the two that's slightly longer hard to say, but I, I, looking at the the two pictures that you have shown now of of um of pitch airs aircraft and that one that one looked to have a slightly different tail structure but isn't it beautiful when you've got that high tail? The, the VC-10 had a, a high tail like that with four engines, two either side of the, of the fuselage. And it's a beautiful looking aircraft, I thought. You know, obviously, structurally, there was, there was issues with it. But I mean, the, the Buccaneer aircraft, uh, which was a, a military aircraft that the Royal Navy had, and then, unfortunately, the Royal Air Force took hold of it. But, um, <laughs> That had this high tail plane. It was a beautiful looking aircraft. Um, it just looked so nice. It looked sleek. But um, apparently it wasn't the way ahead. Modern, modern aircraft don't have that structure anymore. I don't know why, but um, it's a great pity. I, I, I love it. It's, a, it's, a, it's such a nice shape. There we go. I mean, that's all us up to date. But if you do have any more um, things you want to add to the conversation, it's hashtag pitch air. OK, thanks very much indeed, uh, Lucy and Jamie. We're going to go back to Ed Hall in just a moment to hear about another story about a 727. Uh, we'll come back to that in just a moment. But uh, before we do that, I just want to bring you up to date with where we are with Johnny and the plane itself. You can see the, probably the tracker uh, over my shoulder here on the, on the wall. I can tell you that right now we are now on the M5. There it is. And uh, we've just left the junction there with uh, Gloucester North and we're heading down towards uh, what will be Michael Wood services eventually, I suppose, as we get down towards junction uh, 13 and uh, 14 on the M5. So we're on the move and you can follow this 
online, just go to our Twitter page and at Pitch Air. Now, Johnny, because of the terrible phone signal you get in some parts of Gloucestershire, as you can imagine, uh, Johnny's been sending us videos just to cover the gaps where we haven't been able to go live to him. So let's just uh, catch up with him now. Here's one that we received just a little earlier. Chris, it's getting serious, man. Something's happened up ahead there. There's a car jackknife and it looks like the road's shot ahead. Steve just rammed the air brakes on, jumped out the door and ran the back. I have no idea what's going on. But what could be going on is maybe there's roadworks we weren't expecting. Maybe the back of the aeroplane's stuck underneath the bridge. It's looking pretty tight there. Oh, Steve's back in the cab now. Back to you in the studio. Yeah, yeah, I, I, okay, Johnny, yeah, uh, I, I can see that uh, it's, it's a bit of a drama uh, taking place up there in Gloucestershire. Um, let's go back uh, to just see the next video that he sent us, just to bring us up to date with, uh, as we head towards the motorway, Johnny. More updates. It's not what's happening ahead that's the problem, it's what's happening that's behind. We are under a bridge, and Steve is concerned that the aircraft might be getting stuck. It's really tight. In fact, yesterday they had to actually cut the aerials off the roof of the aircraft to save a couple of inches so they could keep below, I think, the 16 foot that it's allowed to have. I'm going to move again now. <laughs> OK, uh, that, that's, that's fascinating. We're going to uh, keep up to date with, with Johnny. Uh, and uh, as the plane, I'm understanding now, has, has been freed from under the bridge itself, we uh, can just go back to him one more time. Let's just see that last video that we've got from Johnny. Hey, Chris. Guys in the studio, this is fun, a lot of fun. I'm sitting in the truck right now with Steve, who's a bit of a legendary truck driver. That little situation we had a minute ago wasn't too bad. What it was, we were trying to get underneath the bridge, but the bridge is quite low and the aeroplane is quite high. So much so that yesterday Air they had cool. to chop the aerials off the aeroplane to make it fit. And apparently it was within yeah, an inch or two. Oh, got to be quiet now. I've got to be quiet when he's on the radio. So ahead of us now, they've got the... Um, the um, escort. Just, just out there, Johnny. Oh, Steve's asking me to be quiet. Gotta be quiet for a second. I'll just film. These guys are very, very focused to what they do. It's really safety critical. They can't turn too hard because it is ultimately a big round tube strapped down. They've got to take the corners really easily. They've got to be careful of pedestrians because, you know, while they might control the roads, they don't control the footpaths. So we have chaps like this guy here running along who doesn't seem to really notice that he just run past an aeroplane, which I find slightly bizarre. Maybe he's less into aeroplanes than me, who knows? So ahead of us there at that roundabout, it looks like the police have shut the roundabout in order for this, this load to get around. Now I'm very interested to see how they're gonna get around that roundabout, given this load is something like 40 meters long. These guys seem quite interested. Good job, got your phone out, mate, well done. <laughs> Here's another one up here. In a way, I kind of wish I was driving past this thing because that would be just as interesting as being inside the truck. This guy's quite interested too. Anyway, next time there's a calamity, I'll give you another video and I'll share that one with you as well. <laughs> OK, uh, Johnny, thanks very much indeed. And uh, as you can tell, it's a very, very chaotic live morning here on Pitch Air Live, and he's making his way all the way to Bristol. We're talking today about that 727, which is on the back of that trailer that Johnny is in the cab of. Uh, just before we carry on, I want to go back to Ed Hall now, who is an aviation expert, who also has flown on board the uh, 727s. Ed, thanks very much for staying on. Um, I wanted to ask you about a documentary that was made a few years ago that I sort of remembered, uh, where a 727 was crashed. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it was fa absolutely fascinating um, programme. You may well remember it. it. It had different names, different places, but uh, uh, Plane Crash, I think is what it was called on, on Channel 4. But Discovery were the lead production company and a group of them got together and decided that it would be fascinating to deliberately crash an airliner have it filled with cameras, filled with dummies, really understand and be able to see what happens when a, a, a plane crashes. Now, you have a significant problem trying to do that, which is obviously you can't do it with people on board the plane. So they, they bought a 727 uh, and set it up so it could be flown by remote control. 
They tried to do it in the States, but the US authorities wouldn't give them permission uh, to do it. So in the end, they got permission uh, from Mexico. So the plane was flown in, in 2012. I think it was in April, it was the spring of, of 2012. Uh, it was flown with the crew. They flew it up. Uh, and uh, uh, as they started being confident that it was out of areas where there were any people to the area where they'd intended to crash it, uh, they opened the air stair and the, the, the crew stepped out of the plane. Uh, the plane was uh, being followed by a chase plane, which had the remote control. So they flew that 727 straight into the uh, uh, Mexican desert. Um, and, and what was really fascinating was being able to see all the footage and understand what happened to all the dummies. So, you know, if you think about you know, all the car shows we've seen where, you know, you watch the dummies on that documentary, you get to see that, but in an aeroplane uh, and see when an aircraft crashes. Um, it was interesting. And, it, and it, 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 you know, there are lots of old wives tales about where it's safest to sit in a plane. And of course, part of that is, is, is how the plane, uh, you know, crashes because clearly, you know, the, if the tail hits first, then the tail's not the safest place to be. But for years, people have suggested uh, in crashes that the front's not very safe, near the wing's not very safe, um, uh, and towards the back is safest. And certainly in, in the case of the 727 that was crashed for discovery, it was the, the safest place to be was in the crash position in, in the rear third of the aircraft. And how does that differ from other planes where the engines are mounted under the wings, say an Airbus A320 that's used a lot by, say, EasyJet or even one of the other 757s, particularly in the range? How, how does it vary? Is there a specific seat that you can sit in that, um, dare I say, it may be more safer than others? There's so much debate about that. You know, I mean, uh, uh, it clearly... I mean, interestingly, we just had the, the, the incident in the States uh, with the United Airlines um, uh, engine disintegrating. Um, but an uncontained uh, failure of an engine like that is extremely unusual. Now, obviously, if you're next to the engine and the engine literally explodes and, and, and damages the fuselage of the aircraft, that would be a very unsafe place uh, to be. I mean, my own choice, if I'm booking my seats online, I always uh, uh, take a, a, an exit row uh, or, or one row away from an exit row if I want a seat that that, that will go forward and back. But, um, you know, the, the, being near the exit. But there are, there are so many interesting examples of um, uh, different ways in which people survive what must be the most terrifying thing to happen in, in, in anyone's life. Um, you know, in the Manchester uh, fire, because fire is obviously another great problem with, with an aircraft, uh, there was a fascinating piece of analysis about where people were sitting. And I've seen a, a plan of that plane where the seats are coloured red and blue, where the blues are the people that survived and, and red, unfortunately, the people that didn't. And you see in the middle of some of the areas of red, there are just a groups of, of one or two blues. And you think, how did the people there survive? And, and you know, the, one understands that that was professional air crew who were um, flying uh, deadheading they call it, but, but people who were flying from one airport to another but who were confident and knew where the exits were and how to get out of the plane you know and I think that that's that's a, a lesson I've always taken on board which is you know when you're on board and the safety announcement's happening of course you've heard the safety announcement a thousand times before but I always check how many rows behind me is it to the exit um you know, how, do I know, would I be confident that I can find that emergency exit, even if the cabin is filled with smoke, even if there's chaos and, and luggage falling from uh, uh, from cabin uh, lockers? You know, it, it, are you confident that you can find your way around that aircraft? And, and there are several examples where you can find that in areas of a plane that were arguably unsurvivable, the people that did survive were the people who were experienced uh, air crew. And I think that's always worth bearing in mind. Ed, that's great. Thanks very much indeed. Ed Hall there. And uh, we may well be coming back to him a little later on to get some more information on the 727. But I'm just hearing now in my ear that we can go to Loz and Lorn, who are somewhere uh, near the M5. Uh, over to you guys. I can see there this is a live shot. Yeah, that's right. We are live just behind the plane here. Uh, I'll flip my camera around. This is... Hello. Hi. We can see you. Yeah. Hello. How are you <laughs> <doing>? <laughs> What's the traffic like? Uh, well, we are we're we're making a lot of traffic behind us. That's for sure. <laughs> it's pretty clear in front of us. But um, yeah, there's we, we've spoken to a few people though. <laughs> a bit late for uh, picking up their son and 
so on and so forth. But I think the uh, spectacle of seeing the plane on the motorway is yeah. uh, is it makes up for the fact that that we're making them late. <laughs> and on that thought, why don't you just turn that camera round? and show yeah. us what it's like on the motorway right now where you are and explain to us where you are. Oh, that's a bit tight. <laughs> yeah, it's, oh, it's, um, is it going to make it? start stopping at the moment. <laughs> wow, yeah. where are you at the moment? We are just past Gloucester. Gloucester services are coming up shortly, I think. Excellent. So we're around that sort of area. Yeah, sort of halfway down to the junction. It seems, it seems to be so, sort of all over the road. Uh, is everything all right uh, <laughs> over the slow lane now? So, so what happens is there's every time there's a bridge, one of the um, abnormal load escorts will pull out into the outside lane and block the traffic. Right. And the guy close in the smaller van will go left or right of the aircraft to check for the clearance on the bridge. What so, a manoeuvre. Uh, every so often the trucks get to go past like it's happening now. Yeah. And then you'll see that escort vehicle will pull out and stop everybody again. Right, I understand, I understand. And of course, this uh, lorry, uh, the trailer that it's on, is unique, isn't it? Because it has wheels that steer from the back. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And it, and it allows it to manoeuvre around any roundabout corner. But not going to lie, at times it is a bit hairy. <laughs> it looks it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just while I've got you there, uh, and the, the, the line's great to you at the moment. Obviously, you're in an area where there is signal, which is fantastic. But back at Birdlip, uh, what were the obstacles like there as you were coming through that area? It's that roundabout, wasn't it? Yeah, that, that was, um, yeah, exactly. The, the police uh, cordon off. I mean, I think the team behind this have been amazing. They know exactly what they're doing. And um, that's been really nice to see sort of firsthand. Obviously, we're... We're first in line and getting some of the best views because we're, we're also making a documentary. But um, going around the roundabout at that particular point, um, there was lots of people watching. There's lots of people on the bridges. And it's amazing to see the vehicle, how it manoeuvres and the team that work to make this happen. It's like clockwork. It's magical, isn't it? Uh, Lars, thank you so much indeed yeah. for that. We'll stay in touch with you over the next few minutes and see yeah. as you start to head down the motorway towards us here in Bristol. Uh, we're very much looking forward to seeing you. Thanks very much indeed for joining us for the moment. Tony's still here. Yeah, okay. Tony, uh, what we're watching here, really extraordinary scenes, oh, aren't they? Fabulous. Um, I, it, it, as long as it's under 16 feet high, the, the, the load is under 16 feet, it should go through. But, yeah, I mean, they're obviously, they're talking inches. And it's, um, I mean, we saw the driver stop there, get out and double check. But, because um, unfortunately, sometimes when they resurface the motorway, they don't amend the, the, the clearance on the signs, you know, the, the, the figure on the signs. So there, it, it's not unusual for the, a, a load to be clipped because the tarmac has gone up maybe two or three inches. And that's, that's the sort of thing you're playing at. Um, when that happens, you know, you've got a major problem. You, you're stuck fundamentally. So it's, it is a touchy thing. Um, uh, they're coming down the M5 now. Now, I seem to remember that that has been resurfaced in the last few years. Um, so I'm sort of guessing that it could be only just and just as 16 feet, but that is a sort of the criteria for um, international travel, that they are X number of metres, whatever that is, you know, five point something or other, you know, and, and or 16 feet. So as long as the, as long <laughs> as the aircraft is lower than 16 feet, it should go through. Crossing our fingers. Oh. Crossing our fingers. The site, just, yeah. It would be great when it gets to the Armsbury Interchange where you've got the RAC Tower. That's going to be a great shot, I think. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, if folks are out there, you know, and they can get somewhere safe and legal, th 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 that's going to be a fabulous set of photographs. It comes around that sweeping bend and you've got the tower in the background, you've got all the gantries over the top. Um, what a photograph that would be. Now, I seem to think there is a field on the top corner there with a high bank that, um, on the inside corner. So if anyone gets to that area, they, they would get some wonderful photographs. Because mm. uh, you'd know, be actually looking down the Severn Valley anyway. Mm. And you've got this 727 coming underneath you. Um, OK, it's got no wings, it's got no tailplane, but it's going to be a fabulous sight.
I think it will. Uh, Tony, thanks very much for that. We'll be back with you uh, a little bit uh, later on as well. Um, as Tony said, uh, just uh, make sure you're careful uh, if you are out uh, and planning to see it. Maybe a motorway bridge uh, is suitable for a few photographs or a video. And uh, if you are out and looking for it, then check out the tracker on the Twitter page at Pitch Air. We'll be going over to the Arrivals Lounge and the social media team in just a moment to find out what's happening on social media. But um, uh, I think, first of all, we need to hear a little bit more about this plane, don't we? It's a 727-100. It used to belong to Japan Airways, and it flew right up until 2012, when it retired here and flew its final flight into Filton, just merely a few miles from here in Brislington. Let's find out a little bit more about this 727. The Boeing 727. Why was it built? When the idea of building a rear-mounted three-jet engine aircraft first came about, Boeing was still struggling to build the 707. Adding to the challenge was that some airlines wanted four engine jets while others wanted a twin. Here's how the 727 came about and why Boeing decided to build it. The inspiration behind the Boeing 727 was the aim to create an aircraft that could operate out of smaller airports that had short runways not suitable for larger aircraft like the Boeing 707. Boeing's new plane needed to be able to descend quickly into airports while avoiding buildings and other obstacles close to the runway. To achieve this, Boeing developed a large and sophisticated flap system to provide extra lift at low speeds. In another first, the 727 came with a small gas turbine engine auxiliary power unit, or APU, that eliminated the need for a ground power supply to start the engines. This innovation turned out to be a big selling point for airlines operating in less developed countries. At the same time, Boeing recognized the potential of this aircraft in the late 1950s. Rival Douglas was working on the DC-9. Around the same time over Europe, the British Aircraft Corporation was designing the BAC-111. Knowing they needed to sell a minimum of 200 aircraft to make the 727 a success, Boeing announced on December 5, 1960, that they'd received orders for a total of 40 aircraft from Eastern Airlines and United. By the time the aircraft made its first test flight in 1963, orders were still well below the break-even point. In a gamble to drum up business, Boeing sent the 727 on a tour of 26 countries, where the aircraft clocked up an impressive 76,000 miles or 122,310 kilometers. In eerily similar circumstances of what happened with the Boeing 737 MAX, it appears as though Boeing rolled out the aircraft without giving pilots sufficient training. By November 1965, Boeing had witnessed three of its 727-100 aircraft crash within three months of each other, killing a total of 131 people. Investigators looking into the crashes discovered that some pilots did not fully understand the flap system and were therefore allowing the planes to descend at too great a speed. Despite calls from some politicians to ground the 727, Boeing and the Flight Safety Board were adamant that nothing was wrong with the plane. The authorities did, however, come out and say that 727 pilots needed more training and that Boeing should modify the flight manual procedures regarding the final approach. Despite all the reassurances that it was a safe aircraft to fly in, passengers boycotted the plane for a good six months until confidence in the aircraft returned. Boeing's original production run was for 250 aircraft, but the larger 189-passenger 727-200 version proved so popular that the Renton factory built 1,832 of the jets, far surpassing the original target. After 22 years in production, the final Boeing 727 a 727-200F model was delivered to Federal Express in September of 1984. By 2003, nearly all airlines had retired the loud, thirsty planes in favour of quieter, more fuel-efficient aircraft like the 737 and larger Boeing 757. Despite its precarious start in life, the Boeing 727 ended up being one of the best-selling commercial jets in aviation history. Hopefully, a similar turnaround and redemption can happen for its current 737 MAX. If you like this video, please like and subscribe to the Simple Flying channel and be sure to click the notification bell.
Good morning and welcome to Pitch Air Live. And we're live, luckily, all the way through until that plane arrives here in Brislington in Bristol. You're very welcome to stay with us on this live stream until that 77 arrives here. We'll go back to Johnny, who's with the 77, currently on the M5 very, very shortly. Also the guys who are in the chase team in the car behind, which is fascinating to see just how close we can get to this fuselage as it's on this uh, glorified shopping trolley heading down the M5 to us here in uh, Bristol. We've got a tracker that you can also follow online and you can do that by logging on to our Twitter page. Talking of which, let's go over to the Arrivals Lounge in the social media department now to join Jamie and Lucy for more on what people are saying. What yes. is the score? People are enamoured with the tracker. A lot of people, I think, want to use it as a tool um, to uh, help them work out when they should go to their various motorway bridges. So uh, we are posting it as much as we can in the comments section for you. Uh, so do head to the link that we put in there. Had a couple of feedback from people um, who are using the tracker. If you open it on your phone, then it's more likely to show you a more recent pin on, on where uh, the, the plane and, and Johnny are. So we're, gonna sh we're showing it for you now so we can see that it's um, just on the M. M5 is that um, just it's still north of Thornbury, so still quite a ways off yet. Um, but we do have people on motorway bridges who have been um, sort of doing the legwork for us, haven't we, Lucy? We do indeed. So a lovely person on Twitter called Ricky Main at Akira BCFC. Um, they have posted a live video of the plane. Um, they are stood on the bridge and they're watching the plane as it makes it way under. Um, I think you'll be able to see it. So if I press play now, it's very slowly going underneath that bridge, <laughs> just wanting to make sure we don't scrape the bridge or take any of it away with us as we carry on down the M5. So as you can see, no traffic. The, um, the guys are holding all the traffic so that the plane gets free of the bridge. And then as the camera guy said, once they're free, they let traffic pass. And there it is, off it goes. And it, it, potentially quite a hairy moment if you are out there waiting on a motorway bridge. So potentially more drama to come, as Tony said, just a short resurfacing, a small resurfacing of a motorway can add a few inches and potentially make that crossing under the bridge um, difficult for our crew on the ground. So if you are there on the motorway bridge, have your phone ready and get ready to send some pictures in to hashtag pitch air because myself and Lucy will be watching it closely. Uh, but Lucy, one thing that we've been discussing is just the amount of people who are getting involved and celebrating today. I know, I cannot believe it. I honestly didn't think we would get this much engagement, but I'm really pleased and surprised because it's been such a long time since anyone has had anything to look forward to. I think Christmas was the one thing, and since Christmas, it's all been a bit dreary, hasn't it? So it's, it's so nice. Uh, we've had tweets from parents asking uh, where the plane is because their kids are excited to see it. So it's lovely that you're getting your kids out to see the plane. Um, people are walking their dogs and just randomly seeing it go through Sirencester. So please keep tweeting because it's lovely to have that engagement from you all. Um, we've actually just had some more pictures come in from um, the Highways England. Uh, it's at Dawson underscore PW again. Um, they have posted some live um, photos uh, on Twitter. Uh, we might be able to see that now. You can see um, it's looking into a pretty nice, um, glorious day in Gloucester area. So hopefully that sunshine comes back down with us with the plane to Bristol. Um, so yeah, just keep coming. It's lovely to see all your photos and all your videos as well. And somebody that you will see if you're watching on Facebook in the Facebook chat is Anna Perry. Now, she is the CEO of the Great um, Western Air Ambulance Charity. She's doing her best to share around that Just Giving link. So um, that is uh, the charity that we're supporting throughout today's programme. Um, and we'd like you to get involved too, because I'm sure, you, you know, you don't need me to tell you that charities have really suffered um, uh, throughout this pandemic as uh, donations have dropped. So if, if you're feeling generous, um, you want to, um, you know, it feels good to give, doesn't it? Make your inside smile, then do head to that Just Giving link. And then um, just one more comment from Alex Wellings on Facebook, who says... You want to see the queue of traffic behind you. What a sight. Back to you, Chris. <laughs> 
Thanks very much indeed, both. We'll be back to you shortly with more on what's happening with the journey. Uh, in a moment, we're going to cross over to showbiz correspondent Josh Rom, who has some fascinating tales about some celebs on board 727s. But just before we do that, the, we have a camera on the roof here at uh, Pitch, and I just want to go over to have a look at outside right now, if we can do that. Uh, the live feed from our roof camera is currently showing the uh, shipping containers, uh, there it is, of where this plane is going to eventually arrive uh, later on, probably just after midday here in Bristol this Saturday. The weather forecast is a glorious day out there. We had a lot of fog and low cloud around this morning here in Bristol and hopefully that's cleared now. I had a look out the window a little bit earlier on and it does look like it has. So a brilliant day to be out and about to be moving this plane and I hope you're following us on social media as well. Um, just before we uh, go back to Johnny that we'll be doing in a moment uh, to the guys also on the M5, let's catch up with uh, showbiz correspondent Josh Rom again who uh, has some interesting stories for us on uh, how many celebs and which celebs might have uh, used the uh, 727 and uh, I'm hearing is Josh there with us now uh, are you th are you there Josh I am indeed Chris Aha. in Showbiz Lounge inspired may I say by the Windsor Suite which is of course the VIP section uh, that Her Majesty the Queen would actually use if she's flying out of Heathrow Airport. An all lovely orchid on the table right there. <laughs> <laughs> You're in first class, I think, up there, aren't you? Uh, what about uh, that age-old, let's be careful, because it's still morning, but what about the Mile High Club? There must be some fascinating stories out there about the 727 in its heyday. Absolutely, there is, especially with celebrities. So I established earlier how there would be business travellers travelling on the 727. The 727 was a plane that was used um, in commercial airlines and obviously flying across the globe. And we've got some hilarious stories. Um, Chris Jenner, obviously the matriarch of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, recalled a certain story. She was formerly married to um, Olympic athlete Bruce Jenner, of course, who famously transitioned in terms of becoming who she, she I should say, is now known as Caitlyn Jenner. And Chris Jenner recalled a very funny story about back in the day, her and Bruce, let's just say, joined the Mile High Club. They tried to be discreet. And then at the end of the flight, uh, the captain announced over the speaker, we want to congratulate Chris, uh, Chris and Mr. Jenner for joining the Mile High Club. And we've decided to give you a free bottle of champagne to celebrate. Um, hilarious story there. Chris says she was absolutely mortified. Um, Hugely mortified. More celebrities who have also been using um, commercial airlines and let's just say have joined the Mile High Club include Chrissy Teigen and John Legend. Now, Chrissy says that they were on their way to see her parents in Thailand. Um, of course, as you said, this 727 was previously owned by ja Japan Airlines. So um, obviously this would be used to fly to the Far East. So Chrissy and uh, John obviously flying to that area as well. They actually actually said they were in the seats. Uh, they were flying commercial first class. Uh, they were under a blanket, let's just say. Um, obviously, now with the introduction of suites on board with uh, the closing doors, now stars who are flying commercial airlines um, would expect more privacy. But I assume the 727, when it was in commercial, uh, didn't have quite the privacy. And from what Chris and John were saying, I'm not sure if they had quite the privacy, but they did it discreetly. Uh, Miranda Kerr said that she once joined the Mile High Club. Obviously, she uh, dated Orlando Bloom. We can't quite say if they they were on a 727 and we can't quite say whether where on the aircraft aircraft they were but uh, they also joined the mile high club john travolta said that he did with his wife kelly preston uh ray fines also said he joined the mile high club actually funny story he actually didn't say it but the stewardess that he joined the mile high club with said that they did together and they had great <laughs> chemistry 
Um, she subsequently lost her job because of it. As well as Gwyneth Paltrow, Johnny Depp and Paul Bettany, uh, they were on the Ellen DeGeneres show and they were playing a game of Never Have I Ever. And all three said that they had. Obviously, or let's just say it's unconfirmed whether they did it together. I assume they didn't and that they actually did it with respective partners. <laughs> but they gave the admission at the same time. Um, Barbara Streisand and Janet Jackson, also among the members of the Mile High Club. So this, listen, the 727 in its heyday, as we've established, would um, be used by business travellers across the globe. Also, I'm sure some um, high profile clients as well. And quite a few celebrities, let's just say, are open members of the Mile High Club. Josh, that's great and fascinating to hear those stories. Just before I let you go, what's in the bag? Have you been via duty free? Um, I haven't actually. What's in over here? It's actually a box. It's just some cushions. Oh, it's um, set. It's all over dropped. there. We've got some artwork in the back. As I said, I've tried to make it as kind of Concord Lounge at Heathrow, maybe Windsor Suite inspired. Um, I do want to pop over to Duty Free at some point and get myself um, a nice glass of bubbly at some point throughout the day to celebrate this absolutely glorious weather. As you said, low clouds. Excellent. Josh Rom, thanks very much indeed for that. It's fascinating to hear the stories that are coming out of uh, today's live broadcast and uh, let's just uh, bring Tony back in. Uh, Tony, uh, as an experienced Chief Petty Officer, retired now from the, the Royal Navy, um, what does it mean, do you think, to the city of Bristol, where we have such a rich aviation history, to have something like this happening? Because I'm not aware of anywhere, certainly in this area, that has a plane that you can go on board, except for in museums. Certainly. Um, that's how I became involved. Um maybe 18 months or so ago, and Johnny contacted me to say, look, you're my councillor. Um, the council won't give me permission to put this airplane in. And I thought, oh, we'll see about that. Um, and it was really, I think it was because it's the first time the officers at Bristol City Council have had to make this decision. They were a little bit sl slow, though they were cautious, beg your pardon, let's say cautious, in making the decision. Um, but to my humble way of thinking, it's recycling of the nth degree. It's, I mean, there's a lot of aluminium, obviously, in an aircraft. There's a lot of other stuff which would have gone to waste. This isn't going to go to waste. It's got, for decades now, this is going to be sat out the back here. And Johnny's children, they're going to go up there, and, and anyone else's children, for that matter, are going to go and sit in the cockpit. They're going to look at all these gauges. It isn't beyond the wit and wisdom of a company like this to actually get some of those gauges to twiddle around a bit. Um, you could put sound effects in, uh, it, and you know all this could be done. The controls are there, so theoretically speaking, you can actually make a simulator. Mm. Um, you know, all the wiring's still in; nothing's been ripped out. So, um, and, and certainly for the engineering side of it, the the flight engineer that that's one seat I would love to look at. Um, because you've got the three engines there, you've got all the ga gauges about what each engine is doing, the power it's before, uh, producing, the, the fuel it's consuming, the temperatures that are inside the engines. Uh, yeah, I would really love to get up there and see well, you know, what, did the, the, what did the guys do in those days. I had a spell as a flight uh, test engineer with, <laughs> on one of the commander squadrons at Yeovilton, um, which is a little bit simpler. In fact, it's a lot simpler. However, the, 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 you're always looking for information. You're looking at that information, trying to work out, is it going as I'm expecting it to go? How can I improve efficiency? All this goes on all the time in your, in your mind when you're working on these, these, these gadgets. I, I'm, yes, I'm looking forward to when this is out here to, and we can get access into it because um, I'm, I really think it's... It's a boy's toy. Yeah. OK, girls, it's a boy's <laughs> toy. <laughs> uh, we're going to go uh, live to Johnny in just a moment. Uh, he is somewhere on the M5, and uh, we will be able to try and get an update from him uh, very, very shortly. That's uh, just coming your way here on Pitch Air Live. But just before that, I want to ask Tony, seeing as you're with us still, in front of us here, you probably see if we cut to the wide shot, uh, I am sitting in front of one of the enormous... 
tyres and wheels. There's another one here as well. Um, obviously, they are incredibly heavy. I was here yesterday when we were moving them out of the, of the lorry. Um, talk to me about what these and how these work, because they hit the ground at such speed and presumably get so hot, the bearings must be incredible. They're probably the weak point of the aircraft. To be honest, the engines just go round and round. The main planes just go up and down, fundamentally. They don't flap, obviously, but as you, as you increase speeds, so they'll bow up and then it'll take the weight of the aircraft. This is the weak point of the aircraft. Aircraft, um, bearing in mind that in the military environment, uh, fixed-wing military environment, the, the, the loadings on the wheels was, was even greater because they'd be landing in, onto an aircraft carrier. Let's bring down. a bearing in now as we're talking. Whoa, there Thank we you go. Look at this there you are. Have a look at that there. Now, now, talk us through this. This is one of the bearings off the wheel. This is probably the one out there looking how rusty it is. But it, it's, a, it's a chunky bit of kit, isn't it? Yeah. Um, let me just have a little play. It, it, I think Still goes a, round. With a little bit of work, we could get this one, uh, we could get this one <laughs> loosened up. Um, but yeah, you can see there, where are we? Where's the camera? Come on, someone show me. Look, the size of that bearing there, that's the shaft going through the middle there with a big, airy, great bolt on the end. Yeah. I think on these, there were two wheels on the undercarriage. Is it two or is it four? It might be four. Oh, no, I'm not looking at a 727 there, am I? I'm no, looking that's, at a, else. that's an Airbus, isn't um, it? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, I looked at the wingtips and thought, hang on. I'm... <laughs> um, yeah, so there may be two or four yeah. um, on, on each wheel, um, on each uh, oleo strut, rather. Yeah. That's a honking great bit that of is, kit yeah. when you've got a shaft that yeah. size going through the middle of it all. Yeah. And where do you think that's made? Who made that, do you think? Bearing in mind that Bristol has this incredible aviation history. Um, a lot of the wings for right. Airbus were made here, yeah. and flown out again, if not from Filton. Um, so this is, um, this is uh, USA, Timken. Um, in fact, it's even got the part number on it. That's important, obviously, because when something goes wrong, these things cost a fortune. These aircraft cost a fortune. When they are sat on the ground not doing anything, they are costing the company millions. Do you remember we had one actually prang at uh, Lullsgate, I don't know how many years ago, 10 years ago? It pranged in as much as it did a stress landing and the fuselage was damaged. And they flew three teams out from Boeing to, the, to Filton. And I was involved with the company then that had to sort of just shuffle these guys backwards and forwards from the hotel. They worked 12 hour shifts round the clock to rebuild this aircraft. And when they took it to bits, they didn't take bits off and put them aside, we'll put that one back in. It was ripped out and new was put in. It was much, much cheaper to do it that way. These things cost such a fortune to just sit on the ground doing nothing. And in three weeks, the front end of that aircraft, I can't remember, it, it, was, it must have been a Boeing, because, uh, but I don't know what model it was. The front end of that aircraft was fundamentally rebuilt. And you, you know, yeah. these yeah. guys basically did that by hand. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. It's um, fascinating. And, and they are I'm going to built. digress in a moment. So <laughs> yeah, they are absolutely built, aren't they? Incredible structure. Oh, and yes, I know you yeah. talked about being weak, but the strength you can feel in this. Uh, and just, just finally, what, what's in here? Is it air or yes. more rubber? Or no, what? just air. It's just air, it, it, but it's it, tight. It'll, it'll be a, it'll, um, this day and age, it will certainly be a tubeless tyre. Yeah. Um, I do remember back in my training days, aircraft had tubes. Uh, aircraft has had tubes. But now they'll be tubeless. So it's, but you look at this. I mean, look at all those bolts around. I don't know if the, the camera can pick that up in any way. The ring of bolts around here, the thickness of that aluminium casting there, and then it's, it's double castings either side. You've got the long tube in the middle. It's a massive construction. Even though it's aluminium, it weighs a ton. There's that mm. much of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I... I I'm glad you did that. I mean, that's a sort of souvenir. That's a, that's a, that's a doorstop, but it's a souvenir <laughs> from a 727, you know. A souvenir indeed. Uh, well, Tony, thanks very much indeed. Uh, we'll carry on with our chat uh, in just a bit. But first of all, uh, as we've been doing throughout this programme, uh, we've been crossing to Johnny, who's on the M5, and you can keep uh, up to date with his location via the tracker on our Twitter page, at Pitch Air. 
Uh, but uh, he is, because he's in transit, uh, finds it difficult to go live to us all the time. So we're receiving videos from him and then we're playing them to you as and when we get them. We can bring them into the system and turn them around and play them to you. So this one's just reached us here at Pitch Air Live. So we're pulling over for a little break. Apparently there's been a change of route. What's happened is that the um, Avon and Somerset police and the other police um, whoa, had different routes. So now we're taking a quick break. And check that out. Overhead there we have GWAAF, which is the Great Western Air Ambulance. How cool is that? They're the charity that we're supporting through this whole project. And just a few moments, um, £727 was donated to them um, because that is a 727. So the helicopter's still flying around above us. Don't worry, there's no emergencies. I think they're doing some training flights or at least running the engine, doing stuff they'd have to do anyway. So um, essential stuff for doing the work that they do reliably. This is not a joyride. He's coming over real slow. I think there's a bit of a photo opportunity here to get both the aircraft and the um, air ambulance in the same shot, which would be quite cool. And this is what we're here for. Here it is, stuck on the side of the motorway. <laughs> I think part of this as well is to um, give the traffic behind us a chance to get ahead of us, because they're trying to minimize the amount of disruption. There it is. Can you see it? Not the best camera work. So that helicopter's probably only about four or five hundred feet off the ground right now. I can hear it very, very loud. And it's actually drowning out the sound of the traffic around me. Even that Lamborghini that just shot past us as well. <laughs> Back to you guys in the studio. <laughs> uh, well, excellent. Uh, Johnny, thanks so much for that. And uh, it seems like we're really getting momentum now ahead of uh, the plane arriving here. Uh, he's up to mischief on the M5, causing trouble there. But it's so good to see uh, uh, the air ambulance up. And thank you so much to the team. They're obviously an emergency service. So uh, it's been great for them to uh, uh, just stop by and uh, say hello to us above the uh, 727 there on the M5. Talking of the uh, air ambulance, we are associated today with the uh, air ambulance, Great Western Air Ambulance itself. Um, we're raising money to uh, help keep the uh, air ambulance in the skies here at Pitch Air Live. You can text FLY to 7085, that's 7085, uh, to donate three pounds via text to help keep the air ambulance flying here over the west of England. And it really will be uh, worth every donation. So thank you so far if you have donated uh, and please just pick up your phone and uh, just text that number, text FLY to 7085, and you can do that any time throughout the show itself. So, uh, before we go back to Social Media Corner and the Arrivals Lounge, where we hear what people are saying, and lots of photos and videos I understand are coming in, and obviously we'll talk to, to Tony as, as well, um, I want to just uh, look back at a little bit of the history of the plane now, and um, how it got uh, stuck in mud while it was at Kemble, which is where it was previously to eventually making its journey to us. Um, the team here at uh, Pitch have been working on this project for quite a number of months. And finally, very, very finally today, it's making its way to Bristol. Take a look at this. Hey, I'm Johnny Palmer from Pitch, and I'm the guy that bought that thing to use as an office in Bristol. We had a problem though. The aeroplane couldn't move across the grass because the grass was gonna sink. Even the national media said, oh, the plane's stuck in the grass. It's not actually stuck. The problem was, is that the tug couldn't drag the aircraft along. So there's our problem. What's the solution? Well, um, I had to get some stuff called trackway or track mat, which is this stuff you lay on grass. It means you've got a temporary road. So I get on the internet, speak to a few buddies, and I find this company called Grassform, who have got this amazing trackway system, which is made from repurposed plastic. Now what they're doing is chucking that on the ground for us, so we've got a temporary road, we've got a massive big tug thing that's going to drive along and it's going to drag that thing, fingers crossed, across the trackway onto the tarmac. Now, there's a lot of trackway companies out there and I want the grass form because I like their kit. They're using repurposed recycled plastic. The other stuff out there that's good is aluminium stuff. The problem I've got with that though is that it's a huge amount of energy to make aluminium products. So I much prefer the fact they've got old plastic, melted it down, repurposed, circular economy, upcycle, all that great stuff to make this trackway. And look, 
The Pitch Air project's all about the circular economy, using old things, repurposing them, and making them something better and newer with minimal impact on the planet. And I felt that Grassform are doing the same thing with their trackway, so I went with them, and so far, fingers crossed, it's going okay. But let's see if this afternoon, whether that thing is over there or not. And doesn't it look incredible with all of its livery and uh, how it will look eventually when it arrives back here with its stubby wings all the way in Brislington in Bristol. You're watching Pitch Air Live. It's coming up to half past 11. Thanks for joining us and there's plenty more to come. So don't go anywhere. We're going to wait for that plane to arrive here in Brislington where it's going to eventually be placed outside on these shipping containers that you can see right now with all of that structure there to hold the weight of that enormous 727 plane. It's going to be a fantastic thing to see, so don't go anywhere. The lift tomorrow is Sunday, actually, so it's being lifted on tomorrow, but you'll see it arrive here today, so uh, don't go anywhere. Before we go any further, um, let's just see if we could go back to the M5 now. I understand that Loz uh, is on the motorway and uh, can just bring us an update from where where he is. Can we go to Loz? Oh, we can't. We're going to come back to him in just a moment. I think they were just trying to reconnect the line. So for now, let's go to the Arrivals Lounge and talk to the social media team uh, over in the corner there. Lucy and Jamie, what are people saying? Well, there's a lot arriving. Um, just in the, the last few minutes, actually, with, with Johnny on the side of the M5 and seeing the, the Great Western Air Ambulance um, in the sky, we have a hello here from Helimed65 and our critical care team who are on duty today. Hello to Anna Perry, who's furiously commenting away and getting involved and making sure that everyone is uh, conversing uh, in the comments section. And all those comments, what they help to do is help to boost us in the algorithm. So the more that you're talkative in that comment uh, box, the more that people will be likely to see what's going on today. So um, if you want to keep that up, that would be much appreciated. Um, but we've also had a lot of exciting things coming in on Twitter, haven't we, Lucy? We have. So many of you are telling us that you're standing by waiting to get a glimpse of it. Um, a lot of people have gone, I've just seen it. So that's really nice that, um, that you've been letting us know that. Um, we do have another video submitted by George Mason again who um, whose girlfriend it is today if I remember correctly hi again George so you've submitted a video again from the bridge um, it's a great quality I don't know what camera you're using but it's a perfect quality so hopefully if I press play now you'll be able to see that um, as it's coming in potentially if the vision mixer swaps over <laughs> there you go <laughs> So there it is, it's coming down the road. It's a great quality video, isn't it? Um, I'm very, I do apologize. The, tra the uh, plane has stopped now, so all of that traffic has now gone on its way. So that traffic is no longer. <laughs> Imagine going so northbound now, though, and, and seeing that. Exactly, because that would be, it's so tall, isn't it? It's so high up sitting where it is. Um, there we go, I think that's the... And it, it does sort of look like a, a spaceship, doesn't it? With it with its sort of fins and, and all yeah. the bits clipped. Yeah, and it, it's a very <laughs> odd sight. It's definitely not something you see every day, so you're right. If you're going northbound at the M5 right now, if there's anyone um, sitting in the passenger seat, of course, not driving, give us a tweet if you've seen it, if you're going up uh, the northbound uh, road, because, yeah, it would be quite a sight, I'm sure, for some people. We've got a, a bit of a, a fundraising update to bring you in a sec, so if you want to just get that we ready, do, and yeah. I will say hello to T at Mummy Barrow, at Mummy Barrow on Twitter, who says she is obsessed 
with this today, hashtag pitch air. A Boeing 727 is being taken to Bristol down the motorway. It's surreal. It is, but it's good though. We love it. Exactly, and I think you can see, or you were just seeing on your um, screens just then, our Just Giving page um, for the Great Western Air Ambulance Charity. Um, so if I just do a little top up there, you can see they have reached 82% of their target um, for a £1,000. Um, seven supporters so far have donated, which is absolutely amazing. Um, please, uh, if you want to get involved, you can go to this page, and um, we've put the link on our all of our socials, um, or you can text, I believe it's FLY, to 70085. It's three pounds and it's going to a really uh, worthy cause. And there's, there's one special donation that we should really highlight. We should highlight, yes. <laughs> Go on, you do it. You, you. Um, well, Johnny himself has donated £727 <laughs> to the Just Giving um, page already, um, quite fittingly, as our plane is the Boeing 727 if we haven't mentioned that already so far. <laughs> Amazing. Anna, Anna Perry just in the Facebook comments there saying 82% of target, so not far to go if you'd like to help us. Just like Lisa said, do text fly to uh, 70085. Uh, that text will cost you £3 plus uh, all the standard network charge T's and C's on the website. Um, really important though to keep the conversation going and flowing. Lots of people out and about with the cameras, camera phones ready to take pictures. We'll show them. We'll get them on the screen. We'll get them for everyone to see. So uh, your work won't go to waste. Also people watching along on Facebook to um, be active in that comments box because that helps people uh, to see it and obviously more people see it, more eyes on this means that more people are likely to donate to the Great Western Air Ambulance Charity too. Chris, back to you. Thanks very much guys, that's great. Um, I think probably we've got maybe another hour and 15 possibly left on the broadcast. There's plenty more still to come so please stay with us and if you're watching us on Facebook or on YouTube, please do share the link with all of your friends. Press share and make sure as many people can see it as possible. It's been great hearing from all of you and we're hearing lots of these uh, messages coming in and seeing photos as well. If you're planning on going and standing on a motorway bridge somewhere between, where is it now? Somewhere probably near Michael Wood Services and uh, the M4, M5 or the M32 interchange, then please do get in touch with us and send us photographs. Um, while we're talking about the air ambulance and how amazing it is and incredible, really, it's one of those amazing resources that kind of exists in the background, but you don't really think about it until you need it. Let's go back to the team now and hear a little bit more about the air ambulance. My name is Vicky Brown. Um, I work for Great Western Air Ambulance Charity as an advanced practitioner in critical care. Um, currently one of the only ones, or the only one, in the whole of the southwest region. Um, so I've been doing the job, well I've been a paramedic for 20 years but I've been flying for 15 years um, and with these guys for nearly 10 years now. So. Yeah so I joined the ambulance service and right from the word go I wanted to be on the helicopters. Um, I just thought it would be a great thing to do more so I could help the patients that we serve especially in this area. So uh, yeah worked hard, got on, uh, got on an aircraft and then joined uh, Great Western 10 years ago. So. I'd already done a little bit, had a little bit of experience before coming here, uh, but it was a lot more sort of critical care, high end um, skills that I needed. So when you join, you do an, an awful lot of training, uh, do lots of courses, um, we do lots and lots of sort of sim assessment work. So by the time you've kind of gone through all that, it takes probably up to about two years, um, and then you're sort of signed off and you can go out and go to all the you know, really sort of critically ill and injured patients. So lots of work, lots of studying, um, but it was also enjoyable. Um, so we've got two clinical leads at the base. Um, I'm the paramedic clinical lead and we have a doctor clinical lead. So my job entails a uh, majority of it working clinically, um, but also I look after all the governance for the unit and I'm also in charge of all the education and training. So with all the new staff coming through, I design their training pathways um, and then organise all the training and assessments that they need to then become qualified to, to come and do this job. So we're not government funded, it's completely donations from the public. Um, so we, in, with work with our charity representatives, do a lot of work, fundraising, uh, going out there, doing, well, when we haven't got COVID, doing talks. So we need, um, I think it's nearly six million to run the aircraft per year uh, and that covers all the costs. 
So it's a lot of work to do, um, but it's all just the generosity from the general public that keep us in the air and able to go to the patients when they need us. I think a 727 becoming an office is awesome. Um, and actually, it'd be interesting to see if we could do that here, because that would be great. Yeah. Really good. Perfect. Awesome indeed. Imagine having that as your office. Uh, fantastic work from the Great Western Air Ambulance. And please, please do keep donating. Uh, it really does make a difference. It's 700 85, Text the word fly. Uh, I've got Tony here in the studio with me, uh, a former, uh, retired actually, a Chief Petty Officer from the Royal Navy. Uh, Tony, just a quick question then about helicopters, because we're talking about the air ambulance today. Um, it's such an incredible machine, isn't it? Especially the way these newer ones are now. The, the, the helicopter is, I mean, the, the design goes back to Leonardo da Vinci's era, you know, the concept. But when you want to fly these things, you, you're always under the impression that they, they, they vibrate and they do to a certain extent. This, you, you've got to make sure that all your blades are well balanced, they, they're well tracked, they're all running on the same plane together. That way then it keeps them nice and smooth. But flying a helicopter is much more difficult than flying a fixed wing, of course. You, you, you're, you're, it, it's tapping your tummy and rubbing your head <laughs> or whatever the thing is because your two hands are doing different things. Your feet are then operating uh, as well. So it's a very difficult thing. And to fly a helicopter into some of the sites I've seen them go into you know, in, in, uh, during an incident, the police helicopters, the air ambulance ca characters, they need to put their helicopters in some really daft places. They're incredible quali high quality pilots. They really are. Um, all a great respect for them because it, it, it isn't easy to fly a helicopter anyway all sorts of issues as well as um, the, the fundamental act of just keeping it steady. If you, for example, got too close to the side of a building, perhaps the size of our studio here, then you get a, a, an effect that the, the, you lose lift on that side. And, and theoretically speaking, you could be dragged in. Um, so flying a helicopter is much more challenging than flying a fixed wing. Talking of that, Tony, joining us uh, uh, back here on Pitch Air Live is Ed Hall, who's also ex at Royal Navy. Ed, uh, uh, I was just thinking at that point, I, uh, I, I've got a drone, and I was flying it uh, recently um, and next to a wall, and like Tony was saying, it's, it's a very strange sensation when you're flying a helicopter or something with uh, propellers. As you get closer to the wall, it drags you in, and I've uh, crashed my drone quite a few times. What's that uh, called? Ed, you're on mute. Are you on mute? Ah. Uh, there we there are. There you it, go. It, We've you... got you back, Ed. You're on mute. <laughs> Try that again. Uh, it, I, I'm trying to be Boris Johnson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, when uh, uh, the interesting, I mean, wings, when they come uh, on an ordinary aircraft, as the wings are, are close to the ground, you get a ground effect. So the, 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 the fact that the, uh, the air from the wings is, is reacting to and, and, and responding to the existence of, of the land, of the physical object there. And of course, in a helicopter, you've got effectively the same wings, but they're spinning round. Um, so as you come close to objects, you get the movement of that, which is reflecting off. Uh, various um, uh, objects or, or the ground. So ground effect is, is very important uh, with a helicopter. But also if you come close to, which particularly rescue helicopters are likely to do in certain rescue environments, you've also got the uh, airflow that's coming off the wing tip and, and, and spinning around and that can cause all sorts of issues as well. Something people often don't realise, if a helicopter is uh, in completely stationary air, so it isn't actually moving forward, or there isn't a breeze, so the helicopter may appear to be stationary, but there's a breeze. If it was a completely still day and the helicopter is completely still, you do have a, a risk of an effect where the air will go from the rotor tips around uh, and, and, the, and the helicopter will start to fall. Uh, it, it needs to have air movement uh, in the same way that the wings on a, on a traditional aircraft do. And uh, very knowledgeable qualification. <laughs> I've, got, I've got half of a helicopter licence on the shelf somewhere behind me. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Ed, uh, thanks for that. Just uh, also while you're here, 
Uh, you come up with some interesting stories about the 77 and uh, how they're used or were used most previously. Yeah, I think uh, one of the most interesting things, I bet you can't guess who, who one of the biggest operators of, uh, of 727s uh, commercially was, um, was one Mr. Donald Trump. Ah. Uh, and uh, yeah, one of his uh, uh, less successful businesses was uh, between 89 and 92. He operated uh, what was called the Trump Shuttle. And it was a low cost uh, shuttle airline operating between New York, Washington and, and Boston. And he decided when he bought it that low cost shuttles wasn't the future. Uh, what he needed to do was have gold plated seat belts uh, and gold taps in, 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 in the lavatories on, on the 727s. So it was a 727 airline. Um, I think it was 17 planes when he bought it. But over its three year life, I think it built to nearly 30 727s that he operated. Um, obviously, the airline failed. He lost a lot of money. Uh, but what's fascinating is that one of those aircraft, a few years after it failed, he bought back and that aircraft became what was known as uh, Trump Force One. That was his, the first grand Trump aircraft filled with beautiful mahogany and over the top gold plating. Uh, it reportedly had a B-Day uh, <laughs> in, uh, in, in the bathroom on board. So that was Trump Force One. And uh, I think it's VP BDJ was the uh, a tail number if you want to look at pictures of what the original Trump Force One uh, looks like. He sold that, of course, he has a 757. Now. That's right, he does. And do you think it was, uh, I, I don't know, have you seen it? it? Was it was it in Trump colours? Was it the, the black and gold? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the, for, if you look, there are two images of Trump aircraft, Trump Force Ones, if you like, uh, uh, online. You'll see one that has... Um, uh, the, 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 the jet uh, connected to the tail. So it's the third jet. It's the only Boeing that's a tri-jet configuration. And, and that Trump Force One, which has got the Trump colours and the Trump name on it, that was the original Trump Force One, and that was a 727. Excellent. OK, Ed, thanks so much for that. That's a great tale. And uh, uh, today is all about hearing great tales, really, about uh, the 727, also aviation itself. Uh, being that Bristol, right here where we are, is so famous throughout the world for its aviation history. We were the home of the Concorde in 1969. The great white bird raced down that runway after testing a combination of uh, engineers from France and the UK coming together to create the first supersonic passenger plane right here in Bristol. And it took off from Filton Airfield, now disused just only a few miles from here. Well, this is Pitch Air Live. I hope you're enjoying the live broadcast. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, we are working in association with the uh, Great Western Era Ambulance, so please do donate to help them as much as you can to keep their wonderful helicopter in the skies. But also, I'd like to introduce you to some more of the guys here from Pitch. Uh, this is Jordan and James, and they have been on board the, uh, the aircraft. Have a look. I'm Jordan, I'm one of the directors here at Pitch and I kind of look after all of our clients, uh, give them a good experience, look after the staff and the crew, make sure they've got everything they need um, and just generally keep things running smoothly. I first heard about the kind of concept of Pitch Air a couple of years ago really when Johnny was kicking around the idea of buying some old plane and turning it into something. It's been going on for a while but I never really thought it would happen. So this is kind of the realisation of uh, a long process, I think. I think turning a plane into an office is certainly a novel idea, a novel solution to the problem of uh, building space. Nobody else is doing it, so why not give it a go? Why not let this be a start to lateral thinking and, and a different solution to the problem? I think Sunday is going to be a crucial day for everyone. I'm going to be holding my breath. I know that everybody's done a lot of work in calculating all of the operations and all of the structural calculations are solid, but there's a, about a 5% part of me that is going to be biting my fingers, hoping that nothing goes wrong. I think the Pitch Air project's totally unique. I think it's going to be really good for us as a business to become kind of a creative hub for the area. You know, it's a talking point. We want to get people down. We want to have people milling around uh, once kind of COVID restrictions are over. We want this to be a real kind of hotbed of activity. And I think Pitch Air is going to be a great centrepiece for that that we can use to kind of showcase our, our creativity and our ideas. 
Pitch have always been kind of aware of our environmental impact and we've been working really hard to try and reduce that over the years. We've done our kind of solar projects and our renewable energy, um, you know, we're, we're working towards different certifications to really reduce our impact. What Pitch Air does is adds another kind of element to that. It's an exploration in the idea of renewable recycling office spaces and not just conducting building work when you need more stuff done really. The Pitch Air project is a really exciting realisation of months and months and even years of ideation and work and creativity and it's really really exciting to, to see that it's all happening today. I know I can't be there in the studio but I want to thank everybody that's had input into it and, and been involved today and anybody that's donated to the Air Ambulance already or please do continue to donate for us um, and I'm going to pass back to Chris in the studio, thanks. I'm James, I'm the lead fabricator and production technician here at Pitch. Uh, I'm currently sat on top of the containers where the nose landing gear is going to sit when the aircraft lands here tomorrow. My main involvement has been getting the containers ready. I've been painting the roofs of them with a uh, bitumen compound, which is like a roofing solution. It will waterproof them and also have the added effect of looking like a runway. I will also be painting the sides of the containers with sky blue, so they can be graffitied with um, clouds and aeroplanes to make it look like the plane is actually flying from the perspective of the ground. Uh, when it came to welding, I was mainly the assistant. Uh, we just got it all lined up, did the measurements, um, and then cleaning up afterwards and priming all the metal so it doesn't rust when it rains, as it inevitably will. I think it's a very mad idea, but it's also one I'm quite looking forward to actually seeing. It'll be something just having a plane in the yard every day at work is uh, it's not something everyone can say. <laughs> Don't forget to donate to Great Western Air Ambulance and back to you in the studio, Chris. And thanks very much indeed, guys. Fantastic work, and we can't wait for it to arrive. And how phenomenal having uh, an aircraft like that in, in your backyard. Um, we're going to go back to the M5 now before we do a quick roundup from social media. Uh, and uh, I wanted to um, uh, hear a little bit uh, from this morning. We, we talked earlier on about this incredible trolley trailer that um, the aircraft is on top of, where the rear wheels steer as well as the front. Uh, it's quite something to see. If you've never seen it before, I suppose, uh, I'll talk to Tony in just a moment about how it works, but it's, it's quite, it's unique because obviously a normal trailer, the back wheels don't move. So when you turn the front, the back goes with it kind of at an angle. This will go left and right like that. Take a look at this. So a lot of people were asking about how this trailer is going to get around corners. Well, it turns out that it is actually rear wheel steering and rear wheel drive. If you look closely there, you can see the wheels are all on a funny angle. So what this means is that when they, the cab goes around a corner, what can happen is the back of the trailer can turn its wheels and drive itself sideways so it can kind of move sideways around corners. We're going to see a lot of that happening today, and I think that might be the saving grace that actually gets this thing through Sirencester, down the M5, round the interchange, and down to Bonville Road in Brislington. I'll keep you updated, um, and I'll share with you all the weird little technical things I learned along the way. Back to you in the studio. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny. Um, let's talk, Tony, just about that briefly. It's a a real marvel of, of engineering, isn't it? The, the way that you can put a, an aircraft on a trailer and drag it through a city. Well, when, when Johnny described that trailer there, I mean, that's, that's the A1 of trailers, as you can imagine. Not only are those rear wheels, so if this is my cab, this is the bit that does the pulling. At the back of it, I have this trailer. Now, not only is this trailer, so if we're going in that direction, if we're going in a straight line, but you need to get your trailer over. On a conventional thing, you've got to shunt and you muck about. What you can do, as you're moving forward, you can move your trailer over, so you've now got, your trailer is going forward at an angle. And then when you come to that corner, so this truck now goes up to your bend, and this truck can then go around the bend, and the, but the trailer still keeps going out. And eventually, it gets to the stage that it will then straighten up. 
It's going to be fascinating. When that comes onto Bonville Road, that is a place for people to be, to watch these trailers work. And not so much the trailer, but the guy who's in the cab. Because, not apart from Johnny, that is. <laughs> yeah. Um, because he is the expert. Yeah. He's a master. And I think this isn't this one of the bosses of the company that's actually driving it today. So, I mean, this guy is no slouch. This guy is a top-notch type of heavy goods vehicle driver that there are very few of this nature, of this quality, of this experience. And so I think when this, when this aircraft arrives, if you'll excuse me, that's where I want to be because <laughs> that would be the site. Yeah. You know, coming off the Bath Road, if they're going to come around the Ring Road, they're going to get the easier option to turn into bon uh, Emery Road. Um, if it's going to go then into Broomhill Road, there's quite a lot of space there. There's a roundabout, a mini roundabout, mm. so there's a lot of space there. Going around Broomhill Road and coming along the top past St. Brendan's College and past the, uh, the soccer pitches, that's fundamentally easy. The next challenge is that left-hand turn, either into Clothier Road or Dixon Road. Um, that would be a, a difficult depending on what's part there as well, of course, but at least they've got some room to play around with there. But the big crunch is down here. And that's, Bonville Road is narrow. Luckily, um, Dixon Road or Clothier Road, whatever it's called, is, has quite a clear area. But see, what these guys don't want to do is they don't want to drive on pavements. They don't want to drive over grass verges. That's where your problems occur. And I think what we're going to see here is a master at work, and I'm looking forward to that. I think you're absolutely right. And we have got a camera on the roof of this building that will be able to look straight down into the road and then into the yard that you can see there now, where the plane will eventually arrive and be loaded by a crane tomorrow onto those metal containers. And that will be a spectacular. You have to stay in touch with us here um, at Pitch Air to make sure that you see that plane finally reaching its final resting place here in Brislington. But that camera there you're looking at, we're going to swing it round eventually when the plane gets a bit closer and we'll be able to show you coming up this really tight road here in Brislington. That will be the site, as Tony says, and even a bit further down towards the McDonald's at the end of the road. That's going to be the, the, the moment I think we're all yeah. going to... Uh, sit tight and, and hold on tight, crash helmet on, strap in. <laughs> they, they <laughs> it put could be difficult. Dirty great bollards up there, you know, that's a problem. Yeah. I mean, um, again, the driver will not want to be wanting to knock over bollards. Yeah. That's expensive. Yeah. So um, he'll be wanting to sh shuffle his vehicle around that. And I think the way Johnny described it, again, as he comes up in towards Bristol and takes a right hand bend, the back of the trailer will fundamentally try to carry straight on until he's nearly, he gets the trailer into the position, puts the wheels straight, and then he can go straight yeah. down. Um, that's, a, that's Emery Road. There, that's right, right yeah. 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 Um, so go in straight across Emery Road. When he gets, the, he, there's an option there. He could go straight to the bottom of Emery Road, but I think that bottom turning there, it's got a sort of an S bend yeah. in it. Um, I don't think I would like to be the driver there, no matter what you've got on the back end. I think the way he's looking at coming into Broomhill Road and coming down then from Broomhill Road into Bonville Road just down here by the... Um, um, it's the garages, isn't it, yeah. down there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that's the way to go. Great. All right, Tony, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, just before we go across and uh, talk to the social media team here, on Pitch Air Live. We've had uh, quite a lot of videos coming in and we'll bring you that in just a moment. I just want to take you back a little bit further uh, back in time from this morning to when Johnny and the aircraft hit the uh, Birdlip uh, air balloon roundabout, which we've been talking about uh, uh, throughout this uh, uh, programme. That was the bit that I really wanted to see because it's so tight and it's such a steep hill. And luckily, uh, we couldn't go live from there because the signal was terrible. Johnny sent us the video, which has just reached us here at Pitch Air Live. Uh, let's see exactly what happened. OK, we're coming into another roundabout now. This is the air balloon roundabout, where I think there's quite a few people um, standing to watch 
This is a really critical moment. It's a tight round about this one. We've got the police closing off the vehicles that way. Actually, no, we don't. The vehicles are still moving just fine. So we're going to try and get this 40 meter long aircraft around this roundabout. I'm not actually sure what's happening. That copper there seems to be, I think he's waiting until we're closer to here. Ah, oh, there we go. We've got a copper down there. Now, he, what he's doing is stopping the cars coming up here now. So I think the cops are doing a really good job of minimizing the traffic disruption. Because, you know, while we're having a whole load of fun today and doing some good stuff and raising some money for the Great Western Air Ambulance, I think a lot of these people are just trying to get to the supermarket to buy some food. Or who knows, there might be other emergencies taking place today where ambulances need to get through, in which case maintaining this traffic flow is going to be really important. What we don't want to do is our, our sort of slightly weird... <laughs> Saturday activity have an adverse impact on other people's lives. But I do hope that, you know, throughout this we're creating some fun and some smiles or maybe a few rolling eyes to the onlookers. Now I'd love to look out the back right now because I think this is going to be a really, really tight turn around this roundabout. Okay, I'm hearing on the radio now that they're straightening up now to try and get down the A436. Okay, they're trying to straighten up, and I think Steve's also using the um, rear wheel driving right now to kick out the back end of the trailer to get round this roundabout. I would ask to get out of the truck, but um, that's not really allowed, and anything that dis distracts this whole crew of people and the police is, is not a good thing, so it's best to stay in the cab right now. I would love to interview those people in those cars over there, what they're thinking. Are they laughing? Are they frustrated? Are they thinking, what the hell is going on? <laughs> Either way, I definitely hope it's a, a bit of fun, a bit of fun for the people seeing this. Okay, so they're basically reversed back up then and doing what feels a bit like a three-point turn around a roundabout. The tone's still very serious, very focused and very competent. These guys really know what they're doing. Oh, you know what I can do is I can look out the rearview mirror here. There's not much to see there right now because the aircraft's on the other side right now. Okay, I feel like they're going, it's doing well, but they're doing lots and lots of backwards and forwards now to make clearance of the roundabout. So I'm going to cut back to you guys in the studio now. Well, that is absolutely fascinating, Tony. Absolutely Just as we were talking, brilliant. Uh, you were uh, talking about uh, how they were managing that. We'll just take a quick look at the tracker before we go on. This is where we are right now, still on the M5, just above Thornbury, probably doing about 20 miles an hour or so, southbound now, coming down towards the Almondsbury Interchange. So, we are on track to be here in Bristol at some point this afternoon. And uh, thanks for watching here on Pitch Air Live. Uh, quickly, just you were showing us here, Tony, with the, um, the bearing in front of us, <laughs> with the roundabout, how this this trolley, this, this tra trailer is going around this thing. It's, it's phenomenal. Basically, bit of he's come down the 417. This is the pub on this corner here, and it's quite a tight corner. Bearing in mind, I think John said 40 metres long. It ain't 40 metres. It's, um, but I don't know quite how long it is, but it's certainly very long. Let's say 60 feet. It's come down to the roundabout, but it can't quite get around there. So what I think the, the driver was doing there was actually bringing it around the roundabout and then using the rear wheel steering, the rear wheel drive, is then bring the whole trailer around the roundabout that way. I think the other option would have been probably to go all the way around, but that looked a bit narrow from what we were seeing. So I think what he's doing is bringing it back that way. So now he's actually facing in the right direction. Right. And that's how they, I think they got around that one. It's, uh, it's a remarkable feat. As, as I say, I'm getting so excited thinking about how this is going to get around that bottom corner. 
Well, Somebody save me a space down you, there, you, please. You, you hold your excitement, Tony. We, I can see I'm going to have trouble trying to keep him here in the studio. He's going to be out on the main road shortly. Uh, but let's go over now to the Arrivals Lounge here at Pitch Air, live to join Jamie and Lucy, because we've had quite a bit of interaction, haven't we? Yes, um, we, we saw our, just in the last there, one of our camera guys, Loz and uh, Lorne, uh, out and about with their cameras, but uh, we appear to have an, another camera team out and about. Uh, thank you to uh, Helimed Team 65, who Lucy have given us some incredible footage. They have indeed. So they've been out in their helicopter, um, flying overhead on the M5 and as you can see them there um, they've got a little selfie and the plane is down below in situ on the road so if I press play now we can see their footage um, so there it is that, so that's when it's stationary um, and there it is in, in flight that's it, that's it, heading uh, down the M5, uh, which I, I think that was taken uh, just as it was getting ready to pull over. And I, th I think what we've done is we've had a change of hands um, from police escort. So there it is, that's where it's been um, for the past, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 minutes. How long have we been on there? I'm not quite sure. An hour, actually, I've just heard of me. So it's been sat there for an hour. So thank you, uh, everyone, for being so patient and sticking with us. I hope we're, we're keeping you uh, entertained and engaged. But we are hearing from the people in the Facebook comments section that it might be getting ready to head off momentarily. So everyone that's waiting further down the motorway, do sit tight so it should be on, on the way to you. Do keep checking on that tracker that we've put out on social media. Um, but that, that footage is just incredible. If you want to see it again, we'll, we'll retweet it and put it on our Twitter page. Um, but we've got Kath in Cornwall. Cornwall Kath says she's waiting patiently for the plane to go under the bridge. Uh, we're, over, uh, we're on over the M4. And um, Lisa, you've had a, a bit more coming in too. Yes, so we've been chatting to at Dawn Barker, 1970. Um, she saw a picture that the Highways England um, Twitter account retweeted of the um, of the plane going under the bridge. It looks pretty tight, says Dawn. She says it's a tight squeeze. Um, she thought it was stuck when she first first saw the photo. No, Dawn, do not fear. It's not been stuck yet. Um, we've still got a fair few bridges to get under, but so far we've been incredibly lucky. Um, so fingers crossed we don't have any trouble today. Um, so yeah, now that the plane um, hopefully will be beginning its journey again, now that it's stopped temporarily to do the police switch over, um, we can go back to Johnny at some point to find out how it's going. Um, but yeah, just keep your comments coming in. It's great to um, see you all out and about. We've had some great um, pictures of children kind of waiting on the bridges, um, watching in anticipation, and they've said they're getting ready to wave. So Johnny, if you are watching, don't forget to wave to the bystanders who are excited about this plane. Just uh, one more quick comment here from Dawson Painter Ray, who I think is our guy who's watching the, the highways agency cameras closely. He says it has started moving again. Joe Palmer says, I guess it is an airline. Delays are expected. Currently grounded just after the Michael Wood services. But I can update you, Joe, that it is uh, wheels up. Uh, or, or wheels at least moving round and round, and uh, it should be heading down, uh, down the motorway um, to those bridges where everyone is waiting very, very soon. So, Chris, um, hopefully a lot more incredible imagery to come our way. Absolutely. Uh, Jamie, Lucy, thanks very much indeed. Yes, it does look like from the tracker it is now moving again, coming down towards Thornbury on the M5. Uh, that must mean that uh, it's mid-flight, so the alcohol must be uh, being sold by yes. now and possibly the, the duty-free, maybe a few sandwiches on board uh, or maybe some of that uh, cheap lasagna that you get and it's sort of all plasticky and hard, but maybe not because I think our, our flight is a lot, yes. more, yeah. is a lot yeah. more upper upper class than, uh, than that kind of old food there. Um, just a note from the uh, air ambulance. Uh, we've uh, heard from them uh, in the last few minutes. Thanks so much, by the way, for um, texting our, the number. 70085, text the word FLY, 70085. You can donate by that text three pounds to the Great Western Air Ambulance. And thanks so much so far for donating everything you have. Uh, I've had a note from the Great Western Air Ambulance saying thank you again for everyone who has donated. And they said that uh, just 250 pounds will buy a new flight suit for them on board. So again, thank you very much indeed for everyone who has donated and keep the donations coming in. 
here on Pitch Air Live. Now, we talked a little bit earlier on, Tony, about what happens um, when the, um, the aircraft itself gets stuck or stops. I understand uh, in my ear that uh, there's been uh, some sort of police uh, incident issue. Uh, over to Johnny. Thanks, Chris. So, the police have just turned up now because apparently the route has been changed or someone had the wrong route, not sure. But we've got a whole bunch of police down here who have just gone in front of the aircraft. Maybe they don't want us to move, I don't know, but I'm going to find out in a second. And just to recap, we're on the side of the M5 motorway here with, I think it's uh, Michael Wood Services, just back there, and a bridge full of people over there. Now, I'm hearing through a few of my buddies that there's been a bit of kerfuffle with the police on the bridge because um, the police were angry because they're saying it's locked down, you shouldn't be out. But luckily, everyone's just going up for a run. That's all they're here for. So, bring it down past the aircraft again. You realise how an absolute monster this thing is when you walk along it like this. Look at that. Look at how thick that metal is as well. You think they're light, but they're really not. Just yesterday, we were trying to load up the landing gear. It weighs 1.5 tonne, and it's made of steel, not aluminium. Okay, here we go. Now, we won't necessarily get a positive response from the police. Most of the ones I've dealt with have been lovely people, but sometimes they're not so keen about being on camera. But let's find out. I'm seeing some smiles, which is good. Bit of an argument over paperwork. Many years ago, for one of our events contracts, I had to get a load of equipment into the Ukraine, and it looked just like this with the paperwork at the border. Oh, OK. Not keen. He's one of those ones. But again, they've got a big responsibility, these guys. Got to keep the road safe and get pitch out of Bristol. If there's more updates, I'll tune in. But back to you in the studio. Ah, that's great. Thanks very much indeed. Johnny, who's there. Uh, with the 727. Uh, it's an incredible aircraft, really. Uh, now you've had a look around it. Um, we actually, let me show you some pictures, if I can, from when it was back at Kemble, uh, just to see what it looks like when it was in place. Um, some of the filming that we've done over the last couple of weeks has been pretty spectacular uh, as we've looked in and outside of the plane itself. Um, it's dating back to uh, essentially 1968. It's a, it's a phenomenal plane. Uh, and Joe, who uh, joins me now here, uh, one of the guys from Pitch, thanks very much for coming in. How are you doing? You all right? Just realised I don't have a mic. You haven't got a mic on. I've just noticed that myself. Lonely. Right. You, you, go, you go and get yourself a microphone and we'll, we'll come back to you in just a moment or someone can bring it over. Obviously, we are live, so thanks so much for, for being part of what we're, we're doing here, raising money as well for the uh, Great Western Air Ambulance and covering this incredible uh, feat of uh, engineering, really. Um, dragging this at 727 all the way from Cotswold Airport at Kemble, all the way down the M5 to the M4, then onto the M32 briefly and across the Ring Road and uh, eventually ending up here at uh, Bonville Road in Brislington, where it will eventually sit pride of place outside the back of these studios here uh, and uh, eventually be uh, using, used as a, an office and a venue that you can come and uh, have a look at. Um, it's uh, going to, I reckon, be maybe, hmm, judging by the, the tracker, uh, another hour, I think, before it eventually makes it here. But the suspense is building. We've got a camera on the roof, which I've just noticed has come on. If we could just have a look at that. But currently, looking across Bristol, the camera on the roof at the moment, there it is. That's the camera there. If we pan down, you'll see where the road is out in front of where we are here in Brislington. There's the road. And um, the, the uh, that's great parking there, isn't it? Uh, the, um, the, the aeroplane itself is going to come up that road, uh, past there from left to right, to go into the backyard here at the studio. So if we just keep panning around and then go up a bit, you'll get your bearings. That's the main road. I just, I just can't see how it's going to fit down there. It's so narrow, isn't it? And that then takes you back down to the main A4 road there, in Brislington and I imagine there are lots of people who will be um, marking this by joining the route. Uh, as Tony was saying a little earlier, I think probably one of the best places to be to see this aircraft would be somewhere uh, in Brislington just at the top of uh, uh, Bonville Road um, by the McDonald's and the, the car garages there. Uh, and there's a, there's a trading estate opposite where it used to be Maplins, I can't remember what that's called now. What's that trading estate? Joe's joining yeah. you back with a radio so mic this time. The, uh... 
who would have thought I was the producer of my own show without a radio mic, eh? <laughs> Schoolboy era. Indeed. Um, so the train is still on the other side of the road. Uh, it's got a B&M bargains in that's there it. now and yeah. a Halfords. Yeah, Halfords, that's it. Yeah. Uh, Maplins have long gone, haven't they? Of course. Sadly. Yeah, yeah they sadly. used to be a, a very good quick fix. One of my, you, one uh, my favourite shops. Yeah. Um, well, Joe, thanks very much for coming and joining me here. I wanted that's to get okay. you in because uh, you're the mastermind behind this and you've done fantastic work getting this really planned and, and on the road, literally on the road. <laughs> uh, throttle forward, rotate, we're now in the air and we're going to yep. come into land shortly. So uh, landing gear down, uh, we've got the landing gear here. Um, yes. uh, we're going to play some games in a bit, which you've set up for us. Uh, don't tell us about those just yet, but I want you to tell me from your point of view, we saw a video of you earlier on, what does this mean for South Bristol and Brislington to get a plane here? So, uh, you've, you've heard it in the videos with myself, you've heard it in the videos with Jordan already, but this, this will create what we're hoping will be a, a creative hub. So, we want to draw people in from the centre of Bristol, we want to bring them out to the suburbs, and we want to sort of create a little buzz in this, essentially, what is a trading estate. Um, so, we've got three studios down here at the moment, and um, hopefully when COVID allows us, maybe, maybe even progressing towards live music. So, you know, you come down here, you do your live streams, um, we've got the aeroplane, we've got the roof bar, um, and obviously, post-COVID, we'll have the, the cocktail bar as well. I think we can't wait until COVID is out Definitely of the way. Coronavirus has really affected every part of everything that we do, and it will be quite a relief, I think, with summer coming and the weather. Today has been fantastic outside. Uh, we'll see the plane um, appear across the horizon here in Brislington and make its way up that little road towards us at some point. You'll see the wonderful blue skies if you look out the window. What a great day for moving it as well. Yeah, honestly, uh, couldn't yeah. ask for nicer weather. You couldn't, you couldn't ask for at, uh, even nicer weather. Um, just explain to us what it's going to be used for eventually when it arrives yeah. here, because it's going to be a, quite a spectacle sight. Spectacle, isn't it? Of course. So, I mean, having a 77 in a yard in a trading estate is on its own, a very unusual and crazy thing to do. Um, the, the, the logic behind it is building new structures, so new buildings, is very expensive, it's very unenvironmentally friendly, and it's boring. Like, another office is just another office. Moving an aeroplane on top of containers is more environmentally friendly because you're recycling something. So we're essentially recycling this aeroplane from being an aeroplane into an office. Um, don't know if that's upcycling or downcycling because aeroplanes are <laughs> <laughs> quite fancy. Recycling of some kind. Yeah, yeah. Something, something along those lines. So the, the plan for the aeroplane is to turn it into a office. Um, there is a bedroom in there so people will stay overnight um, if they want to. So you've got a long shoot or you've got an early start in the morning. I offer it to clients uh, as a facility in that sense. Um, Socialising, obviously once COVID's finished, um, Hopefully going to be throwing a lot of grand um, dinner parties on the aeroplane. Very nice. And also film shoots. I mean, yeah. a lot of people want to film on aeroplanes and there aren't many aeroplanes that you can easily film on. So, mm. one true. have a go here. That's true. I've tried to film actually in London uh, a couple of years ago on uh, the London Underground. And the London Underground are very, um, they're, they're very protective over what you can do and they don't allow any filming. So it's really difficult to try and find somewhere to film somewhere that everybody uses like the London Underground. So you go and find one in a museum in North London, in Walthamstow, and they've got a carriage that's used for all of the filming of all of these TV shows that you see from Channel 4, there was one recently, and there's one on Sky. Anything you see inside a, a, a carriage is often filmed in there. I suppose what you can say for this is people who want to film inside a plane, there it is. You yeah, can film inside indeed. a real plane, look through a real window, and, well, there's no wing, obviously, but it would be <laughs> quite, a, quite a thing to, to sort of, I suppose, work on and film if you want. Yeah, I imagine CGI will yeah. fix most problems with wings, and eventually, eventually we are reattaching the landing gear on one side, so from, from a, a position in the window, it would look like there's some wing attached. Um, and where is the landing gear? Well, you can see we've got two bits of the wheels here. Um, the landing gear weighs about a ton and a half, Oof. so you getting get that into here. a van yeah. is a bit tricky. Yeah. Um, myself and Johnny lifted these off the van yesterday. It was more of a push and get out of the way situation. Um, I reckon they're probably about 80 to 90 kilos each. Yeah. Um, I can't lift it on my own without much, much, uh, well, yeah. You, you need two people to lift yeah, this up, basically. Um, yeah. yeah, you absolutely do. <laughs> so the landing gear, I believe the rest of it is coming 
either in a truck or with the aeroplane in the hold, um, it will appear at some point and then magically it will fit back together and we'll have an aeroplane on wheels. It'll piece back together very nicely, I'm sure. Yes. Now, as seeing as you're the producer of the programme and you've been back there with all of the, the team and, and all of the feeds coming in, uh, what can you tell us about where we are now and what the latest is? Yeah, so the last time I checked my laptop, uh, which was a couple of minutes ago, we were still stationary. Uh, unfortunately, the, the plane was stuck on the M5. As Johnny explained in that video, there's a mismatch in communication between the two police forces. Right. Yes, very very tragic indeed. Um, we're hoping the plane will get back on the road soon. I've heard a lot of chat, chat from people saying that you know, potentially it's going to start moving again. Don't know if our social guys have got any more on that, but... Um, well, funny you should mention that, Joe. Thank you very much. <laughs> that segued very nicely into the next section of Pitch Air Live. Let's go over to the social team, and it's Lucy and Jamie. We're moving. We're moving. Hooray! We're back, We're back on. And... Um, and to the delight of the, the people that are, that are waiting, should mention that, that uh, people are being sensible, aren't they, on those bridges? Yes, yes, exactly. So, um, Kath in Cornwall on Twitter has actually posted a tweet, uh, sorry, posted a photo um, of everyone, uh, she says, about a dozen of us on the bridge by the M5 slash M4 interchange. However, in that photo, I'll just make it a bit bigger, you can see everyone is social distancing, okay. everyone is being safe. So we just want to remind anyone who is out and about today, um, trying to catch a glimpse of it um, yes social distance wear a mask if you feel comfortable um, you know hand sanitizer all of that jazz you know it by now um, but yeah just to remind everyone that is definitely important and um, we are also social distancing in the studio today and all of our tech team have got masks on etc um, yeah so that was from Kath in Cornwall on Twitter um, our good friend Dawson uh, at Dawson underscore uh, what was it underscore, underscore PW, PW. That's, that's it he um, has also uh, sent us some updates again uh, from the live cameras on Highway England you can see there the plane is on the move as Jamie said um, and that was at 12.06, 12.08, so about 10 minutes ago. So it should be, if we go to the live tracker potentially, it should be near Thornbury, yes. hopefully. Now. We, are, we, are, we are, it looks very, very close to the, the Almondsbury Interchange. I mean, not, not in the shot that you can see. I think the pin is just, just above um, that uh, little section of the map that we showed you. But, you know, we, we are coming uh, to the point where things are going to get very, very exciting. I mean, you guys out on uh, the motorway bridges have had all your fun this morning. A bit more to go. You can see it's above the Almondsbury Interchange there, past, uh, past Thornbury, potentially. Um, so it's, it's going to be getting to the point where it, it's nail-biting as, as it uh, is coming into Bristol, which I know uh, a lot of people are and have been waiting all morning for it on, uh, was it the A4117? Uh, I don't know if that's right, but people um, saying that they are in, in more inner city areas, really waiting, hanging on to catch a glimpse of the 77 as it comes down from Gloucester. And of course, it is, it is closing in on us now. We can see it on the tracker. If you want to see the tracker, just head to um, uh, the social media pages. We posted links to it there. So it's, it's really easy to find. So if you're relying on that to decide whether you should come out, that, that, that should be um, what, you should, what you need to go off, Chris. Excellent. OK, thanks very much indeed, uh, Jamie and Lucy. And uh, the tracker is very much moving. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing it eventually hit the M32. Not far away now, is it? I'm hearing in my ear that we can now go back to Johnny, who is with the plane, for the latest video. Johnny. Maybe Johnny is still trying to connect to us. We are indeed live throughout the morning and afternoon. Uh, we are seeing, actually, that Johnny is now at the Amersbury Interchange, so we are gradually getting closer to Bristol. Uh, we think, actually, um, it might be that he is now at the interchange. I was hoping to go across to him to, to get that uh, to li live link to him, just to see if we can see what that amazing shot is as it heads towards the Oldsbury interchange and joins the M4. Uh, I imagine those people heading to London or Wales will be uh, in for a shock when they see this huge, great big uh, aeroplane right in front of them there uh, on the motorway itself. Um, Joe, is there any update from your side of things, from where you're sitting, on uh, whether or not Johnny is live? We are just trying to connect through to him now. I'm 
keeping an eye out on the team. They're going to give me a thumbs up when he's, <laughs> when he's loaded in. So uh, yep. standing by. Tech Certainly takes fine. time, unfortunately. It, it, it is. It is <laughs> absolutely time. So, actually, one of the other things that we can do while we're waiting is that you've, you've made some games for us, haven't you? Yes. Can we play those so games? So, we can do. I think I'll introduce you to them first, and then we'll have a look at Johnny. Yep. But um, the first game I've, I've created for you to play is um, Rate It or Hate It Airline Food. Ah. So, going... going ah, we're just hearing... We can go to Johnny now with the latest. Had words with us. They've been down to Bonville Road, where Pitch HQ is, to see where this aircraft's going. Like They've safe. got their concerns about the number of cars parked on Bonville Road. See, this aircraft's got to get up that road, and while it's a decent-sized road, there's not loads of spare room. So we've got to move our cars really, really quick, and if they're cars there that aren't ours, we need to find out who they are and try and budge them if we can. So crew in the studio you need to move your cars do it now and if you've got a car on bonville road please move it it might slow us down we'll still get in there though so let's get bonville road cleared so pitch air can land this afternoon back to you in the studio okay thanks very much indeed uh, johnny so we've encountered all sorts of obstacles over uh, the last uh, couple of hours or so um and in fact uh, it's so good that now the the um the, the, the aircraft is back on the move. I'm just, I'm just seeing here from, from Johnny that he has, in fact, uh, reached the M5, M4 interchange, and uh, he will be heading now towards the M32, which is great news, because that means that, finally, he's on the final approach, as they'd say, getting into Bristol. And, uh, Joe, um, is there any way we can go back to him live at any point over the next few, few minutes? Yeah, of course. So if you... Allow me to get on to Johnny on yeah. Zoom. I'm yeah. sure we, uh, we can Let's ask bring him, him a up. question. What should we ask him? Should we ask him, um, what, what, what's it going to look like when it gets to the M32? Because when it starts to uh, join that motorway, we're going to come off at uh, the very top junction, which will take us round onto the ring road. And the ring road is, I suppose, relatively uh, safe for us because it's such a wide dual carriageway and it will go all the way around to the east of Bristol and end up... Uh, down here uh, by the A4. Um, I wonder if there would be um, uh, any sort of obstacles that he's uh, uh, certainly set for or, or looking forward to in his journey around there. Yeah. I can't think of any along that road. Maybe that roundabout there, as you, as you come off. There's an awful lot of roundabouts. Now, yeah. I think if our, if our tech team can keep an eye out, I'm trying to get Johnny to join Zoom now with us. Great. Um, so if he, if he joins, it'll be great. And we'll, we'll see if we can get him live into the studio. He, He's just told me he can, he can join. Excellent. So while we get Johnny to join us to go live, uh, this will be for an update on his position right now. Uh, we have, as I've been mentioning throughout the show, been receiving videos from him uh, because the signal's been quite terrible on the motorway. And we've been receiving these videos. We can turn them around and play them to you almost instantly. So here's the latest video from Johnny now. So it seems that the police and the transport company have come to a conclusion and a resolution on this, which is good. They're going to change the route somewhat. But what they have said to us, though, is our chase cars, uh, my wife Kathy, Max and Will, and the camera crew can't follow directly behind. They need to treat it like a normal just drive, and they can't do things like go through red lights like the aeroplane can. So it sounds like there's a plan. It sounds like we're getting back on the road, southbound on the M5, around the interchange there. That'll be interesting. And then down the M32, Ring Road, and down to Bonneville Road, Brislington. But it's looking like this is not going to be done by 1 p.m. So can we extend our TV show for an hour or two? Do you want to keep watching it? And Chris, can you fill that airtime? It's up to you guys. And I'll do another check-in as soon as I've got some more news for you. Back to you in the studio. <laughs> Excellent. OK, Johnny, well, there's a challenge for you. Can we keep going? Uh, I think the answer to that question is absolutely yes, we can keep going because yep. nothing's going to stop us from seeing the end of this journey that's uh, going to culminate here in Brislington in Bristol. And if you can look over my shoulder now, here he is. We are live to what I think might be the M4, Johnny. Signal's a bit ropey, but uh, over to you. Tell us where you are. OK, so we're going down the M4 right now and coming to peel off to do the M32. So anyone who's from the area knows that this little interchange here can be a bit chaotic and it feels a bit like bumper cars sometimes. And we're just coming down the slip road now. Have you encountered much traffic on the M5 onto the M4? Well... 
this is the funny thing. For us, it's beautiful. It's like there's no cars out there. But then you see what's behind you. We might have an empty motorway, but the cars behind us, very different experience for them. How did you get around the police issue a little earlier on? I understand there was a bit of a, a, mis a disagreement or a, a misunderstanding. Well, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was all very grown up and civilised, but it sounds like maybe the police got the wrong route or they misread it, who knows? But either way, the route that we were planning on and the route they were expecting weren't aligned. And there's some road work, so it's all gone a bit chaos. But they're working together as a team, like grown-ups, very good, resolving it. And although we don't actually know what our route is going to be now, we are certain that we're going to get there. Now, one of the reasons for that is we don't think the police are going to want to have to deal with a Boeing 727 left on the side of the motorway overnight. Yeah, over to you, chap. Yeah. That would be uh, that would be quite a sight. <laughs> you can't exactly <laughs> call into a little it. chef, can you? And uh, staff and, and park up. Uh, or maybe you could call into Cabot Circus if it takes you down to the bottom of the F-32. Well, maybe I did have a theory, a conspiracy, that maybe the police thought this would be fun. Let's send them through the city centre. Maybe it'll go up Alden <laughs> Street. Who knows? Steve shake, Steve the drivers, Steve the driver shaking his head, panicking. No, we're not going up Baldwin Street. <laughs> So, so if you're not going to go down the M32 to Baldwin Street, then you're going to turn left, presumably in a minute. Looks like you're under the M4 now. Yes, that's right. So you're about to go onto the A4174, which is the ring road. What kind of obstacles do you expect to come across on that ring road? Well, who knows? I mean, you know, these things often have to bump over curves and go out wide. It could be lampposts, it could be bollards, it could be if someone's parked a car badly. Who knows? This is why the whole thing's a massive adventure, right? But stay tuned and you're going to see. Look at this. Just ahead of us here, the police are going to go around the corner. <laughs> we're going to find at any moment where they're expecting us to go. Do that again, Johnny. We just uh, we got your name pop up on your iPhone. Just show us again. Oh, sorry. People keep phoning me. Um, yeah, so we're going to find out now, I guess, which route we're expected to take. Ah. Steve, we're coming off here or are we going straight down the <laughs> 32? <laughs> it looks like we're coming off here. Hey. Mystery route. Here we go. Parkway, French A in that. Ring rules. <laughs> A417. 417, 4174. Sorry at the Bristolian accent. I'm terrible at it. I do try, though. <laughs> Uh, here's a question for you. Um, yep. Originally, that aircraft landed at Filton Airfield back in 2012 before it was transported to Kemble, where it's been resting until now. Do you think that aircraft went that route you're on now to Filton, or would it have gone a different way? Okay, well, I think we're done. We're no, I reckon it would have gone out by Cribs Causeway, out on the M5, up and around. I, I would have thought. Um, Hard to say, though, because at the same time, it is down that sort of ring road nearby where the Royal Mail is, isn't it? Down by the by fields, and that's where it probably would have left the airfields. Yeah. yeah. Don't know the answer to that. Oh, does your Steve, driver know? Steve, sitting next to me, Steve just confirmed that's the case, because it was Steve, the same guy that drove it, drove it from Filton to Kemble last time. You're joking. Really? Oh, we have a crunch point, people. We have a crunch point. Oh, what's happening? So this is the um, French... Sorry, I can't hear very well. French A roundabout here. We're going to find out which route they're going to send us now. <laughs> oh, gosh. I almost want to stay with you just to see what happens. Let's just stay on this video. Uh, see the police outriders in front of you. Bearing left now. Past the old French hope... hospital on the right in a minute. And let's hope we don't end up down a one-way street or at the end of a cul-de-sac. That could be a bit of a problem. <laughs> in your estimate, Johnny, what time do you think you'll be here? I don't know. Um... Steve, when do you reckon we're going to land? When do you think we'll be there? Maybe an hour. Steve says maybe an hour, but you know what? These ones aren't people to be held to times because they can't predict and control what's going to happen. You know, those issues we had at roundabouts, the ambulances, the change in route, no one knows what's going to happen, right? Yeah. So it could be an hour. Who knows? We might get stuck somewhere. We might be parked up on the side of the motorway tonight. I have no idea. Ah. You have to bed down, Johnny. Apparently, there's a bed on board, which I'll see eventually when you arrive here. You might have to tuck yourself in. There is indeed a really, really elaborate accommodation suite in the aircraft. Steve also has his own bed here in the truck itself, actually, as it happens. <laughs> Excellent. Well, you could end up on the side of the road, Johnny. Thanks very much. Right, stay where you are. We'll be back with you as and when we get an update. Thanks very much indeed, Johnny, who is now on the Avon Ring Road, the A417. Four. Uh, and as you can tell, uh, it is uh, finally starting to make its way here to Brissington. I think the excitement is starting to build. I really feel that finally it's going to come into land and we'll end up back here in Filton, ready for it to be launched onto its plinth behind us 
like a statue, I suppose, uh, to mark aviation history here in Bristol. Uh, I just want to see if uh, we can go back to um, the charity that uh, we're supporting here today. The uh, Great Western Air Ambulance, who operate uh, a helicopter in the Avon and Somerset area. And what they do is a remarkable feat. They will turn up in the very difficult places uh, that often accidents and incidents happen. It's very difficult sometimes to get road ambulances to it. And as a result, the air ambulance does require donations to keep going. Throughout the programme here, we've been asking for your donations, and I'll tell you how you can donate to the Great Western Air Ambulance after this. But first of all, I just wanted to um, go back to them. We've been with them over the last couple of weeks um, at their new uh, home, which is just off the uh, M4, M5 interchange at Almondsbury. They moved from Filton Airfield. Uh, and we went to see them to go and hear exactly what happens in their day. My name's Dan Davis. I'm one of the trainee uh, specialist paramedics in critical care down here with Great Western. I'm new to the unit, um, so I joined here in August last year um, and I came from another ambulance service, so actually I've come from London. I've been a paramedic or I've been working for 16 years in London uh, and actually flew with HEM services in London and with Essex and Hearts and I was one of the advanced critical care paramedics in London as well. So I've kind of moved down here for a change of job and a new challenge and a change of lifestyle as well. Um, but I'm kind of going through the same trainee process that all the other guys are going through down here as well, learning the ropes, learning about um, how SWAS work as an ambulance service, but how the, um, the air ambulance works and getting experience kind of working down here. So I, one of my roles is a, as a helicopter technical crew member. So I fly in the front of the aircraft um, and before we actually get to the patient is my role is to actually help the pilot with navigation, uh, with comms in the air, uh, plotting the routes um, and actually just the, the safety around kind of us flying as well. So that's a, that's a new skill for me as well. So the, the pilot does the kind of all the flying and kind of, but I need to understand what all the various dials are in the front, um, can help out with navigation. Um, if you can imagine like if we're, we're mid-flight and we get cancelled on a job but then get redeployed to another job, I've got to then plot everything while we're in the air, replot a route, send it across to the pilot and then kind of work out where we go from there as well. Great Western are providing a critical care team from 7 o'clock in the morning until 1 o'clock in, in, in the following morning, either in, in the air or on cars. The aim is we're bringing the hospital to the patients. So we're going to the, the, the sickest patients that really need their intervention in the first hour of their medical incident or their, their traumatic accident or their traumatic injury. Um, so what we're bringing is the ability of the, the, the treatment that, that these patients will receive in a hospital and we're bringing it to their bedside or to the roadside. Um, so whether it's surgical intervention or medical intervention, um, we can do things above and beyond what the, the road paramedics are able to do. It's a fantastic charity. You know, as I said, we are utterly reliant on kind of, you know, the donations that we receive from all around our, of our region. You know, we can't do it without you. We're here to kind of serve everyone we can do in the region that we go to, but you know, we, we certainly can't, um, we can't operate without the sort of donations we have. And one last question. Yeah. 77 as an office. I think it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, we, we were looking at, literally just looking at it this morning and uh, just thinking, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, we, we were just talking about somewhere to live. I'd, I'd live in somewhere like that, to be honest with you. So to have it as an office would be would be awesome. So I'm looking forward to coming and seeing it if possible. Brilliant. Thank you very much. All right. It's a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Great work from the uh, Great Western Air Ambulance. You can donate, by the way, uh, to the Great Western Air Ambulance by texting FLY to 70085, that's 70085. They really are uh, really appreciative of all the donations so far that have been coming in through the show. And uh, we hopefully will um, hit our target, which is absolutely fantastic, to buy a new suit for uh, a flight jumpsuit for those who are on board the air ambulance is 250 pounds. So I think we've just about made that, maybe a bit more from today's broadcast. And we'll bring you the update on how much we've made uh, in a, a little while. Um, just uh, before we go back to Johnny, because it's really uh, exciting now, I think it's uh, starting to really heat up here, uh, certainly in the studio in uh, Brislington, ahead of the, uh, the plane arriving here, the 727, 
on the back of that lorry. Um, I just want to uh, go back to a video that we had in um, of people on the motorway bridge uh, who were um, looking down over the motorway. Let's take a look at that video now. Well, <clears throat> just a short video there. There he is, it's Johnny. Hey Chris, it looks like we're on the motorway now. This is the M5, and behind us back there is a junction. So it looks like the cops are racing off into the distance now. Have they done their work for the day, Steve? Yeah, this lot, we've got another lot in a minute. So you hear that? There's two separate teams of police, I didn't realise this. So we've just dealt with the Gloucestershire police, lovely people, very good at what they do. And we're now on the M5 motorway. So I think we then get to the Somerset police when we get down to Bristol, and they're going to escort us around the Ring Road and into Brislington. So stay tuned, keep following the live tracker, and I look forward to seeing you in the studio when and if we land. Oh, Johnny, I think you're going to land. Thanks so much for that. And uh, as we look out the window, <laughs> there it is. Uh, now, uh, Johnny, of course, now is on the uh, Avon Ring Road, the A4174. So uh, we'll be going back to him as and when there is an update. And we think possibly within the hour now until the um, 727 and that crew arrive back here. Let's see if we can go back to the, the chase crew as well, who've, who've been following in the vehicle behind uh, Loz, uh, who uh, should be able to give us a, a, an update. We'll go to some social media uh, update in, in, in a minute as well, just to see what people have been saying uh, out there uh, about what's been going on. And thank you so much for all of the contributions so far, the videos and those great shots of people standing on motorway bridges. It has been a fantastic morning. And what great weather as well to be out and about to do it. Um, joining me back here in the studio here on Pitch Air Live is uh, Tony Carey, who is uh, a former uh, Royal Navy Chief Petty Officer who has lots and lots of experience in, in aviation, who joins me and been here throughout the show. Thanks so much for, for staying on. Um, where do you think um, that we, we're now on the Avon Ring Road? And, and I, I actually find it fascinating you've managed to drag this enormous aircraft all that way without touching a motorway bridge, without it falling off, without a car involved, touch wood. Um, yeah, this is phenomenal. Legs, yeah. This is phenomenal, isn't it? It is. Um, this is what makes, I say, these drivers the creme de la creme. You know, they, they really are at the top of their game. Um, Coming around the, uh, the, the Avon Ring Road, a joking laugh, because it's only about half a ring road. Um, <laughs> I think most roundabouts will be fine, except the one adjacent to um, the other side of Longwell Green. So Emerson's Green, um, um, that far? Not as, not as far out nope. as that. Um, the Kingswood one? Come this way from the Kingswood one, right. like, traffic light, because there was roadworks on that round. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, and they, had, I think they had reduced things to one lane. Um, I'm sure the police have their finger on the pulse. They will know if there's going to be an issue there. Um, and well, it just has to be resolved because you can't leave the aircraft <laughs> on the back of the trailer for long. Um, yeah. No, I think um, coming off the ring road then um, at Hicksgate roundabout. Yep. Um, that will be a challenge. It's, it's wide enough, I think, and then you're going to be coming up the long drag from the Hicksgate roundabout past what was the old garden centre, past um, Brissington House, the old Brissington yeah. House, and then St Brendan's College, and then you've got that right turn. That will be an interesting, that will, will be interesting because you've got... Right by McDonald's. Right by Mackey D's, yeah. yeah. You've got the um, traffic islands, uh, it might well be that he, he'll want to go into the straight ahead lane and then bring it across the whole of the junction, give you a lot more room then. We need to see that shot, don't we? That's the one I think if we had a spare camera, that would be sort of standing <coughs> on top of the bus, st st uh, bus stop up there, filming that because I think that would be a very interesting shot. Maybe we can I get a message to Loz. Hardest. But maybe we can get a message to Loz, who's following in the chase car. Can he be there so we can see what his video footage is as it comes in live? That would be fantastic if we could, and we'll bring it to you here on the large screen itself. Uh, Tony, stay there for me if you can. I'm wondering if, just before we go to the social media update, whether we can just see the tracker. Can we see exactly where the Johnny and the uh, 727 is right now? 
Okay, here we go. So it's on the wall, um, and we've passed Hambrook. It actually looks like it's on the M4, but of course it isn't. It's on the ring road next to it. Um, if you just uh, zoom in slightly on that there, yeah, so now that's where we are. So heading towards Emerson's Green, there's that roundabout uh, I think you were talking about, I think it's the next one, isn't yeah. it, that's got the pub the, on the, the corner? The Mormley roundabout, would be, I think, will be fine. Yeah. Although, again, there's traffic lights and it's, it's not, you know, it'd be nice if it was a straight... It was the next little roundabout that yeah. goes... Um, uh, Longwell Green yeah. and, and... Mangotsfield, back, yes. back of yeah. Mangotsfield, yeah. 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 Uh, I, think, uh, I think you're right, that's going to be uh, tricky. So what I think we'll do is we will go back to Johnny at some point in the next 10 minutes and just see if we can get a live update from him uh, on the road with the 727. Right, uh, as promised, let's see what you've been saying on social media. Hashtag Pitch Air Live, Jamie and Lucy. Yes, lots going on on hashtag pitch air, especially on Twitter, where our citizen journalists are really, really yes, pulling the stops out. I um, want to show you this footage that's on Twitter um, from Clem Fandango, which uh, I think took um, a, a, leaf, uh, a listen to what uh, Tony was saying earlier. If anyone could get a shot of it um, going on to the M32, well, they did. They listened to Tony, and here is that footage. If we just click play, you'll be able to see. There it is, coming down the way, being uh, escorted by the police, the abnormal load lo van to the side, I think, and the police escort in front. There it goes underneath, and... Um, no doubt, a, uh, hundreds of, of smiling drivers behind as they follow along. But that's uh, what we're going to see now as, as the plane moves um, closer and closer to us here in Brislington. Uh, a few more pictures from Dawson as well. Um, these Highways England cameras just get better and better and better. We've got some uh, from the side as well. So that was taken at 26-ish uh, past 12. So when was that? About 20 minutes ago. Look, there we go. Look at that. Some re really good shots right now. Oh, that's, that's the ones I was looking forward to seeing. I mean... There we go. So, so those, those are the ones that Tony wanted to see. So we've, we tick that box. Um, we've also been, Lucy, um, having a, a, a little bit of a dig into the plane's history because we, we've sort of become experts in, in this uh, plane over, over the last I don't know, three hours or so since we've been on air. We're really getting into it. And, and you've pulled up some quite interesting things. properly was 2003 um, and then since I believe 2012 it's actually been sat at Kemble Airport um, just sitting there waiting for someone to think about what it could possibly be done but in its heyday um, it was carrying I believe around 104 people um, commercially um, around the world um, and as we've <coughs> already mentioned it had that um, very uh, I was going to say charismatic, but it's not really charismatic, is it? But very defining feature of the stairway at the back of the plane. Um, and we have some uh, weird kind of stories to do with that. Um, one of the uh, seven, 727s was actually hijacked in 1971, and a man used that back staircase to make his escape, and he was never caught, was he? I don't think he, he was ever seen again. I think we heard that story from Ed Hall earlier. He, he yes. jumped off the air stairs into a thunderstorm, and neither him nor the $200,000 um, and those four parachutes that he asked for were ever seen again. And uh, what really interested me, which you found about the air stairs, was um, that the CIA used these 727s and were dropping agents into Vietnam off the air stairs, similar as you would from, you know, the big military, I don't know if they're, they're, the, the Chinooks with, the, with the, the, the thing that comes down at the back. So it was sort of like a, a really nimble way of, of doing some tactical things. Yes, but it's interesting that the CIA used this in Vietnam because it was um, one at the time one of the noisiest um, commercial jet light jet uh, jet liners um, that they have actually made um, it's the more recent versions of it they've made the engines quieter but this particular one was pretty noisy in its day it's not making much noise at the moment on the uh, on the M <laughs> it's not on the M4 anymore it's on the A417 um, 
I mean, we could always get Johnny to do some kind of reenactment of the engine and how it sounded. You can find uh, videos on YouTube if you want to really see the simple flying, do some great videos. We've already seen one earlier on in the programme. But if you want to hear the roar of a 727, um, I was up quite late last night uh, getting a bit carried away watching all that sort of stuff. You can. And you can see some great footage from inside the cockpit. But yes, we, uh, myself and Lisa, have become a um, little bit like aviation experts uh, over here and we'd love you to share your excitement too so it's hashtag pitch air for all your uh, pictures and videos do get involved in the facebook comments too we will keep our eyes on uh, the social media pages and give you shout outs if you want them so do get in touch and all your interaction helps boost us in the algorithm and get this in front of more people's faces so that's your job chris back to you thanks very much indeed jamie and lucy and um just grab myself a little bit of of lunch. Um, we've been broadcasting now Seven. for uh, over three hours, 45 minutes. Uh, we've still got some time to go until, until it arrives right here in Brislington. So uh, without further ado, I think it's time now to get a little update from the Great Western Air Ambulance. I've mentioned throughout that we are supporting them during today's broadcast and asking for donations to help keep the wonderful helicopter in the air. And joining me on uh, Zoom right now on Pitch Air Live is Anna Perry, the Chief Executive of the charity. Anna, thanks so much for coming on board. It's great to see you. And uh, uh, what do you think of the plane? Oh, it's amazing. I think everybody at Great Western Airlines Charity is just so jealous. Apologies, my cat keeps trying to join the meeting. I hope that's okay. I know I was, I was told that would be fine and everyone's welcome. So. Everyone's welcome. What's, what's your cat called? <laughs> Uh, this is Sooty. Sooty. <laughs> well, um, well, that's brilliant. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed the, so far the broadcast this morning. Uh, uh, let me ask you about the 727. <clears throat> Have you ever seen one? I'm, I don't think so. No, no. But Quite then unique. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not an aviation geek, so I may have seen one and not. and not. and not seen it. If you see what I mean. <laughs> well, tell us about then. <laughs> Tell us I'm about. Going to go, I'm going to come and visit when it's in Brisbane. Do you know? I think you'll have to come down and have a look as well, and uh, maybe do a fly past if you ever get a moment in the helicopter. It'd be great to see it as well. But obviously, I know that you are uh, an active emergency service, so we can't ever ask you to do anything that would be taking up the time of the, of the helicopter. But let's talk about the the air ambulance now. Uh, I understand it's quite a new one. Yeah, we're one of. We, I think we're the newest air ambulance charity in England and Wales. Um, so we were founded in two thousand and seven. Uh, seven. So we've been going about thirteen years. Um, and so we operate a helicopter and two critical care cars, which people don't often know about, particularly people who live in Bristol, because they think, oh, you know, I live in a city, I'm near a near a hospital. Why, where, why would I possibly need a helicopter? But in fact, about a third of our work is in Bristol. So, so this kind of what Pitch is doing to raise awareness of our charity in Bristol is absolutely amazing. Uh, because what we do, as, as you've heard some of the, the clinical crew say, is we bring the, the, the hospital to the patient. We're not we're not flying in, scooping the patient up and running to hospital as quickly as possible. What we're doing is we're getting the hospital to you as quickly as possible so that you don't have the delays that can otherwise happen uh, with, with getting the, the right care to you or getting somebody to the hospital or indeed getting somebody to the, to the correct hospital because um, so sometimes the nearest hospital isn't the right one for you and, and most of our patients end up coming to South Speed, which is the major trauma unit, or to the BRI, which is the, the, the heart specialist or indeed to the children's hospital. Um, so to go to the children's hospital in Bristol, you'd land on the, I land on the helipad at the BRI and then transfer across. Yes, because that's quite a new addition, is it? The, the helipad at the BRI. I remember when it was uh, installed there. That must have been a bit of a saving grace, I suppose, because otherwise, where would you have landed if you were going to the BRI? Um, well, we, we land in all kinds of crazy places that you wouldn't normally expect. So we land on College Green sometimes. Um, we, can, we do land in the city centre and all across Bristol. Um, so we can land on anything that's basically about the size of a tennis score or above. So even, even large gardens without trees we can land on. We've got, we've got absolutely expert pilots that are used to this, that know Bristol well. Um, and we land in all kinds of places, you know, like in front of the Royal Crescent in Bath and uh, on the on the seafront in Western Supermare. You know, you've seen there's photos of us landing on roundabouts in the middle of roads and things like that. So so they, they, they are very good at finding small spaces as near to the patient as possible. 
possible. But if we go to somewhere where there's, there's genuinely, we know there's nowhere near to land, then we will take one of our cars and exactly the same crew, minus the pilot, they're not needed to drive the car, uh, exactly the same crew, medical equipment, specialist drugs and everything will go in the car. And, it, and it's that team that, could, that will regularly give people general anaesthetics and put people um, into a, a coma um, on scene. Uh, they can do surgical procedures like amputations, emergency caesarean sections, uh, they can open up people's chests and, and work directly on the heart. So, wow. so we really are bringing absolute specialists. Uh, the, the doctors on our service are, are consultant doctors and they work in local hospitals. So on the days they're not working for us, they might be you know, running the emergency department in the BRI or leading the trauma team up at Southmead. Um, so, so I don't think the people of Bristol and Gloucestershire and, and North Somerset and Bath realise realise the expert, you know, the the, the, the world class uh, clinicians that are right on their doorstep, ready to respond, ready to come to you in in your street, in your in your bedroom, if you have a cardiac arrest at home, if you're on a car accident on the M32, you know, you've got the creme de la creme here. <laughs> ready, <laughs> ready, I, I think Sooty's trying to get in on the action there. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Anna, uh, 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 explain to me uh, how quickly it is that you can scramble the helicopter from that 999 call to getting it in the air to getting moving, because you can obviously miss out all of the problems that you get with a road ambulance. Yeah, so, so we support the, the road ambulance, the land ambulance crew. So we work really, really closely with Southwest Ambulance Service. So when a 999 call comes in, it goes to the regional centre in Exeter, um, where it gets put through to a normal call handler who then starts assessing the seriousness. And we fund uh, a small team of people who sit down in Exeter and analyse those calls that come in and work out which one of those calls needs the critical care team. And that's more than you might think. So we go to an average of about five calls a day, every day. Some days we're really, really busy. Some the busiest days we get called to 13 different jobs, which is which is incredible because you think every single one of those calls, somebody is expected to either die or suffer a life-changing in injury. We do not go to people who've twisted their, their ankle while hiking and things like that. Every single person is seriously injured or unwell. And when the call comes into Exeter, our team analyze them and then work out whether whether we're needed or not and if they are then they, they radio up to our specialist paramedic who's who's on the base at Almondsbury ready along with the doctor and the pilot um, and they decide whether whether they, they're needed um, and they might phone the, the land ambulance crew who might be on scene already and, and get some more information and give them some advice mm. and they'll decide whether they need to take the helicopter or the car uh, and get there as quickly as possible. So on the way, they will they will already have the car fully loaded with with this essential kit, uh, but they'll also grab blood because um, we give blood on scene and, and plasma and the specialist drugs that that they are kept with them and not left in a vehicle, which are needed to give people anaesthetics, advanced pain relief, and, and all the other complex things that that we we can do. I imagine it's quite expensive to keep the helicopter flying and maintained. How much do you rely on donations? We will. We rely on donations for pretty much everything. So we, we work really close with the ambulance service, uh, but we need to fundraise four million pounds a year every year to run the service. So that pays for the helicopter. It pays for the critical care cars. It pays for our, our doctors, our clinical crew, the specialist drugs, the specialist equipment that we have to do all the kind of complex things we do have. If you imagine... Um, the, what the kind of equipment they have in an emergency department in a hospital and how complicated it is, then we have to make it really small and lightweight and rugged because we're putting it in a helicopter and, you know, taking it out into a muddy, muddy field and dropping it. So this stuff doesn't come cheap. It's absolutely essential for what we do. And so many lives are saved each year because of our team. And, and that touches thousands and thousands of lives across the region. So last year was a bit of an odd year. So, uh, but in 2019, we saw, we were called to over 2,000 patients in Bristol, Gloucestershire, Bath and North East Somerset and North Somerset. So just in that kind of greater Bristol and Gloucestershire region and Bath. Um, so that just gives you a scale of what's needed. So if you divide up £4 million by the amount of patients that we see, in fact, it's only £2,000 per job. 
Now, I know people who've got sofas that have cost that much, right? So £2,000 to, to, to take a consultant doctor, a specialist paramedic, a pilot, a helicopter or a car, all that specialist drugs and equipment and deliver life-saving care and then take you to hospital and hand you over to the emergency department then. That is, uh, it's, it's such good value for money. It, it's, it's amazing. And our team do an amazing, amazing job on, on such a small budget. And we rely on all of the people that live in our region to get to fundraise for us. So it's playing our lottery. It's giving us a, a direct debit every month. It's uh, doing crazy things like this, which is brilliant. And, and so many people do random stuff like this for us. And we just love it because it yeah. raises awareness as well as raising money. Uh, and we're so, so grateful to the people that allow, allow us to be there for the people that need us today, but the people that will need us next month, next year and the next decade. Because ours isn't the kind of service that won't ever be needed. There's always going to be people becoming ill or having accidents. So we're always going to need to be there. Mm. And the nice thing about our charity is that we're there for everyone. So we like the NHS. If you, if, you, if you can call 999 or someone can call 99 on your behalf, then we'll be there for you. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter how old you are. About 10% of our, of our patients are children. Um, we will be there. Uh, so but very unusual for a service, a charitable service, to, to absolutely have a, a, an open book like that. If you need us, we're there. Mm. And you've got a new home, haven't you? In recent years, you're no longer at Filton Airfield. Yeah, we were we were one of the we along with the police we were the last users of Filton Airfield and and for people who like aviation I think the the, the airfield officially closed in like 2012 around that time we were there till October 2018 and it was like a wasteland um, and our hangar was falling apart around us um, and the weeds growing through the concrete and things like that. Uh, so yeah, it was right we were right next to the, what's that now Bristol Aerospace where the Concorde is. Um, and they've, they've now taken over our old hangar, actually, which was a, a pre-World War I uh, listed hangar, which is, uh, which is really a special kind of building, which had a great place in history, but was not good as a medical facility uh, for a 21st century organisation like ours. So in 2018, we were really lucky and we, we, we moved into a purpose-built hangar. Um, on the M4, M5 interchange um, at Almondsbury. So I'm pretty sure that, that the plane passed really close by today. Um, and yes, yeah, so we have, we, have we have a nice clean hangar now that doesn't leak and it doesn't have rats. So, and that makes such a difference. Just little things. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I bet it does, Anna. And uh, I hope you stay watching for the rest of the show because we'll, okay. keep, we'll keep asking for donations for you to keep the aircraft in the air and uh, keep up the excellent work that the Great Western Ambulance has been doing. Anna Perry, thanks so much for coming Thank on you. Picture Live. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Anna, and uh, that was uh, brilliant and uh, insightful, really, to hear exactly uh, how the Great, um, great uh, Western Air Ambulance um, functions and flies and, and, and responds to so many of those incidents that take place where you just don't think you'd ever need them, but they are always there and um, let's hope that uh, in the best possible way we don't need to use them anytime soon let's now just quickly uh, before we go back over to Johnny because I'd like to know where he is let's go to social media and Jamie and Lucy to hear also I want to find out what the total is if I can leave that with you as yes, well. Yes, yes, we've got for, that ready to go. For how much we've raised for the Great Western Ambulance as well. Yeah, we can tell you right now. So thank you to everyone who has been getting involved. Texting FLY to 70085 for uh, £3 uh, donation to the Air Ambulance. And you can see on your screens right now that we've, uh, we're have we getting really, really close to the total. 89% so far, £892. Of course, spurred along by that £727 donation from very own Johnny Palmer and, and uh, everybody else getting involved obviously too but uh, the goal is there to be hit so um, if you're feeling generous or, or if you're not feeling generous let me convince you text now fly to 70085 that will cost you three pounds plus your standard network rate uh, terms and conditions on our website now uh, lucy johnny asked a little earlier on in one of the last videos that we saw from him if we were entertaining and you've actually got some actual feedback that's quite exciting haven't you uh, i do indeed so roger gosling 
sadly not Ryan Gosling, but Roger, we still <laughs> love you anyway. Uh, Roger, um, I mean, obviously we're here from Johnny firsthand, but Roger said about 15 minutes ago on Facebook that uh, the plane apparently is stuck at the Willy Wicket roundabout, um, just waiting to manoeuvre. I think the police are working out what their next um, move is. However, Sue Buck replied to that comment and said, I think this is more exciting than watching the rover land, um, than watching, uh, sorry, than watching the rover land on Mars. Will it get round the uh, roundabout, lol? Um, we really <laughs> hope so, Sue, and hopefully Johnny will be able to be telling us very uh, momentarily um, if we've got round that particular roundabout. But thank you so much. Um, you're giving us these um, eyewitness responses, keeping us in the loop as well. Um, so yeah, it's really great that you guys uh, think that this is better than the Mars landing. I'm not sure if it is, but thank you. That's very sweet of you to say so. <laughs> it's, it's probably one of the most exciting things that's uh, happened in my life recently, and I'm sure uh, a lot of people out there today, of course, socially distancing and staying in social bubbles. We do um, encourage you to be as safe as possible out there. But uh, if, we, if we've got access to your laptop, um, Lucy, we've got a, a video here from Sarah Crisp which came in nine minutes ago um, of the 727 um, getting onto the M4. So if we just play that now, so that's the M32 video, which we showed a little bit earlier. So this was uh, from the gantry over the M32. Um, it feels like just a minute ago, but actually quite, quite a few moments ago now, because the plane has made its way a little further into uh, this, the city centre. So um, it was a more recent video um, from Sarah Crisp uh, on the hashtag P-Y-T-C-H, Pitch Air, of course, sorry, I don't know why I was spelling it then. Uh, but Sarah Quisp um, tweeted this incredible video, which uh, we've got now uh, on the screen ready for you. So here is the bridge over the M4. Um, Obviously, very, uh, <laughs> very average camera <laughs> movement there, but um, we, we thank you um, anyway, Sarah, for that video. But you can see it in the distance there. And um, if we just go around one more time on the video, we can see just how many people are, are out there um, excited. Oh, forgive me, that was the video from the start, wasn't it? That wasn't the M32. I've got, I got confused. If I just fast forward... There yeah, we go. We can see just people. how many people are out and about today. Socially Definitely distanced. Definitely socially distanced, though, of course. Yeah. There we go. Um, and we, we want to see more of them. So if you are by that roundabout where the, where the um, plane is reportedly stuck, get your phone out, send us a few pictures and some videos and hashtag them pitch air because we want to see them. But Chris has uh, a, a guest who's just arrived, a very exciting one, too. That's right. Thanks, Jamie. And thanks, Lucy, very much indeed. <clears throat> it's interesting you mentioned pitch because it's just worth uh, pointing out, of course, it's not P-I-T-C-H, P-Y-T-C-H, pitch, P-Y-T-C-H, pitch, air, uh, hashtag. Do find us on Twitter. And I'm delighted to now welcome Andrew to the studio from BCFM. Uh, you've been following the aircraft, haven't you? Where have you been? Uh, we've just been everywhere that has, really, just, just following it every yeah. step of the way. Yeah. So where did you start? Was it up at the top um, of the M5? So basically, in the morning, we met up with Johnny and we watched it like come out and then go just on this journey, just following it behind. Mm. Have you seen anything like this before? No, not really. <laughs> uh, what, what, have you got a radio car or, or a no, team of um, people with you? What, what's, what's your... Uh, my dad's vehicle? just a technical engineer. He's yeah. just, just, he just helps out with every, everything at BCFM. Right. Okay, so he's the technical engineer, so he's yeah. probably got the huge interest in this, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he, he really likes this type of stuff and everything. Yeah, and he's waiting for it to come round the corner, I imagine, because it's where we are at the moment. <clears throat> round the back of the studio is where it will eventually come round here. So you two are going to hang on, are you, and uh, do some broadcast onto BCFM? Um, yeah, um, interviewing um, people and everything, just, yeah, just doing that type of stuff. Mm. Uh, what do you think of the fact that we're getting an aircraft pulled into Bristol like this? It's just really exciting. Uh, yeah, yeah as, 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 as you said, I've never really seen anything like this before. Have you heard anything from your listeners? What have um, they said? Um, well, we've been posting stuff on Facebook as well. I uh, don't really know what if we have, because I've just been posting and then looking like on where tracking him, um, yeah. Johnny and everything. Yeah, just been really like made me smile and everything today. Great. All right. Well, Andrew, uh, stay around. Don't disappear. Make sure you and your dad cover the arrival of the 727 when it eventually turns up here out the back of the studio. Thanks for all the coverage so far and make sure you keep tweeting. Tweet, tweet, tweet. Lots of pictures when it arrives as well. Good work. Thanks so much indeed. Andrew there from BCFM. I'm now being told in my ear that we can go uh, to Johnny. 
As you'll see from that sign there, we are heading towards the M4, M5 interchange. So if you're not from the West Country, the M5 is a motorway that goes from Birmingham all the way down past Taunton to the southwest. And the M4 is a motorway that goes from London all the way through to Wales. And where those two meet, is the interchange and it also happens to be pretty much where Bristol is. So this interchange is chaotic. If you ever look at it from Google Maps, it looks like a big spider's web of robes, roads all interweaving with each other. And up ahead of us here, we're heading towards it. So luckily these motorway interchanges, they're very much slip road based rather than roundabout. So it should be pretty easy for Steve and the team to get this lorry and the aeroplane around them. Let's see. So what's been happening up until this point is there's been four police escort motorbikes going around us and they've been positioning themselves in such a way that we can take the line that we want to get the maximum height under, underneath the bridges. Now earlier on I said that the uh, bridges are always higher on the left, that's not the case necessarily because some are humps, some are sloped one way, some are sloped the other way. So Steve here is always looking for what line to take to get underneath these bridges like this one here. Okay so here we are, we're heading into Bristol. So you might have heard earlier in the show how Pitch Air, its last flight was actually to Filton Airport, which is just over there. So despite it being stored in an airport for a long time, it did never actually flew into Kemble. Flew into Filton and moved by road. So, in, so this is the second road journey Pitch Air has ever done. And it wasn't always called Pitch Air. It's actually um, VPCMN. If you're interested, look it up. That's Victor Papa. Um, Charlie Mike November. That's his tail number and from that you can see all sorts of photos of it all over the world right back to 1968. So this is actually quite civilised. I was expecting it to be kind of chaotic on here but nice and calm. And just over there is the Great Western Air Ambulance um, helipad. These are the people who run the air ambulance for the southwest and the charity that we're supporting in this show. I think I've raised over £700 and I know for a fact they were donated £720 seven pounds maybe someone might want to do seven pounds 27 or um 72 pounds 70 maybe yeah there you go but we're aim aiming to try and get them a thousand pounds from this show today which i think we can do so what the coppers have done here is they've closed off the filter lanes on the right hand side so we can get through freely needless to say a 40 meter long aircraft you don't want to be slamming the brakes on bear in mind this thing is held on with straps it's not like welding chains. or anything. Chain, sorry Steve. Steve says it held on with chains. And chains straps. and straps, straps, and straps too. Um, <laughs> so you don't want to be slamming the brakes on too heavy. So here we go, heading down the M4. And if you're local to Bristol, you know this is a pretty short run down here until you get to the M32. And then we have a chaotic yeah, roundabout. I'll tune bit, back in then. Uh, See you soon. Back to you in the studio. Out. Thanks very much indeed, Johnny. Yes, Johnny, a little bit earlier on from the M4. Let's see if we can go to the tracker now, which is active. You can keep an eye on where Johnny and the plane are. And here it is. So, it's still there. Interesting. It hasn't moved. Uh, let's see if we can get the crew to confirm that we are moving and we haven't stopped, whether that's the tracker that might have got jammed. I imagine he's moved on from there, unless he's stuck at one of the roundabouts. What's that roundabout? That's the... A down end roundabout. Uh, I think, as Tony was saying, there's a pub on the corner there, isn't there? I think on that one. <laughs> not sure. Obviously closed at the moment. It's not near the roadworks that I was expecting them to get stuck at. I'm yeah. aware that there's roadworks further around the ring road, which brings the, the road down to one lane. Yeah. Um, so mm. I think they might be stuck in a lay-by at the moment. Well, they might be stuck in a lay-by. Let's see if we could get the team to just find out and get an update from Johnny. Someone give him a quick ring and just see if we can find out if he's stuck, if he's moving, if our tracker is stuck itself. Uh, Joe Hall joins, joins me now back in the, in the studio here. Well, we're going to lighten the mood a little bit now <laughs> ahead of the, the plane arriving here, hopefully not too long away. The suspense is building, landing gear down. Uh, we've got a game to play. Yes, we have. So back from my radio days of playing fun little games, I thought I would make some little games to play with you guys in the studio. So um, everyone's been on long haul flights, I assume, and they've all had um, airline food. Now, you can either have really, really nice airline food that is delicious. You know, you tuck into it and it feels like you're sitting in a restaurant. Or you could get airline food that's maybe a bit questionable, like a, a sausage with tomato sauce at 3 a.m. in the morning for breakfast. So I thought I would put together a game, rate it or hate it. So Excellent. I've collected a sort of photos yeah. um, from various airlines. I'm looking forward to this. And I just want to hear your opinions on it. So we'll, we'll see 
rate it or hate it. So if we could get the first photo up, please. And also some, some theme music. We do have a bit of theme music in the, the background as well, I hope. So this is menu number one. We have a singular piece of broccoli, a scoop of mashed potato, a piece of salmon, and three carrots. <laughs> what are we thinking? Rate it or hate it? Lucy. I would actually very much rate this because I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie's looking at me like I'm I can I'm taste crazy. that picture and it's I, good. I, I honestly, I, I, I love salmon. I'm a big fan of salmon. I love mashed potato with it. I'm good with broccoli and carrots. I can also spy a tasty pudding in the background. So I would rate this, <laughs> much to Jamie's disgust. <laughs> well, I'm, okay. I'm going to hate this one. Um, I, I might have the, the cake. Um, but uh, no, I, 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 looking at this picture, I, I can taste it, and I, I can tell you right now, it doesn't taste good to me. <laughs> no, neither me. I like the idea of the cake. It does, Why well, maybe is it always broccoli and carrot? Shortcake. I mean, always, yeah, I don't mind the broccoli and the shortcake. I presume I can't see. I'm too close to the screen. Is that is that mashed potato or rice? I think that's mashed potato. That is mashed potato. And it looks like it's got a little swig of bamboo on top of it. Right, well, I don't um, think that's for me, so I won't rate that. I think that's a, that's a zero <laughs> for me. Uh, so the consensus is hate it, hate, Lucy, hate I'm afraid it. you're on your own. Um, now, unlike Saturday Kitchen, where the viewers normally vote on what we eat, I unfortunately don't have a live chef to provide me with any food. <laughs> I did try. Uh, my usual caterer was unable to provide me with airline food. Uh, moving on, if we could get image number two, please. So here we are. Rate it or hate it, it looks like we have two fish cakes, a singular piece of broccoli, an unidentified egg slab, maybe, um, and croissant and a wrapped item of food. Uh, Chris, let's start with you. Rate it or hate it? I know this is going to surprise you, but I rate that uh, because I have a very strange palate and I actually really enjoy food like that. A rolled up piece of uh, scrambled egg <laughs> with, <laughs> with two hash browns and a piece of uh, <laughs> broccoli. Yeah, I actually would like that. That's the sort of thing I'd eat um, on a morning. And the croissant as well, which I uh, have a portion for. So for me, I would rate that. Yes. What airline is that? Are we allowed to say? I, I'm not sure. It looks like it's a uh, cattle class, though. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> not your, uh, your yeah. business or first class no. eating. It does look like it comes with chocolate spread or a jam for the croissant, though. So mm. uh, I think that's strawberries, I think, from here. That's what they look like in that little pot. Mm. Not sure what's in the bag, though, but I'm not sure I'd rate this, but that, that's what I like about airplane food when, when you get lots of different things. So it's like a bit of an adventure. It's not just one, like the salmon, it was one dish. There's lots of different things. And then um, I, what me and my brothers do, we trade the bits that we like. So we end up with a collection of food that we would eat, um, but it takes a bit of work to get there. But currently, I don't think I'd rate this one. No, I think I'm with you, Jamie. I'm not sure I would rate it either. It looks like the hosts have tried to make some kind of face out of food. <laughs> um, so that immediately makes me go, OK, why, why have they done it like this? Um, and it does look a bit greasy to me. I'm not too much of a fan of grease. I would have the cross on. Definitely, and I would give whatever is in that yellow bag a go, potentially. There might be peaches or apricots in the... Yeah, in the that's all fine, but the smiley face broccoli nose is a bit of a no for me. The, the other question I'd like to know is, why is there broccoli with hash browns and eggs if this is potentially a breakfast meal? Well, it's, <laughs> it's not plain food without bad gas afterwards, is it? So Indeed. maybe that's what's Indeed. there to do. <laughs> so the consensus is two hates, one rates. That's a rate for me. Not yes, good. please. I'll Perfect. have that right now. I think there's some uh, croissants in the, the green room. I will get some of that. I will get um, some of that. I'm just going to pause you there because I'm just hearing in my ear, Joe, that we might be able to go live ooh. to Johnny. Oh, as I say that, we've now lost the line. Oh, so no. we will be going oh, back no. to Johnny. He is there, he was there, he wasn't there. Um, we we're going to get an update from him in just a moment. So don't go anywhere. We'll go back to the game. We'll play Brilliant. another one. Come on cool. then, Joe. One more round. Um, let's bring up the next image, please. Ooh. So this looks more like a lunchtime meal. And what are we saying? I'm looking, looking across at you guys. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads. So Jamie, let's start with you. Rate it or hate it? The I Oh, sandwich. it was the cursor. I thought I just saw a, a fly land on the <laughs> napkin, but it was the cursor. <laughs> I, just, I don't know, it's been a long time, hasn't it? I, it might be delirious. But yes, I would absolutely rate this. Um, I probably would 
uh, chuck that mushroom soup on the person in front of me. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, the the um, the bag, what is it? What do we call that? A ciabatta. Um, the prosecco would go down a treat right now, and that cookie too. Absolutely rate it for me. But it's not the mushroom ditch. I like that. Pitch, pitch or, or ditch. ditch. Oh, I was no. going to go, I was trying to avoid pitch or ditch. <laughs> but we, we, we can pitch or ditch it. Would you like to pitch or ditch this yeah, meal? Yeah, I'm going to pitch that. Look at it. It's fantastic. Um, uh, the soup, uh, maybe mushroom, is it? Maybe. Glass of white wine, perfect. Maybe uh, maybe chicken soup. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely like that on my, uh, on my breakfast table or lunch table. Do we think that... Is it cheese or could it be an egg? Could it be cheese? No, that's mozzarella. Isn't you it? think it's we'll mozzarella? It could be mm. like one of those McDonald's eggs, couldn't it? Oh, I'd hope anyway. not. That would ruin it all I, for I, me. For me, I, I would, <laughs> yes. For me, that's a yes. So that's a pitch. And Lucy, finally, yourself? Uh, yeah, you had me at Prosecco. I'll leave everything else. <laughs> I saw the Prosecco and went, yep, I rate this. Um, the sandwich looks tasty, the salad looks fresh. Always happy with the cookie. I think I'd be the same as Jamie, probably throw the soup on someone else or just kindly not not have it. But no, it's, it's a definite rate from me. It looks good. Brilliant. I think that's our first uh, unanimous rate <laughs> for, uh, for yes. a meal. Hey. Yes. Um, Excellent. Any more word on Johnny? Let me just ask the team back there. No word from Johnny. We're still waiting to get a connection for him. So well, we'll be back to him as soon as we can. Uh, we've got another one here. Take oh us no. through this. Oh, no. I forgot <laughs> I chose this. So a sausage oh. with a... Uh, what only looks like a gelati gelatized uh, <laughs> spaghetti... spaghetti o Lettuce. Cluster. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely mm. right. Well, like a waffle. And a Been soggy waffle. Microwaved um, into oblivion. So what are we saying? Great or hate pitch or ditch? The microwave meal from hell, from the looks of things. I don't know, you can't go wrong with a sausage and hash brown, can you really? I'm not sure about that puck of um, <laughs> whatever it is, past, past, the, past the letters, what about you? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a definite, uh, I was going to say ditch, but it's a definite no from me. It looks disgusting. And it's still in the microwave box. They've not even put it on a plate, so, you know, yeah. zero out of five. Budget airline breakfast, yeah. maybe. Uh, Chris, your unusual food taste, does this appeal to uh, you? Or? It doesn't appeal to me at all, no. Right. It looks terrible. Um, and uh, it's exactly the sort of thing uh, that I would try to avoid. If it came along the aisle, I think I'd order some um, of those circular crisps that come in the tube which uh, mm. I tend to have a lot on mm. flights. Not this, they're the six. Yes. Oh, terrible. <laughs> no, and what about you? What did you think of that? Would you eat that? I, I would not eat this. I would possibly pick away at the hash brown and maybe maybe have a go at the sausage, but that disc of... I um, still don't know what it is yet. Um, no, no, I, I wouldn't eat this. <laughs> right, OK. Yes. Excellent. Right, thank you, Joe. Brilliant. Any more on that? Uh, one more. Ooh, Here we go. I surprised myself. I forgot to put this one in. Ah. So this looks like a pasta dish with some tomato on it. <laughs> uh, not much else to go with it. Yeah. Um, very simple, nice lunch for some. But for you guys, rate it or hate it. I mean, it's just an ugly tortellini, isn't it? I'm sure it <laughs> tastes nice. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it is what it is, isn't it? It's just pasta <laughs> and tomato sauce. It's, it's probably one of the safer meals that we've seen so far. So I'd rate that one. Uh, I would. I would eat that, yeah. Uh, it's not um, top of the range, is it? But it'll do uh, if it's a very early morning flight and you're desperately hungry because you've been waiting in the airport for a number of hours and it's 5am. I'd have that. Looks a bit burnt, though, doesn't it? Brilliant. A little bit, yeah. You can see it on the edges now. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. And Lucy, thoughts on pasta? I'm afraid I'm going to have to hate this. Oh, this is no. not appealing to me. It does not look tasty. Um, and I would question how old it was um, because of the consistency of that sauce. It doesn't look fresh to me, so it's going to be a hate. Brilliant. Well, I think that is that is all of it. Um, Great. Unless the team are going to surprise me with another. Oh, oh no. there is one oh. more. Right. Final no. one, I think. Final one. I think we, we've come... It doesn't come... look like a, much of a meal, does it, this one? Yeah. See, I was... <laughs> when, I, when I selected this, I... Um, I couldn't work out whether I'd rate it or hate it myself because it looks nice, but also at the same time, I think I'd eat it and still feel hungry. Mm, so, yeah. I think I agree. Is it like a build it yourself prawn sandwich? Looks it. DIY yes. an assembly required. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, potentially a build it yourself cracker sandwich. Chris, rate it or hate it? Uh, no, because it's got prawns or um, 
shellfish that I've over on the right hand side, so no, not for me. Uh, it's definitely a no. I'm not fond of any of that. Uh, you can keep it. I'll send that back to the galley, please. <laughs> Uh, and finally, Jamie and, Jamie and Lucy, Rachel. I think Hitt. they've been a bit shellfish with the portion <laughs> sizes. <but laughs> sorry, everyone. Oh, that was so um, good. But, uh, but I, would, I would rate this one. I, I think I would rate it as well. Um, it's, yeah, like Jamie said, it's not the biggest meal, but, you know, I like the different colours. It looks like it's going to have a lot of flavour. Uh, so I think I'd rate this one. Well, I think that brings us to an end of Rate It or Hate It. <laughs> um, if there are any more photos, I think we can save ourselves the, uh, yeah. the trouble of looking at. Um, we do have some, some, though, um, some people on social media reaching out. Um, one person um, has said that they've seen the plane and they think it's someone trying to avoid self-isolation in a hotel, which I think is incredibly funny. <laughs> 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 where, so they've said, where have you flown from, sir? I haven't flown from anywhere, officer, kind of with protruding eyes. So I quite enjoyed that. Keep the jokes coming in. It's good to keep the fun up whilst we wait in anticipation for Johnny's update. Um, yeah, Jamie, have you seen any more comments? Well, I have just seen one from Anna Perry with just a quick update on the um, Just Giving Target for the Great Western Air Ambulance Charity. You can see now that uh, it's now very, very close. Oh, it's even Ooh. more higher than what I just saw. It was 94%, £944. So our goal today is 1000 It'd be incredible if we reached or even beat that. Like Chris was saying earlier, just £250 can purchase one of those lovely orange flight suits for the crew of the air ambulance that survives only on donations. So if you'd like to text FLY to 70085, that'll cost you £3 and it'll help us get a little closer to our target. Excellent. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Lucy and Jamie. And thanks, Joe. That was a fascinating and wonderful um, quiz that you set us there. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, you're watching Pitch Air Live. The time is 20 past one. We've been on the air for three, uh, no, four hours now, just over. And uh, here's a recap of what we're actually doing here. And, and what, you may be wondering what, what the hell's going on. Well, here in Brislington in Bristol, we are waiting for a Boeing 727 to arrive on the back of a lorry. It's being held uh, previously up until now at Kemble Airfield in Gloucestershire, where it's been really waiting for its new owner for the last maybe eight years or so until now. It's left Kemble this morning. It's on its way to Brislington, where it will eventually take pride of place behind this building, this wall here, on some um, metal containers where you'll be able to go up and have a look at it and go inside and uh, later in the summer, cross fingers, if the Prime Minister unlocks us in time, have a, uh, a cocktail or two or maybe a glass of champagne. Uh, and that's what it's about. And also in uh, association today with the Great Western Air Ambulance who we've been raising money for, as you've just heard, we are getting closer and closer to our target total. So thank you so much if you're watching and you've donated. We really do appreciate it. And I know Anna Perry from the Great Western Air Ambulance does as well. What we're gonna do uh, is, first of all, I'm hearing that we can go to a video which just come in from Johnny, who's on the ring road. Uh, Johnny, what's happening? So what's been happening? <laughs> We've been stuck in this lay-by here, just off the M32, going towards the ring road for a while now. Again, it seems to be an issue around which route we were taking. The police thought one thing, we submitted something else. So now they're dynamically looking to find a new route and dealing with the fact there's been some emergency. Steve says it's all done. Can I interview you, Steve? Uh, oh, we're just come. not going to move. Well, until we move, come on. Here we have oh, well, uh, the mysterious yeah. Steve that we keep talking about. Tell us about yourself, Steve. Not a lot to say, I'm just getting too overall. <laughs> Steve's speciality is moving aircraft and what, long loads, right? Yeah. Yeah? And is this the most interesting one you've done? Uh, well, to be fair, not really, but there we go. It's yeah? Just, yeah, just another day at the office. All right, not for us. But what was the most interesting one that you've done? Uh, 747. No. So tell our viewers how you would move a 747, because this one's not easy. Yeah, I've just got up. Oh, got go. Steve's concentrating. Sorry, people. He's a man of focus, Steve is. Very good at what he does. I did actually ask him earlier about the 747, and the way they do it apparently is slice it down the middle and do one half in one load and the other half in another load, which is just crazy, blows the mind. Bear in mind, a 747 is about three times as big as a 727. Very, very big aircraft. 
it's got me thinking, maybe we should get one of them next. But I'm thinking, you know what, that's kind of complicated some construction. I think a 7.2 is enough. And I think that, you know, we just got this one over the line with the planning office. I think if we um, went four times the size, they yeah, might not be so keen. Yeah, anyway, yet. so we're about to pull out the, the police escort for, um, here. They're going to get out front, probably slow down the traffic. That's going to give Steve the chance to get out on the, the, on the dual carriageway there. and get some speed behind now, him. Now, now bear in mind, with a load this big, with this many wheels, with this much weight, it doesn't just take off like a car would. It's a slow process. Right, and we're off. Check it out. Those coppers are moving quick. We've got one, we got one here who's, who's decided to beat two, who's decided to overtake the police escort. Well, I think they're in trouble up there. Three that's overtook the police escort. Ooh. Oh, so it sounds like some cars are shooting past our police escort, which is not helping the process of us safely getting on the road. So we're going to move up here. This yeah, is the uh, the Wick Wick roundabout, which will get us down to the Ring Road, the A4174. And then hopefully we'll drop a right, go down the Ring Road, into Brislington, Bish Bosh Bash, Pitch Air Lands. Although so far we're not exactly going to plan because we were hoping that we would have been down at Brislington by now. The team back in the studio, congratulations guys. Four, out, four hours, five, I don't know, a lot of hours of broadcast. I'm impressed. This is basically a TV show of a truck going down the road, blown away by the amount of content you guys have managed to produce. It's fantastic. So we're coming up to the roundabout now. Let's stay live. Let's stay live. See how this one goes. This is by the Travel Lodge, A4174, I think it was. And well, I guess we're going to be turning right here, aren't we, Steve? Uh, straight over. Sorry. Straight over at this one. Okay, red light. Check this out. Straight through the red light. Boom. Look at that. Good light. You feel quite special like this. I imagine that's what, the, what it's like being royalty when they get driven around. All the roads are empty for you, but for everyone else, it's total chaos. Right, we've got a kid on the side of the road there. Better wave at him. Maybe Steve will toot his horn, maybe not. Hey, guys! Well, that was pretty painless. Okay, well. I'll call back in when something else interesting happens. Back to you guys in the studio. Johnny, thanks very much. Uh, we're certainly uh, progressing very nicely uh, towards us here in Brislington. Uh, shortly, what we're going to do is show you a <clears throat> camera out the back uh, of uh, where the uh, plane will arrive. But I'm just looking at it now. It's currently looking out onto the road in front of us. If we could just have a look at the picture now. This is a live feed of Bonville Road, bringing it uh, all the way up to where we are here at the end, just off the A4 in Brislington. If you're wondering where we are, Brislington in Bristol in the UK, if you're watching from abroad or globally. And um, eventually the 727 itself is going to come up that road and join us here. And uh, hopefully, if we can, we'll be able to pull that camera back and you'll be able to see that the Clifton Suspension Bridge is just over on the horizon. It's quite a nice view that we have here. And it was stunning this morning. And what fantastic weather we've got to do this today. Um, earlier on, uh, you may have seen it, but I was talking to Tony Carey, <coughs> who is ex-Royal Navy, about the idea of trying to get it here. So, first of all, <clears throat> we've seen that it's on the back of a lorry, <clears throat> but it's a lot more than that. We've had to make room for it out the back here on all of these shipping containers where it's going to sit proudly on this metal structure so you'll be able to see it essentially from the road round the corner. Uh, it hasn't been an easy job though. Today is not the hardest part. I'd say the hardest part was getting planning permission. People think they can just go and dump stuff on land and then live in it. And people also think that if it's transportable, you can just put it there and you're fine. In, under UK planning law, that's just not true. So there's this idea that as long as it's got wheels on it, you can do what you want where you want, not so. What I learned from this is there's three things that planning officers are looking for to establish if something's a building or not. And it's whether it's a building, inverted commas, get to that later, um, that determines whether you need planning permission. It is size, how big it is, permanence, if it's going to stay there forever, and attachment, size, permanence, attachment. They're the three things they're looking at. So this argument that something's on wheels will contribute to it not being permanent and it not being attached, but it doesn't mean that it's not still a building. Now, the problem with building is it isn't really defined. In theory, under UK planning law, a gate post could be regarded as a building and you need planning permission for it. But it's down to the local planning office. 
So there's a level of bureaucratic subjectivity to this where the planning office basically get to decide whether they think you need planning or not, which is a pain. So in the case of the aircraft, we went thing for a certificate for permissive development. What that means is the council are telling you that you don't need planning for us. So you say, here's what we're gonna do, here's how we're doing it, we don't think we need planning. In the case of the aircraft, the council back came back and said, yes, you do. We said, well, hang on a second. It's not attached to anything, it's just sitting there. It's not permanent by virtue of the fact it got there on the back of a truck and size, well, it's the size that it is. Um, so they didn't accept that. So we then had to go for a planning application. Now, the planning application process is the same whether we're putting an aircraft on some containers or whether we're building a house. So we had to go through architect's drawings, um, plans, elevations, how we're gonna construct, construct it, and then they put it out to public consultation. People get to chuck their two cents in, flick a few insults from the sidelines, <laughs> which you've then got to respond to, and then off the back of that, you either get planning or you don't. In the case of Bristol City Council, it took them, I think, three months to read it, another two months to think about it. Then we had to hassle them and threaten them with formal complaints until they actually read it properly. And I think it was after six or seven months, they finally came back with a decision that like, all right, go on then. I wasn't, when we got the planning commission through, I wasn't surprised that we got it. I was surprised how long it took to get it. Because I thought, you know, like what valid um, reasons would people have to not want this there and parking was a concern um, aesthetics you can't argue that it's an industrial estate and in terms of the overall fabric and culture and aesthetic of the city I think this old aeroplane fits really well in terms of what we are as a city in Bristol yeah I've learned off the back of this that the planning law in England is pretty dysfunctional I mean getting planning to do something it's a bit of a no-brainer a bit of fun very low impact and low low harm low risk was so difficult and painful and expensive that it made me realise that there are issues with our planning in the UK. On a slightly different note, I owned a piece of land um, which was in a housing allocation to build houses on and I wanted to go for planning to get this and how difficult the council made it for me and all these consultants that want to stick their snouts in the trough and get their three, four, ten grand consultancy fee just to build a few flats was absolutely off the chart. So in the case of that land, I just went and sold it to someone else and made my profit with zero risk. So. Yeah, I think that, you know, it should be easier so people like me who are really focused on the environment and their community and delivering on quality houses that I'd put my name to, I'm being scared off development. So I do think there's a bigger planning issue in the UK that people who should be developing basically can't be bothered because the risk and the hassle is so great, the barriers to entry are so high that it's better to either just sit on the land or sell it to someone else for a quick profit. And that's a shame, I think. And there it is, the Clifton Suspension Bridge towering above the Avon Gorge in Bristol. That's our view from the roof cam here at Pitch Air in Brislington. And what a sight today on this. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it out there. I think it's a spring-like day, and it does feel like spring outside. I just had a look, as well as just trying to eat. It feels like uh, we're doing a, a general election coverage program here, like we're going all night quickly grabbing a, a, a bite to eat and a, and a drink of coffee at the same time while trying to <clears throat> stay on air. So thank you very much for, for staying with us and uh, enjoying this, I hope, as we track Johnny and the uh, Boeing 727 down the motorways into Bristol and the A4174. I can tell you that I've had a look at the tracker and right now we are just beyond the A420 roundabout off the ring road here in Bristol. And here it is on the wall, let's take a look. And over on the right hand side, there he is, you can see the, the dot there, that's uh, Johnny. Coming down to Bars Court, Longwell Green, uh, the B&Q on the right hand side there, as uh, we're coming now southbound towards the A4 Bath Road. I think the A4 Bath Road, I think this section and the A4 Bath Road will be the easy bit. I think they're gonna pick up pace here and they're gonna really start to make up the time as we get to uh, where it says Knoll Golf Club <clears throat> over on the left-hand side there. I think that's where we'll start to slow down as we come into Brislington, as we start desperately trying to turn right. And as Tony Kerry was saying earlier on, I think that's going to be where we will find our problems. And that's what we like to see. Problems, incidents, all sorts of issues that we can overcome here on Pitch Air Live. And Johnny hopefully will be the one to bring us the update. So I don't think we're that far off from 
actually uh, being able to invite Johnny here into the studio and hear his story about the journey down from Gloucestershire to Brislington here. You are watching Pitch Air Live. We are a live broadcast on Facebook and YouTube. And the time is now half past one, and I really hope you're enjoying what we're doing. We've talked about so far how to donate to the Great Western Air Ambulance, um, and you can do so by texting the word FLY to 7085. That's 70085. Please do all the donations which are coming in, as we heard from the Chief Executive a little earlier on, are so welcome to try and keep the aircraft in the air, because you just never know when you might need the air ambulance um, coming to you in need. We also played Rate It or Hate It, the aircraft food. We've learned a lot, I think, today about the, a, uh, about the, um, the Boeing 727. Uh, we've got to see inside the thing, haven't we, really? I think we've got them video somewhere of inside the Boeing 727. I wonder if we might be able to play that while I'm just waiting for the next uh, live item to come back. If we could just see inside the Boeing 727. I can talk you through its incredible decor. Here it comes. This is it. This is inside our plane that's currently on the back of a lorry coming to Bristol. There's a bed and an ensuite. And look at that, some fantastic old decor from the 1970s. Uh, a dining room table, uh, cough, soft, comfy chairs. Looks like uh, first class chairs there. Uh, of course, ashtrays back in the day in the 60s and 70s when, in fact, you could smoke on board. And look, here's the cockpit. This is the... the uh, there, look there, that, look at that view out the front. Um, windscreen wipers need a, a bit of work, I think. But otherwise, uh, it's pretty much intact. And I can't wait to see it when it arrives here in, in Brissington. There it is. So going up the air stairs that we talked so much about here today. The way to get onto the plane, very unique, actually. Uh, you don't often uh, find at uh, airports, you, you turn up to get on your plane to go on holiday and you always got to get on through the side door. Um, it's, uh, I, for me, I think I'd, I'd like to try that. I want to go out and have a go when it eventually arrives here. Let's go up those air stairs and I will promise you we'll try and take you on board the moment that Johnny gets back here to Brislington. So, uh, let's see if we can now go to our... I suppose we could call them our reporters who are out and about. Uh, Loz, uh, who is in the car uh, following the aircraft as we speak. And uh, here they are. Uh, you're live, guys. Can you hear me? Hello. How's it going? Yeah, great. So uh, tell us, where are you? Where are you? Well, as you can see in front of us, there's two coffers here just now. Um, and we are the second roundabout away on the ring road from where we're going to turn right up towards Bonville Trading Estate. So... Wow. The, lorry, uh, the plane is to stop behind us on the side of the road. We've had to pass it. Um, so, yeah, so I imagine in the next sort of 10, 15 minutes-ish, it's going to be up near the McDonald's wow. on the uh, edge of the trading estate. After all this time, we're finally there. I can see the lights going yeah. green now. So no, are you, gonna, are you no. waiting for the police or do you keep going? Ah, oh, right, uh, so you keep police, going. Yeah, the police yeah. Uh, haven't been... They've been lovely, but they're a bit more um, stern down here in Bristol than the... Uh, lovely the police up where we were before so um they'd rather we didn't stay too close to them and it's mm. very busy here so, uh we kind of get in the way we felt a bit in the way so we've Excellent. we're going to try and get a position in the trading estate for um for, as it arrives because that's going to be interesting getting around those corners so i think that's a better vantage point than us just sitting traffic behind it are you seeing a lot uh, of people standing out on the roadside yeah, seeing well, it go by now, wow bridge. look at that wave everyone hello <laughs> <laughs> on a footbridge there well, uh, over the ring I road. Think the, I think the word is getting out there. It certainly is. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, ask you again, because uh, you've moved on quite quickly now. So you're ahead of the plane. It's behind so you. Yeah. So now we're just ahead of it. Yeah. Um, we're heading down towards the roundabout um, that turns right up into, uh, up into Bristol. So right. um, the path one. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, you're, you're so literally, you're at the A4, are you? Nearly at the A4? Yes, very close. Right. So we're going to get an advantage point by the McDonald's now because that corner is going to be very interesting with the junction. So um, that's what we're we've been talking about. Yeah, that's what we've been talking about all morning. That junction there, uh, as you turn right there to uh, McDonald's on the A4. Um, yes. 
You seem to be moving quite quickly there, so you're trying to get yeah. ahead, are you? Just trying to get ahead now so we can get... We've had a lot of shots of following the vehicle for the whole journey, and we haven't really been able to get the opportunity to get in front. Because obviously, once we're in front, I can't really slow down in the outside lane and let the boots pass me on the inside. So, mm. you get what I'm saying? So, um, so yeah, so this is going to be the first time we're going to get a good vantage point, and I see them coming from the other direction. Mm. So, it'll be interesting. OK. Any problems you've come up against? We've had no animals in the road or anything? Um, the only problem, really, not... No, they've been close to the bridges on the way down, very slow. Um, and it was just really an issue with the roadworks, which have been yeah. the ring road, and a swap between the two constabularies, the two different police forces. So we waited for a while while they were sort of negotiating how they were going to get through these roadworks. Uh, but so far, they seem to have managed it. They have. No, they've done well. Yes, yeah. That's on the south. Ah, people everywhere, yeah? So we're just about now to turn right up towards Bonville Trading Estate. Wow, here we go. There's the there's the A4. So you're finally on the home straight, I think, coming into land. Trading so table stowed. Get to the spot and then try and go live again yeah. when they reach that junction, maybe, or something. Yeah, I'd stay there. That looks great. So see if you can uh, get a nice vantage point there. We'll come back to you. Let us know as soon as you see the plane come around the corner and we'll come back to you live and we'll see it approaching its final destination. Los, thank you so much indeed, guys in the car. We'll be back with you shortly. No problem, mate. Here we are, we're live out and about, not far to go now. Just there in Brislington, right on the edge of the airstrip, coming into land, the runway not too out of sight. Now, I'm being told that Lauren is outside the front of the building who can bring us an update on... Uh, what she can see out there. Lauren, hello. Hello there, yeah, I'm out on Bonville Road at the moment, just obviously anticipating the arrival. Um, so as you can see, if I just spin you around, if I can, um, just there. So here we are on the road, just waiting for the arrival of the airplane. Um, and then just round here, obviously we've got where it's gonna be pulling up to. I think this corner will be quite a tight one to get round. Uh, but hopefully, we've got this far, we'll get a little bit further just into this one here. So, yeah, all waiting over this way. If you keep going down there, Lauren, you can find the, the nose cone. Could you just wander down and uh, tell us what, uh, what you can see? Just around the edge on the left-hand side there, uh, if you keep going, there's the nose cone for the plane that is a lot bigger than you would actually imagine it would be. But just take a look at it. And you'll see, here it comes on the left. There it is. There, there it is. Are. Japan Airlines. Lovely. 727. Yes, we've got the nose cone just here. This was the one that they thought looked a little bit like a tent this morning in the fog and everything. <laughs> so it's been here waiting to be reunited with the main airplane. So, along with that, the nose cone, we've got the landing gear, I've got the, the wheels here in the studio. We're uh, going to get our spanners out uh, over the next day or so and try and put this thing back together so it's back on there. I think that's going to be really exciting. Yeah, so, absolutely. It's going to be brilliant the next few days, seeing how it all unfolds. So uh, uh, you might want to, if you can, go up on the roof and uh, get a nice shot from up there while we're waiting in a bit. We'll come back to you in a bit, Lauren, if that's OK. Lovely. That sounds good to me. Excellent. Good stuff. All right, Lauren, thanks so much. Lauren there, right outside the studios here at Pitch Air following this fantastic story that's culminating and coming to an end here today, this Saturday afternoon. It's coming up to 20 to 2. I think it's time for a little social media update. I think we've had a lot of interaction today, and thank you to everyone who's donated. What have people been saying in the last few minutes? Well, Val Cobain is asking, is it stuck by Asda? Um, hopefully not. That's news to us, Val, if it is. Um, I think it's a bit further down than that, so, so no worries there. Uh, John D. Payne here on Facebook, um, just after seeing the shots of the interior of the plane, he said, that's a beautiful interior, puts my office to shame. I, think, I, I don't know about you, Lucy, but I think I probably live on that thing. It, it looks... 
plush enough. It does look pretty snazzy. It's a bit of a time capsule, to be honest with you, of the 70s. And I think that's why it's so cool when you go inside, because, you know, we, from the ashtrays, which is, it's, you know, smoking was just all the rage back then. Also, the chairs look so comfy. I've never sat on a plane with a chair that looks that comfy. Fingers crossed they will one day. Um, we've also had Scott White on Twitter. He's posted a beautiful picture of our plane um, on the A417. And he says, an absolutely amazing sight. It is an amazing sight, Scott. And what a, what a blessing to have such lovely weather today as it um, finally reaches its destination. I mean, it's, it's going to make all the footage that we know, we'll no doubt collect from today just look incredible so uh, I mean I, th I think we've put together quite a, a, a decent um, show for you so far today but what's still to come is is probably something that you don't want to miss we've had a few more videos as well uh, Bob O'Brien tweeted this one around 13 minutes ago he was stood on a footbridge over the A4174 by the Light Green Roundabout and Rosary Roundabout. And, and this um, was the plane coming sort of down past the bend. There he is zooming in. Um, as you can see, the closer we get into the city centre, those roads are getting tighter. So they, they were really spoilt with those, um, what was it, three, four lanes on, on the M5 earlier on today. Um, but we have been assured that uh, I think it's Steve who is uh, driving the plane down, that this is what he does best. He's, he's very skilled at these sorts of things. He's pulled a plane even bigger than this, a 7, 747, was it? Is that what we were saying? Yeah. Um, yeah, so there we go. We can see it slowing down a bit as it goes <laughs> under the bridge, almost to a stop. But uh, it obviously got through because that was uh, a few minutes ago now, and there it is. Uh, successfully cleared with a lovely edit. Well done, Bob, um, doing our work for us. Just before we pass back to Steve, we want to show um, some more footage from the Great Western Air Ambulance Charity. Yes. Um, incredible footage from our guys up in the skies today. So we'll get that up for you. Let me just um, get it up for you. Apologies. So they there have been doing their best, you know, emergencies permitting, to follow along. And this is, is that footage now. Look at it. Look at it there. Perfect conditions, I hope, for them today. <laughs> we were a bit concerned this morning because of the, all the fog and, and the low cloud that we yeah. wouldn't necessarily get much interaction. But um, I mean, they, they've really pulled it out of the bag for us today. Yeah, that is absolutely amazing footage. Thank you so much to the guys who um, came out in there. I think they were doing a planned uh, training exercise, but we appreciate them nonetheless <laughs> flying over to get some shots of our plane. Um, do remember, if you want to donate, go to the Just, uh, Just Giving page or um, text FLY to 700. Five. And uh, just hearing actually that this this particular footage was just on the way back from a shout, so on, on the way back from um, a, a call that the air ambulance went on. So um, you know, just just look. I'm guessing that the that both the helicopter and the plane were in the right place. And Lucy, just actually, there's one more thing. There's there's another person that we need to highlight, isn't there? Yeah. Who's uh, who's got a, almost a better setup than we have in the at the social media station. Um, uh, Dawson, uh, is it, who's been watching closely, watching along, and our first, um, our first probably update, actually, while we were struggling for signal in Gloucestershire, came, came from uh, um, this person who has been, um, who's had their eyes on the prize all day long. They really have. So Dawson um, underscore PW on Twitter has sent us their picture of their setup. Um, they said, oh, I'm glad you've liked the images I've been getting, but unfortunately now I've run out of cameras as they've <laughs> left the motorways. But thank you so much because you have kept us updated um, with those pictures along the way. And we love it. You've got quite the setup there um, in what looks like underneath some kind of bed or something. I love it. A nice little snug for you to watch our live stream this morning. Dedication. Really, yes, dedication. dedication. <laughs> Well done. So um, if you have anything to share, please do hash, uh, hashtag uh, pitch air, pitch with a Y, by the way. Um, and if you did want to help us reach our uh, funding goal, our, our fundraising goal for the Great Western Air Ambulance Charity, like Lucy said, all you have to do is text FLY to 70085. That'll cost you £3 plus your standard uh, network rate and all terms and conditions you'll be able to find on the website too. But Chris, lots going on, lots more still to see, but I think me and Lucy will be starting to get quite nervous to see the footage coming in as we get closer and closer to Bonville Road. Thank you both very much indeed. A recap of why we're here, waiting for a 727 to arrive from Kemble to here in Brislington. It's coming on the back of a lorry. It was a former Japanese Airlines plane, about the, well, the 
the 60s into the 70s. It was converted into a VIP plane, which it's been up until the, well, 2003-ish. It's been waiting for its new owner up at Kemble since 2012. And finally, it has a new owner. And as you've been seeing, it's on its way down here to Bristol. The insides we've looked at are already causing a bit of a stir online. They are looked literally from the 70s. Um, and uh, it really is a, a bit of um, aviation history that soon we'll be seeing as it comes around the corner. I'm watching a feed here, which is looking down onto Bonville Road. We are still just uh, a few moments away. Uh, the road is empty, you can just see it there. The roof cam, which is uh, diverted through. There it is, people waiting on the corner, just as we head down towards the bath road for an update on where it is. And we'll hopefully get uh, Johnny back on the line in a bit as soon as we can. Now, I mentioned that uh, it's it's basically spent the last eight years of its life at Kemble Cotswold Airport. Um, you might ask why it's been stored at Kemble. Take a look at this. I'm Mark Gregory. I'm the uh, owner of Air Salvage International. Uh, we um, dismantle aircraft for spare parts. We also do maintenance and parts recovery. So out of interest, when you get them, I'm guessing, so when, say, old seven, say an old 737 lands, yep. how much do you buy it or do you work on behalf? You buy it. So in its last breath of flight, what do you pay for it when, it, when its wheels touch down? It depends on the type of aircraft. It could be anything from half a million yep. to 10, 12. Million? Million. Oh, really? Yeah. We do, we're going into partnership with engine companies, so the engines are 80% of the value of the aircraft. So a half million pound aircraft could be 400 grand of engines just for the three engines? Well, millions. The engines are millions. Oh, really? The engines are being 80% of the value, 80-90% mm. of the value, the engines will be the majority of the value. So 80% so of the engines? More, more often than not, an A320 of a value of about $10 million. That much? Yeah. Really? With engines. Without engines. Probably 1.5 Really? What's the value then? Landing gear, avionics? Landing gears, avionics, wheels, brakes, avionics, all, all sorts of stuff really. And then I suppose... When 20% of the parts removed from the aircraft will make up the value, that, the overall value. So the rest of it is all profit. So Mark, it originally landed, it took its last breath at Filton Airfield, right? It landed at Filton, yes. So why did it, it ha why did it come here? From Why did you not just land it at Kemble in the first place? Because it was owned by MK Airlines. Mike Kruger, uh, he bought the aircraft, he, he flew it, or got it flown from the States to Bristol uh, for some modifications. They went in for these modifications and then uh, within, I would say, 12 months of it landing at Filton, MK Airlines went into administration. And there's, there'd been no servicing or work done on the aircraft, but we did find out about getting a ferry flight of that aircraft out of there, mm -hmm. which we could have done, but the insurance was uh, about 250000 just to do a ferry flight <laughs> Why? out of Bristol because that's what they charge, I guess, really. It was just a one-off ferry flight we wanted to do. So it was too much money, really, so we didn't bother. That's why we cut the wings off and brought it back. So the insurance, why? Because it's an old aircraft so just, or...? Well, it's just insurance for um, flying, really, uh, because we're not an operator. It's right. more money, really. Obviously, operators don't pay that amount of money. There was no operator, so the airline got into administration. And we say airline, but it was a private jet. So was it an airline for private jets, or it, it, no? It was an airline. MK Airlines was a freight operator. That was going to be his personal jet. So this Mike Kruger chap is he? He's, did... he's still around, Mike Kruger. He, um, I think, he operates another airline in, um, I think, it's somewhere in Lithuania or somewhere, Georgia, in Georgia. Right. So he was operating a big cargo company, uh, the airline. Like I said, the cargo company went into administration. Probably, I think about eight, nine years ago, might be a little bit longer. So was it not worth someone else spending a few quid on getting an airworthy and making a private jet again? Really, because by that time, the, those aircraft were almost uh, virtual and obsolete anyway. Really. really? And what makes them obsolete? Is it cost of maintenance, fuel cost? Fuel, fuel costs, cost of maintenance, um, uh, and just the age of the aircraft. That one there is 1967, so it's quite old. It's proper old, isn't it? It is, yeah. And I read somewhere that they cost about 10,000 an hour to fly yeah, a 727. About 15, to actually operate um, a 727. Whereas what would a modern, say, 727 or a Gulfstream be? Uh, a lot cheaper than that. Like yeah. About two and a half, three thousand pounds. Oh, really? So, yeah. And that cost per hour, is that the fuel as well as the maintenance? That's the fuel, the maintenance and everything else, really. Okay. So this is another 727, this isn't is it? This we, we operate and work and use just here. We don't fly anymore. And you say the one, that? Uh. one behind is the one that you actually went to see. We so in theory, that could actually fly? It could do, yeah. This one could fly, yeah. If you got a... If you've got two pilots and an engineer down here now, could they fire up and take off? 
uh, not without a little bit of work. It needs some ADs doing as well. So, um, do you want to get and look around, or do you want? Yeah, to... for sure, that'd be cool. Yeah. Uh, wishful thinking, I think, uh, Johnny. But uh, excellent to see and hear the story of where it's uh, come from. Talking of Johnny, uh, I understand that we can now go live to Johnny, who is somewhere out there. Probably on the A4. Johnny, tell us where you are. What's happening? This is the Brislington uh, McDonald's corner. So if you're a local person, that's the A4 going past there. And that's the world's most badly designed traffic light system. Now, when we were driving in here, um, Steve, the driver, started asking me directions, which was slightly concerning. Um, and I said, you've got to drop a right up, up there, mate which is kind of a bit weird when you've got an aeroplane behind you. So now what he's doing okay. is checking to make sure he can actually turn right, um, which hopefully he can. Can you turn right, right Steve? Uh, so, no. No, sort of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Fine. I can't hear you, Chris. That's all right. I was just looking to see where you were going, Johnny. So you're now on the side oh. of the road. You're, you're gonna. You, so Steve says that it's looking a bit touch and go. Uh, what are the options? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's like it's got to get in there. It's going to stay on the road, isn't it? Maybe they could park on this bit of grass here and it could live here for a while. Um, <laughs> really maybe McDonald's will want it, or maybe they can find a solution. Maybe they need to remove some lampposts. I don't know. That's why I'm excited about this whole thing because it's like proper, you know, MacGyver stuff. But I think they're kind of making it up as they go along a little bit. OK, hang on there, Johnny. We're going to come back to you in just a moment. This is really getting yep. tense now. Stay there and just stay in touch with us <laughs> because I just want to go to the roof here at Pitch Air uh, to speak to Ben, who uh, is going to be looking down from the roof uh, up the Bonville Road to see when it actually happens. So there's Bonville Road. That leads down to the A4 where Johnny is right now. And it's that junction that we're currently stuck at. Uh, and I believe that uh, we can go to Ben, who is uh, up on the roof. Ben, I can see you. There you go. You got your beanie on. Uh, what can you see? You're on mute, Ben. You're on mute. Take yourself off mute. Hello. There you go. Got you now. Got you. Hello. I mean, I'm, I'm on the roof uh, in the back of the yards. Uh, we have the containers in the background. Uh, as you can see, uh, I'm going to stand here so I can get the, uh, the view of the airplane coming in uh, when it arrives. You're in prime position up there. I can see exactly where you are. You're right above where I'm sitting right now, actually. Uh, and if you just point your camera over the other side, we'll probably pick up Lauren, who's uh, just pan right a little bit over there. Let's see if we can talk to Lauren. Lauren, can you hear me over on the, the top of the... Shipping containers, waiting for... There you go. Hi, Lauren. So you're on the other side of the yard. Um, Hello, do you, yes. Do you, think it, correct, do you think it will take, the, take the weight? Do you think it will take the weight from where you are? Do you think it's going to be safe? Well, I sure hope so. I mean, there's some really good still work going on over here. So I have absolute faith in that team that they've done the right thing so that the airplane can sit happily and live comfortably on here. Where's the nose cone from where you are? So, if I just flip you around, lovely. So, if you can just see over here, I won't get too close to the yeah. edge, but there is the nose cone <laughs> down there out in the yard. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it looks like everything is kind of prepped and ready. We've got people waiting over on the other side. Uh, so, yeah, anticipating the arrival now. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, just those gates at the very top, that's where... It's good, isn't it? Up there, that's where it's going to come through. Right, stay there, Lauren and Ben. It's going to get exciting now. Let's go back to Johnny. Johnny, Johnny, you're down there. There's the aircraft. There she is. Go for it, Johnny. Tell us what's happening. Hang on. Hey, guys, how you doing? Yeah, great. What's happening? She's on the move. It's moving. It is moving. This is the most critical moment, and this is the bit that I was most concerned about, where it's going to try and get around a really, really tight junction. Let's go over here and see what's happening and try and not get hit by the lorry. And let's really hope it doesn't roll off, because that would be really bad. So it looks like he's turning around down the road. Maybe he's going to reverse it. I'm genuinely confused. Or maybe he's going to put the back end down that road and go the wrong way down this road. It's a total mystery. I don't know, but it's absolutely fascinating to watch. And uh, what about the traffic, Johnny? Just spin round and show us how much disruption you're causing. It's not, it's not, it's not me, Chris. It's not me. <laughs> they love it. Everyone loves it. Um, of course they do. 
Here you go. Yeah, it looks uh, an incredible sight. The fact that plane is on the A4. Who'd have thought? Lots of people gathered around as well. Well, it's, you know what? It's a bit like when London's shut down because of a protest. It becomes very peaceful and very community-based. It's quite, quite calm and tranquil here. I'd say there's a strong sense of community as well. It, it's nice. It's a good atmosphere. Maybe they should shut the uh, A4 more often. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not a bad idea. <laughs> so once that plane gets around that corner, how far has it got until we can see it on the camera, Bonville Road? OK, so Bonville Trading Estate, great bit of the city, love it. Not particularly big. It'll go about 100 metres, then it's got a mini roundabout to get around. That'll be interesting. Then it's going to go up and probably drop a left down Emery Road. Then you'll see the truck poke out onto Bonville Road and try and make its way around the next corner. So, um, is, do you know the McDonald's? Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, it's literally, I mean, it's not far at all, but it's just taking the right. They can't seem to get round. So this is the McDonald's here, but they can't seem to get round there at the moment. So still waiting. Can you see it's quite a tight corner? Yeah, it looks tight. So they're just, I mean, I don't know how they're going to... Great. OK, Johnny, just stay there. I'm going to go back up to the roof and I'm just going to see... Right turning, but I just see what Ben is uh, and Lauren yeah, are saying. McDonald's. Lauren, Lauren, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think she can hear us. Over. I think she's probably <laughs> too excited by what's happening. So we'll come back to Lauren a little bit later on. Let's have a look at that uh, PT's Edge, that, uh, that camera on the roof, please, the, the, the robotic one. There we go. Right. So that junction there, uh, that's Emery Road, I think. No, if not, it's the one further down. No, that's, that's the one that's after it. Road. That's Road right. Is... So Tony's back with me here in the studio and... Uh, Tony, um, we're now building anticipation as we start to wait for the aircraft to appear around the corner. That there, that uh, robotic camera on the roof looking down towards the A4. Yeah. You can see those blue buildings right on the horizon there before the trees. That's the A4. Yep. That's the trading state. So somewhere along there, probably actually just around that corner, actually, if I remember rightly, there is that turning to the left there. Really? Not where that car's come from, but the next one down. That's yeah. Emery Road. And that's the road that they need to get on once they get beyond McDonald's. Well, so that's, if, is that right, Tony, as far yes, as you can remember? Yes, but if I were them, I wouldn't go that way. Oh, right. Oh, dear. Um, but then, I mean, the, the driver's done a perfect job so far, assuming he hasn't demolished the traffic lights <laughs> up at Mac McDonald's. Um, that... I'm just showing you now, Chris. Um, right, so we've got a little... Maybe we could bring the tracker up and we'll get that bigger, actually, uh, Tony. Yeah. If we could get the tracker up on screen, I could see it there on, on graphics. Let's bring it up. Uh, so here we go. There's the junction. Right, yes. Yeah, so there we, it is. Um, so we want to go... We're just trying to go north here, aren't we? So this is Victory Park. Um, that's West Town Lane there. Yeah. And here's Johnny, right on the corner here. Now... This road is a bit challenging to see. This is Emery Road comes around here. Yeah. This mini roundabout, I think, is Broomhill Road coming up here. That's right. This is Clothier Road, and this is Dixon Road. Yeah. And we're just up there, but the, the upper blue spot, or maybe right. the top black spot. Right at the top. But I, <sighs> this junction here between Bonville Road and Emery Road is, is, is like a, a figure, an S shape. So by the time you've got the back end of the trailer into Bonville Road, the front end is wanting to move the wrong direction. So if I were driving this, I think I would seriously look at coming down Dixon Road to get onto Bonville Road, because fundamentally that's that junction you can see there, which mm. is quite a straightforward junction. OK, it's narrow, but mm. it's... it's it's probably an easier junction than, than the Emery Road junction. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, well, let's just see what Steve decides to do with the uh, trailer um, as we keep an eye here in the studio on Johnny's position. Uh, we are still connected to Johnny, and we'll go back to him in just a second. I noticed uh, before we do that, let's talk to Social Media Corner and the Arrivals Lounge. Um, I noticed that there are a lot of people down there on the side of the road have we heard from any of them or what they're thinking about what's happening? Anyone tweeting us or sending us photos from the edge of the road there? Well, it's all gone a bit quiet.
quiet on the, the photos and videos front. I think people are just in awe of this plane going sideways <laughs> through um, what Liz Lister correctly says is the worst design junction in the world. But Prue Combin um, is updating us saying it's now heading into the industrial estate. So uh, maybe we'll catch a glimpse of it soon from where we are. Uh, John D. Payne here um, appreciating the MacGyver reference. Got to fly to work now, but good luck with the landing. And then uh, Chris Rowland is asking if the Mega Mac is back on in McDonald's. <laughs> I think we've got a few other things to worry about, but um, I surely <laughs> will be heading up there to place my order as soon as we head off air uh, when that plane is uh, in pride of place. Uh, but what have you been seeing, Lucy? No, pretty much the same as you, Jamie. It has gone a little bit quieter. Um, as you say, I think people have, um, you know, put down their phones quite rightly just to enjoy <laughs> just to watching it uh, manoeuvre that, um, that turning into the estate. Um, so uh, if anyone is still watching, uh, please do uh, send us some photos or some videos of it moving. Um, we've just had a lot of retweets, a lot of um, hearting our tweets. So really appreciate your engagement on Twitter. Um, and yeah, it's it's I'm excited. It's it's almost here, isn't it? It's almost here. It's just got a few more corners to try and shimmy itself round. Um, so fingers crossed we can speak to Johnny in a minute and see how they're getting on. Um, as, as we've seen a bit of a struggling going on in, in the traffic lights, Chris Rowland um, says we should have hired Chinooks to move it. Now that would have been a sight, <laughs> wouldn't it? But I'm not sure how we, they, low they would have got to drop it into place. Um, but just one for you, Tony. Um, Liz Lister says there's nothing Tony Curry doesn't know about anything. <laughs> I'm not sure if Liz is being... Oh, maybe <laughs> nice. Oh, oh she's, she's making a point. Yes. Hello, Liz. <laughs> I think uh, I think she's onto something there. Uh, thanks very much, uh, both of you. Uh, welcome to the arrivals hall here at Pitch Air. We are right now live on Facebook and YouTube in the final minutes now ahead of the approach of Flight 001 Pitch Air. Uh, it's going to touch down here, hopefully in maybe hopefully a few minutes time i'm keeping an eye on the feeds in front of me to see if johnny is still on the line um we have johnny down there at the end of that road bonville road on the left hand side emery road as we've discussed uh he is with the plane trying to get around the corner uh, do we have johnny to go back to okay we've reset so i think that means we're on the move which means johnny's back in the cab so, in theory, that means we're off that junction. Could I just have a quick look at the tracker one more time, just to see if his pin has moved on the map? Yes, so it's now started on that road. So, as we discussed, Tony, we're now going up to that roundabout, as you can see. Yes. He's... And that roundabout then, I imagine, uh, is that say direct sewing machine? <laughs> Past there. <laughs> Direct sewing machine. Yes. Uh, uh, up to the junction, um, uh, which well, is uh, the, by the, the mini roundabout is just on the road. There. Yes. So, um, when when the tracker goes past there, we we'll know yes. whether he's choosing my route or what I would consider to be a challenging route. But I mean, they've done mar marvelously so far that I, I really, um, you know, I'm I'm somewhat loath to sort of say that my route's better than. Yeah, Irish, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 we've just seen that the pin move, actually. Look, it's just moved a little bit further. So I think we're approaching the, the end of that junction. In fact, here's Johnny now. Look, uh, Johnny, update, breaking news. What's happened? Fine. So he's managed to get round the McDonald's corner, and now he's coming down here to what is actually a mini roundabout. But I think he's going to go straight over that mini roundabout and turn right past the meth lab that Tony Carey can tell you all, tell you all about. That's right. That's right. OK. Uh, just stay there, Johnny. We'll, uh, we'll just go back to the map, just to go to what Tony was saying. Could we have the tracker back up and we'll just follow that through? So if we follow this map then, Tony, we'll see it here. Yeah. We're going to go up. Johnny's saying go up here, stay past ahead. that mini roundabout, which yeah. is now on. Uh, just uh, bring the map up a bit, that's it. And uh, we're going to cap... There we are, over that roundabout, past safetyshop.co.uk, city yeah. plumbing, and... Um, Firebird, does it say? I can't, I can't see that. I'm too close to the oh, Firebird Studios. There yeah. we go. Yeah, so yeah, up yeah. to Firebird the top. That's, this, this is the junction at the top of that road that you're concerned about. Why? Yeah. yeah. Um, because 
Hey, there's a load of vehicles parked by the old fire station there on that corner, a yeah. load. Um, and they haven't moved for months and months, not taxed, not insured, nothing, just dumped there. <laughs> Allegedly. Uh, Allegedly. So, and this junction here, you can see the shape of that junction. Yeah. How it's a, a, an S bend. Yeah. And it's a very tight S bend. There's high hedges and there's high fences. And if I was Johnny, I would ask the driver to have a look at uh, this option here, uh, just to look right. at it even on the map, because I think that would um, that would make life a little easier. Okay. So, Johnny, um, let's Hi. see where you are now. So you're still just coming up to that roundabout by the looks of it, edging your way slowly. Um, so you're going to turn left, is that right? Well, I'm not sure. I think they're going to go straight because I think they've got zero, close to zero chance of turning right. But if they go straight down here, there are, like Tony rightly says, quite a lot of cars on yeah. this road. Yeah, uh, could be a hazard actually. That looks very tight indeed getting up there. This could well, this get... is the crescendo of our story, is it not? It this is where, where it gets real. This is the moment that we've been waiting for. <laughs> It's come all this way. It's flown from the Far East, from Japan, via the United States, to Filton, to Kemble, and now it's here on Emery Road in, in Brislington. Uh, so there we are. So, Johnny, just, just paint a picture behind you at the moment. What can we see? OK, I'll go full on ENG. So what we've got here is a big crowd of people. I presume they're not just going out for a walk. They're probably coming to see the aeroplane, I'm guessing. Uh, lots of police everywhere. They've backed up the cars along the road that goes around towards the co-op there. A few vehicles are getting their way through. Um, and I think they're getting ready to move the truck now. So the atmosphere here is quite friendly, very calm, quite subdued, chatty, curious, but definite. And I think slightly nervous as well because people don't really know what's going to happen next. I mean, you know, we might have to find a place to dump the aeroplane if we can't get it through. Who knows? <laughs> we had somebody uh, tweet us saying that we should have used Chinooks to get the thing. Well, you know what? We did actually look into that. I looked into that. Did you? I worked with um, Super Pumas on some of the event work we've done in the past, flying props around central London. But the load capacity on things like a Puma is only about a tonne and a Chinook's only about two tonne. That thing weighs somewhere between 15 and 25 tonne. We still don't even know what it weighs. And that's the next step in this story. When the cranes come tomorrow, can we even lift the thing? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and while you're talking about that, Johnny, let me just uh, uh, remind you uh, where you're watching at home on your phone. We'll keep Johnny just up there. We'll stay on your picture, Johnny. But I just want to say, uh, there's the shot of the roof looking down. Um, if you uh, want to follow this story right to the end, then you can. Because tomorrow, here at pitch, that plane is going to be loaded onto those containers, which is just over here to my left. And we've got people, uh, a couple of reporters out here who are ready to uh, welcome it come round. But you'll see in a minute... Um, when we go out there, where, the, where those containers are. And uh, I'm keeping an eye on Johnny's feed, but you'll be able to watch that tomorrow. What are you saying, Johnny? OK, we'll come back to Johnny in a second. Um, what you'll be able to do is watch uh, via the Twitter feed and the uh, Facebook page, Pitch Air. Uh, you'll be able to see the photos and video that will be uh, taken of the aircraft being loaded onto the uh, amazing uh, metal plinth that uh, stands just over here to my left out, outside. Um, let's bring Tony Carey back in, and, uh, who's uh, joined me here, a uh, former chief petty officer of the Royal Navy. Uh, you know you're certain things, don't you, about aircraft, and certainly this morning I think we've learned an awful lot. Uh, we've made huge progress. Absolutely. We're nearly here at the junction. You have concerns, though, at that junction. I, I, yes, I would. I would be... I think this is... As Johnny's just suggested, the crux of the matter, that we... The driver has now the option, I think, of a slightly longer route and, I believe, slightly easier route or a slightly shorter route, but with a, a nearly impossible bloody junction at the bottom. What I've seen of the driver so far, he's executed absolutely everything exactly as it should have been. So... If anyone could get a vehicle around the, that corner of Emery Road and Bonville Road, I am sure he could. But when I look at it, and I know that the hedges are high, there are trees in there, there are um, high fences as well, um, I, I'm sort of suspect that... Because the, the trailer, another point about it is that the trailer is only a few inches mm. off the ground. It yeah, possibly isn't. Yeah. It possibly isn't. 
even a curb height off the ground. And as you swing around, I don't know if he's got the room down there to play around with because mm. we saw on that, on that picture, yeah. the cars yeah. parked everywhere. People have come along and they've dumped their cars and they're having a gander. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's my fault because I did invite, I think, 250 people to come along and watch this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Um, it's your fault we may not get the thing here. Yes, so I'm, I'm terribly sorry, uh, Johnny. Um, if you want to, we'll, we'll send you up a flask of coffee and some <laughs> samosas in a minute and um, you can stay there the night. We'll work it out tomorrow. <laughs> I'm watching the feed here, Tony, of the roof camera, uh, which points down to the bottom of Bonville Road. And I'm hoping that... That's one of the warning vehicles. I'm just wondering, it? that is one of the vehicles that... Yes. Follows and leads the aircraft. Yes, it's come down, so it's now turned right. So I imagine what it's doing is it's doing a loop now, isn't it? Um, it could. It, it, so yes, oh, no, that's, that's, that's not, just that's a normal not, van. No, no, no. Uh, let's bring the tracker back up if we can, just to see where that is now. So he's right. So there we go on the other side of the roundabout. So we are taking Emery Road, All right. and um, we are unfortunately going up that route, um, Tony, where the, all the parked cars are. So this could be quite, a, quite an interesting uh, feat here as yes. we slowly now start to, I suppose, <laughs> he's got his uh, hands, <laughs> hands, he's got hands over his ears and his eyes here. Um, this is the final stretch now. Yes. Uh, and we're finally going to uh, see the plane home. Um, and the tension is actually building here. Um, in the studio and outside. I can see people through the window now who are gathering on the main road. Um, just for a bit of context, I wonder if the operator of that camera on the roof, we could just see that again, could just zoom out on that camera and just show me, a zoom right out, pull, pull right back while we're waiting for it to come up from the roundabout. That's, that that, that's it there. And just pan right, pan right across the road and keep going. I don't, can, you, can we do that? And I don't know whether you can pan right across the road. Let's see Bristol. Just give you a bit of context of where we are. To show you Bristol. Maybe we can't pan right. And uh, here we go. So, <laughs> a bit, uh, bit joggy. Uh, I think we're stuck. A bit like the plane. <laughs> but over on the right-hand side there is the Clefton Suspension Bridge. Um, and uh, we did see it earlier on. And it is a marvel to see... Uh, across the city of Bristol, right from up here. We are uh, at the top of Brislington Hill, um, just by the trading estate, and uh, that's our geography uh, for you, to give you a little bit of context of our location. So, looking at the map, we are back on the tracker. Johnny is now north of the roundabout, um, heading up through the parked cars. I imagine Johnny is on foot now, walking slowly. Johnny, I don't know whether you're still there connected to us. Can we just see if Johnny's still with us? And we might be able to have a, a chat with him to see if we've managed Back to get there. past those cars. I can hear you, Johnny. So, Johnny, uh, there you go. Are you past the cars? Tell us where you are. Well, we're still down on, which one is this? This is Emery Road. Now, the issue we're having is there's a whole load of cars up Bonville Road, and Steve suddenly got a bit stressed out that maybe he can't get the truck up there. So we're going to have to move some people's cars without their permission. <laughs> right. And how do we do that? Well, luckily, we have some equipment that we use for things like car launches in the events world. We have these devices called a GoJack, and you slide them under the wheel, lift them up without harming the vehicle at all, and then we can move the car around a little bit without doing any harm to the vehicle at all. And I'm going to apologise in advance to whoever's car it is that we might have to move. We promise to be very respectful. OK, so this is, uh, this is breaking news then. So uh, we are at our first blockade. We aren't able to get the plane down this final road, penultimate road here. Uh, there are well, a lot of I cars. I kind of knew this would be the case. I was always, I was always curious about how they're going to do the last bit, but they have assured us that it's going to happen, and I believe that it will. It's going to require a bit of MacGyver-style teamwork to sort it out. How many people are surrounding you at the moment, then? Give me a number. Well, I just walked down here a little bit just to, you know, keep social distance and all that. I reckon there's probably about 500 to 1,000 people here, maybe. Yeah. I'm afraid that's Tony's fault. He invited them all. 
Well, thanks, Tony. But you know what? This is probably the biggest event in the southwest today, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, and you're <laughs> right, uh, Johnny. We'll stay on your camera uh, while we just chat amongst ourselves here and keep an I'll eye on it. I'll just keep panning around, OK? Yeah, keep, keep showing us a few shots and we'll talk over what you're saying. Um, and we can see the, the, they're the police motorbikes uh, finger. There we go. Police motorbikes uh, passing. So I imagine they're trying to work out if they can get around. There's that, uh, that yeah. van that we yeah. saw just a moment ago coming out onto Bonville Road from the studio roof camera. So I imagine they are trying to line themselves up or work out what they're going to do. OK, it does seem like things are on the move. Uh, yeah, we're moving. OK, so there it is. Can you believe it? It's just, for me, a work of art coming through there, Tony. Look at that. And the people watching come from all across Bristol, minus the nose cone that's here waiting for her when she arrives. And look how low that trailer is. That's what we talked about, Tony, didn't we? It's so low. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure whether there is any facility on that back um, bogey to actually lift the, uh, the, the bodywork at all. Um, but the driver's going along at a fair old pace now. That's probably five miles an hour, which um, moving one of these, as you appreciate, is in this environment is quite fast. Mm. So um, he, I think the driver's feeling fairly confident going down there at the moment. Um, it, it's the best entertainment we've had since, uh, since the Queen opened... Blagden, uh, Blagden uh, Chew Valley Reservoir in 1953. <laughs> but certainly, I think I would guess that the, the people with the, the, the vans, the, the warning vehicles, the escort vehicles, have probably come down and looked at these junctions. They've made the decision. Once he gets down beyond this next bit, oh, there's, there's Mary and Jules, my uh, pals from the conservation group. Hello, Mary and Jules. <laughs> I, I haven't seen my wife yet. I don't know she, oh, there she is. <laughs> It's not in the way, I hope. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. Um, so, yeah, the driver's quite comfy there. Yes, it's narrow. It, it's... The there we are. The thing about this, though, of course, he's got cameras all over his... Oh, has rig. he? So yes, he'll see around. Isn't, he isn't necessarily worrying about his mirrors. He can tuck his mirrors in. Right. But the, the actual cab is eight feet... It's 2.5 2 metres wide. Yeah. So I think that's eight feet, two and a half, or something stupid like that. Yeah. Now, I would guess that the fuselage is significantly wider than eight feet, two and a half. Yeah, looks it to me, doesn't it? I would guess that's bordering on three, three and a half metres wide. But the road, once he comes down to here, I think the driver's going to be fine. Do you think so? This is coming up now towards Firebirds. Fingers studios. crossed. Fingers crossed. So we're actually nearly near two-thirds of the way up this road. We are. We're a long ways down now, um, just going past the, uh, the diner. Uh, Jamie and Lucy, who are here as well in the studio, what did you think of this? Do you think that you've ever seen anything like this? Um, well, we, we, we were having some quite tense conversations about how he probably should have taken the right turn, and, and Lucy's fingernails have almost yeah, vanished. Yeah, I have been, <laughs> I've been very worried because I agree with you, Tony. Um, this is the wrong route to go. <laughs> I think he should have gone right at that roundabout, gone up the hill, taken a left, um, and then at the end of that road, as you know, the corner to get up onto uh, Bonneville Road is so much better wider um, there's less foliage less trees and i think it would be a lot easier to man maneuver the plane um, the way that he's gone currently whilst at the moment it looks like it's quite clear it looks like there's not as many cars on this side of the road yeah. i am worried about that corner um, it could potentially mean reversing the whole thing back up to that roundabout we, we just, well yeah yeah um well, i'm also sort of guessing that he's been maybe lulled into a bit of a sense of security by the fact that this is a nice straight looking road. Mm -hmm. Let's see the feed again. Let's get an update of where we are. That's the road. Here we go. So that's the top of Emery Road. Um, let's just see if the tracker's updated. Could you just bring the tracker up, graphics? Just see what we can see in terms of the map, if that's changed, if Johnny is... Uh, of course, with a lo loads of people around, it probably hasn't um, updated 
Done it. All the way. It's oh, hard to see up there on those. Uh, it looks like we're about halfway up. Yeah, so that would be about right because this building right. here, yeah. this is that big yeah. derelict building on yeah. the, uh, which is on our side of Emery Road. Yes, is that that's right. So the junction now on the yeah. on the right as it's coming up, which will be just where Johnny is now. I think it should be a junction, and now we are. There's a stretch which will bring us up to the junction. And by the look, oh, we've just lost the phone. By the looks of it, there, Tony, it looks like the cars were fewer. Yes, look, you see, let's now go right down the bottom. There we are. So let's go back to Johnny now. Johnny, what's the outcome? What do you think? Can we get it round? Well, it looks okay, but we've got this people carrier just here. So we might have to get the go jacks on that one and slide it out back a little bit. <laughs> or it might be that he can go around the corner and do his rear wheel steering and kick the back end out, and it might be okay. Yeah. I'm genuinely fascinated because I don't know. Um, I think this is what's uh, making this hugely exciting. Uh, probably the most exciting story of the day here in the UK. I'll say that because <laughs> how many times do you see a passenger plane being dragged through a city like this, up a trading estate? Will it make its way around the corner? Will it get jammed? Will that people carrier need to be moved? Uh, it's all to play for. Everyone's biting their fingers. We're all on the edge of our seats. This is a phenomenal television. <laughs> I can see Johnny. Where are we now? So I've, I think we've have we got the owner of that people carrier? Looks like looks like it. Well, we don't, but I think they're going to try and get around. They might be going to turn out wide and turn in. Don't yeah, know. But I the see. The next challenge we're going to have is a very very sharp left hand turn up there, then a right hand turn, turn, then boom, where it kicks HQ. And then you're here. So we're watching now on the roof camera where people are starting to, there we go, on the road. And the road that we're actually watching on Johnny's camera, that junction, is not that junction you can see. It's the one at right, the bottom so of the this, hill. This is Bonville Road yeah. and that's Emery Road. That's so it. if I walked up there, you would see me. In just a moment, I'll walk up there and you'll see my high-vis jacket so you can spot me, okay? And you can wave, yeah. We, we are absolutely on the edge of our seats here, uh, waiting to see if it actually makes it round the corner. Um, do we have a drone? Do we have a drone? Do we have a drone? I'm looking at the team. Do we have the drone up? Do we have that available? Not quite sure. I'll see if we can find out. I have it a out. drone. Shall I bring the drone up and fly it over and get some aerial shots? Have you got the drone? <laughs> I've got the drone with me and then we can um, film it from my phone on, and Johnny. stream it up. That'd be quite cool. Well, go on then, Johnny. Yeah, I think this okay. is the, this is the moment we've all been me. waiting for. Um, Let me get to the studio. Can you send someone down here to do the live stuff on Zoom? And I'll use my phone and do the drone flying from the studio, OK? Yeah, OK. We'll send one of the guys down. We've got Ben and Lauren. I'll available. see you in a moment. That's, that's going to be me signing out until I'm back with you, OK? OK, Johnny. Good stuff. Thanks for that. See you in a second. Okay. See you in a second. Johnny, thank you. Now, you're back on the roof camera here, and we are now looking down towards the bottom of Bonville Road. And uh, you're watching Pitcher Live here, and it's 25 past two. We are awaiting the eagerly anticipated arrival of the Boeing 727 that was dragged down from Kemble in Gloucestershire. Oh, there's my wife. To Bristol. <laughs> oh, you see his wife. Uh, and it's finally here on the last stretch. That is the road that we need it to turn onto. Just over the brow of that hill, there is a kind of snaking bend. And it's at that bend we will see the plane. So, from what I understand, Johnny's going to go and get a drone, which will give us some shots from above, which I think... Absolutely incredible shots. I think that will be the shot of the day, as we see it being dragged up that road uh, ahead of its arrival here. Um, while we just take a, a few seconds to breathe, um, social media, has there been any reaction from those people at the end of the road? What have people been saying, posting, filming? Well, we've never had so many viewers. This obviously is the bit which everybody has decided to tune in for. Um, we've got a comment here on Facebook from Neil Lucas, who says, this is the best live entertainment since the event industry stopped last year. And I think that's what we're seeing out there today. People just just want to see something good in, on, on, in their front garden, and, and that's what's happening today. Every, everyone just needs something um, 
to, to make them excited and hopeful for the future. I think that's what we're seeing in the comments. Definitely, definitely. And definitely. um, we've had Andrew Varney tweet us on um, Twitter. He said, it's not every day your cycle ride is blocked by an airplane. And he's done a great selfie with the airplane. So thank you, Andrew. That's great content to see. Um, we've also had some other shots sent to us on uh, Twitter by um, at Budley underscore Beagle. Um, looks like they're following the plane as it, circ is, is, as it goes round, uh, just like Johnny is. So there's some shots there of the plane making its way into the industrial estate and down the road that it's on now. Um, so thank you so much for those um, live um, pictures. You can see um, that's Andrew's bike. Yeah, um, we're very sorry your bike ride was stopped, but we hope you're enjoying uh, what's happening right now, Andrew. And then we've got some very exciting information to bring you in terms yes. of today's fundraiser. We have indeed um, got over our target of £1,000. You can see there um, that we are now sitting on £1,004 for our chosen charity today, the Great Western well Air Ambulance Charity. Well done. Um, but we beat it, we've reached one goal. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's by no means a, a, a maximum. If you are wanting to donate, then please do text FLY to 70085. It'll cost you three pounds, uh, plus your standard network weight, uh, rate, uh, terms and conditions online. Um, but I mean, the, the comments are, flooding in right now. Um, Emily Kublai, who says, been watching since 9am. Steve is a legend. Um, Janice Osborne says, airplane or plane, not airplane. I think she's correcting people's spelling in the comments oh. section. Thanks, Janice. Thank you. Uh, putting the work in for us. Um, and um, Charlie Thomas, I think, summing the last few minutes up completely with two words. Stunning driving, but it's getting busier on social media, Chris, so I'm um, sure more to bring you later on. Excellent. Thanks very much indeed. And uh, I think uh, what we must do now is just keep an eye on that all-important junction, which is at the bottom there of Bonville Road. And it's the junction of Emery Road. Tony is with me still. And if we have a look at the roof camera now, we'll see that people are gathering in the middle of the road. And I think, there we go. They're probably just weighing up whether or not they can get around the corner. I'm just waiting for Ben to get down there to take over from Johnny, uh, who will be able to show us uh, and pick up from where he left off the aircraft as it's desperately now trying to get around that junction. Uh, no sign of it yet, Tony. What are your fears when we get to that junction where the S bend ah. is? Well, Let's get the tracker back up on the wall here in graphics and uh, just explain to me, Tony, what is our problem here? Right, so here we have, um, well, there's Johnny's uh, tracker coming down to the junction here. I feel like um, it's, it's selection who, who night. You, yeah, it's election night. It, it's, who, who are you, Laura Coons? Well, I forget, <laughs> someone's mentioned where it's snaking and that's exactly yes. what that junction does. Yes. It snakes, it's, it's a sharp right hand and then it bends to the left. But on this edge here, on this edge of the road here, is uh, a high fence, and we saw that, uh, a high wire mesh fence, and it's part of the security system for the car parks that some yes. of the factories have got on the other side there. You just about see the little access roads in there. Yes. So there is that. Now, if the nose is overhanging the, the, the front of the trailer in any way, I would imagine that that would be the problem. The nose could impact on that. Yeah. But when it comes around here, this next part, there's a high fence on the inside as well. So you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't get to drag the, the wheels over that curb. Um, and there are some then trees here. And there's a factory just here, or not a factory, a warehouse, which actually does a very similar type of job to this place. Um, and I know that there, there's a big oak tree there which um, you can't that move out trees. That could be very no, tricky. No. So, uh, that could be very once tricky. Once it's clear of that, then as you come up to the corner of Clothier Road and Clothier Road, and yep. there's a, the old fire station there, and now it's a, a garage uh, where they, they, a bit naughty, they've got a load of their scrap vehicles on the main road, ah, on the Bonville Road. We've now moved. So we've just updated. Oh, he's gone right. Right, I think... Ben, 
Turn your camera on its side, so the other way round, so we can see it. That's it. Right, let's have a look. Where are we? We're at the end of the road now, at the junction here, as you described, Tony. This is the bit that we now are all waiting to see if she can get round. This is where the people carrier was just a moment ago. Uh, we'll see if it's been moved when, when Ben gets down there. Looks like... I think the people carrier might have moved. It's difficult to see. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, great. Finally, there it is, the 77. I think it's, it's still... Wingless moving. picture. When Ben gets down to the front of the lorry, let's just see what obstacles might be holding it up. Look, there's that people carrier again. So... We are blocked by a vehicle. This people carrier is stopping us get to the edge of the road, so we can't turn right. Uh, I imagine, as you said, Tony, this um, lorry is going to have to take a big swoop. It's going to have to go left, yeah. turn into the corner, and as it's got halfway through the executed that turn, it's going to have to turn its back wheels, isn't it? Yeah. So that it could turn... Somehow or other, uh, at as the same it's bringing time. it round, it's going to have to sort of... Swing the back end around yes. somehow so that it's then straight. And I think we, we might be, get away with it, but there isn't a lot, there's not a lot of room to play with there. Absolutely not. Now, what's that we're seeing there? Lorry turning right. Where's that going? So that is Clothier Road. So I think we are clearing the road ahead of... The people appear the to be walking. Are they walking lorry. this way? Are they walking back? It's no, difficult no. to see. The, the, I think those, where we're seeing now, that's the roof camera. So they're walking down to the corner where we're waiting. Uh, now that's Ben's camera and he's looking back up. Oh, no, there's the people carrier still there. Yeah. So we're, we're sort of stuck at the minute uh, until we find out whether or not oh, we yeah. can move that people carrier. Let's see if Ben can hear us. Ben, you're there. What's being said on the ground, Ben? Can you, uh, can you see and hear us okay? Yeah, hello. Ben, what's uh, the situation? The moment. Can you hear me? Yeah, what's the situation? Uh, the situation is, uh, it seems like the corner's quite a tight one. Uh, there's a lot of people here. Um, as you can see, I walk up to the road. Uh, it's quite a bit of a zigzag. Um, so it seems the lorry might not be able to fit up there quite yet before they work out how to get up there. Is this people carrier? What's stopping them? What kind of people carrier? So that black car there, Yeah. that, uh, is it a transit van? I think it might be a, uh, like yes, a delivery yeah. van. Just, just to sort go. of wander over and yeah. just find out, is that what's stopping us? Do you know? Can you Do I'll go out? and ask. Give me a second. Yeah, let's find out if we can find out what it is that's stopping us so far in our right. tracks. I'm from Pitch Media. Uh, what's the sort of stopping it around the corner? Um, it's the van. Yeah. It's the van. I can confirm it's the van. Right. Well, this isn't good news at all, is it? We seem to be stopped. Ben, they just might keep... be trying to uh, yeah. find the owner of the van, I suppose. Right. I keep keep the camera on on the van, and we'll stay with you. Uh, and see if we can find out whether or not they can find the owner for it. I think, Tony, it's uh, pretty dire if, uh, if we can't find the owner of that van. Well, I, I, I don't know how far, how easy the, these trolley devices are on the cars. I've never used them. I've never seen them used. I mean, I think the, the only option you would have is to try and send the van around the corner and leave it there. Um, yeah. Uh, so we'll have to try and pick it up yeah, and move it, which is yeah. what Johnny talked about using one of these devices. I think it lifts the front wheels up and then you can spin it and move it. Um, it looks like from the standing around that we're seeing here on this feed from the edge of the road that we aren't going to see any movement. Certainly for the next maybe few minutes, this could be where <laughs> it all goes wrong. We've travelled what? 40, 50 odd miles. Yes, yes. A fair, and it's the yes. last 300 yards that we're stuck on. I'm just looking at the roof camera now. There's a lorry coming up there. That's, that's somewhere else. That's, uh, that looks like we're getting ready now to clear the other road. So there are vans moving around ahead of this. 
on the roof cam that probably are hoping that we can clear the road. Um, it's very tricky to know quite where we're going to go next. I, um, I'm, no, I'm... It, it, it won't be stuck. That I think that's the decision is what to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are the options, do you think, here? What can we well, do? I, what, I'm looking at the front of this van and the distance down to the road, and I'm wondering if, as you might have suggested earlier on, if you bought the whole trailer, truck trailer, around this van, and once you bring it around this van, you then use a steering system to sort of maneuver around. So as then the front of the truck goes into Bonville Road, by then, hopefully, the rear of the convoy, the rear of the trailer, is clear of that van. Uh, I think by the way they've got it now, I mean, you, you, you can't move it that way because someone's put a great big lorry there. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, and he can't go backwards, I assume. We can't reverse back, can we? The, the, our truck, I, I, we, it will go back, but... Um, That's a hell of a mission. Oh, you know, that would be blind. Yeah. Um, as I say, there probably is a, tra a, a camera at the rear end of the bogey, but the aircraft actually pokes out another, um, I'm sort of guessing, 10, 15 feet, 10, right. 12 feet. Yes. Yes, that's right, it will do. Off the back of that uh, oh, trolley. I'm, I'm, actually, I'm beginning to recognise half the village here at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've certainly drawn a crowd, haven't we? These are just some, maybe up to 30 to 40 that, people. Yeah, that looks like Andrew Varney there. Yeah, who are all gathering and waiting for the big moment to see if we can get this plane, this 727, around the corner to bring it up here to pitch. Um, so, uh, let's just see while we wait, because it might well be a few moments by the looks of that video. Let's just uh, return to the Great Western Air Ambulance, because we've been raising money throughout this broadcast to try and help the Air Ambulance stay in the air, and all the donations that you're making are absolutely vital. Thanks very much indeed. Let's catch up now with the guys from Pitch who went to see the air ambulance earlier in the week. My name is Vicky Brown. Um, I work for Great Western Air Ambulance Charity as an advanced practitioner in critical care. Um, currently one of the only ones, or the only one, in the whole of the Southwest region. Um, so I've been doing the job. Well, I've been a paramedic for 20 years, but I've been flying for 15 years um, and with these guys for nearly 10 years now. So. Yeah, so I joined the ambulance service and right from the word go, I wanted to be on the helicopters. Um, I just thought it'd just be a great thing to do more so I could help the patients that we serve, especially in this area. So, uh, yeah, worked hard, got on, uh, got on an aircraft and then joined uh, Great Western 10 years ago. So I'd already done a little bit, had a little bit of experience before coming here. Uh, but it was a lot more sort of critical care, high-end um, skills that I needed. So when you join, you do an, an awful lot of training, uh, do lots of courses. Um, we do lots and lots of sort of sim assessment work. So by the time you've kind of gone through all that, it takes probably up to about two years, um, and then you're sort of signed off, and you can go out and go to all the you know really sort of critically ill and injured patients. So lots of work, lots of studying, um, but it was also enjoyable. Um, so we've got two clinical leads at the base. Um, I'm the paramedic clinical lead and we have a doctor clinical lead. So my job entails a um, majority of it working clinically, um, but also I look after all the governance for the unit and I'm also in charge of all the education and training. So with all the new staff coming through, I design their training pathways um, and then organise all the training and assessments that they need to then become qualified to, to come and do this job. So we're not government funded, it's completely donations from the public. Um, so we, in, with work with our charity representatives, do a lot of work, fundraising, uh, going out there, doing, well, when we haven't got COVID, doing talks. So we need, um, I think it's nearly six million to run the aircraft per year. Uh, and that covers all the costs. So it's a lot of work to do, um, but it's all just the generosity from the general public that keep us in the air and able to go to the patients when they need us. 
I think a 727 becoming an office is awesome. Um, and actually, it'd be interesting to see if we could do that here, because that would be great. Yeah. Really good. Perfect. My name's Dan Davis. I'm one of the trainee uh, specialist paramedics in critical care down here with Great Western. I'm new to the unit, um, so I joined here in August last year, um, and I came from another ambulance service, so actually I've come from London. I've been a paramedic or I've been working for 16 years in London uh, and actually flew with HEM services in London and with Essex and Hearts and I was one of the advanced critical care paramedics in London as well so I've kind of moved down here for a change of job and a new challenge and a change of lifestyle as well um, but I'm kind of going through the same trainee process that all the other guys are going through down here as well learning the ropes learning about um, how SWAS work as an ambulance service but how the, um, the air ambulance works and getting experience kind of working down here. So I, one of my roles is a, as a helicopter technical crew member. So I fly in the front of the aircraft. Um, and before we actually get to the patient, is my role is to actually help the pilot with navigation, uh, with comms in the air, uh, plotting the route, um, and actually just the, the safety around kind of us flying as well. So that's a, that's a new skill for me as well. So the, the pilot does the kind of all the flying and kind of, but I need to understand what all the various dials are in the front, um, can help out with navigation. Um, if you can Imagine them like if we're, we're mid-flight and we get cancelled on a job but then get redeployed to another job, I've got to then plot everything while we're in the air, replot a route, send it across to the pilot and then kind of work out where we go from there as well. Great Western are providing a critical care team from 7 o'clock in the morning until 1 o'clock in the, in, in the following morning, either in, in the air or on cars. The aim is we're bringing the hospital to the patients. So we're going to the, the, the sickest patients that really need their intervention in the first hour of their medical incident or their, their traumatic accident or their traumatic injury. Um, so what we're bringing is the ability of the, the, the treatment that, that these patients will receive in a hospital and we're bringing it to their bedside or to the roadside. Um, so whether it's surgical intervention or medical intervention, um, we can do things above and beyond what the, the road paramedics are able to do. It's a fantastic charity. You know, as I said, we are utterly reliant on kind of, you know, the donations that we receive from all around our, of our region. You know, we can't do it without you. We're here to kind of serve everyone we can do in the region that we go to, but you know, we, we certainly can't, um, we can't operate without the sort of donations we have. And one last question. Yeah. 77 as an office, what do you think? I think it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, we, we were looking at, literally just looking at it this morning and uh, just thinking, I mean, to be honest with you, we, we were just talking about somewhere to live. I'd, I'd live in somewhere like that, to be honest with you. So to have it as an office would be, would be awesome. So I'm looking forward to coming and seeing it if possible. Brilliant. Thank you very much. All right. It's a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, you too. <laughs> <laughs> and there they are, the Great Western Air Ambulance, a fantastic team. And uh, <laughs> you've been raising money for them all through this broadcast. Thank you very much indeed. You can continue to do so by texting the word FLY to 7085. Thanks very much indeed. Now, this is what's going to happen now. We're leaving the studio here, the Arrivals Lounge. It's been fantastic. Uh, and I'm going to take you outside the back of Pitch, where I'm going to show you where the plane is going to arrive. And I'm going to go through the door and arrive here. So. Welcome to the outside of Pitch. And this is the shipping container setup that we have. And it's on those that that huge, great big 40 meter 727 is going to be lifted onto tomorrow afternoon. So that's when you'll see all the pictures and the video go back up onto Pitch Air on Twitter and on Facebook. And that will be an event not to miss. Now, there's not much out here at the moment, as you can see, apart from the very famous nose cone over there that's got the Japan Airlines stripe down the side. That will eventually go back on to the plane when it arrives. But if I show you up to the end of the road here, that is the gates there, those gates. And it's through those gates that that plane will eventually arrive. Now, it's looking, from what I'm being told, that it could be in the next few minutes we might get around that parked car which is just at the bottom of Emery Road but we're still waiting to find out whether or not we can get past it. It's touch and go but we're crossing our fingers. Now I do know that 
there is a drone that's being flown somewhere above us here. Ah, oh, I can hear it, it's up there. A drone is now in the sky and it's gonna fly over where the plane is and we'll take a look at that in just a couple of minutes. I can hear it's now just taken off. But while we wait for it to arrive, let's go back to Jamie and Lucy to see what the social media has been saying. Hello, yes, uh, so uh, lots of people still watching, um, more viewers than okay. we've ever had at this point. People getting really excited to see what's going to happen next and, and how they're going to get uh, past that corner and indeed that black people carrier, um, which uh, that's the problem that we're trying to solve now. So we've got a few suggestions coming in in the comments section here on Facebook. Uh, Prue asking, first of all, how long will they wait before trying to move the black van? James Harris saying they could get a forklift from a nearby company to move the van. Or um, Christine says they could pick it up, move it around the corner and leave it there for the owner to find later. Um, I'm, lo I'm loving the, the <laughs> open-minded problem solving which is going on right now because um, Honestly, it probably, they probably are, are all things uh, which Steve, our driver, and of course Johnny, are considering to help get the plane uh, across that corner. But Lucy, this, you, know, you, you work around this area, um, yeah. you drive these roads um, potentially regularly. Um, what we're seeing out there with the, with the cars and all that sort of stuff, is that quite regular? Yeah, I would say that is incredibly regular, especially for a trading estate. Um, and especially those built up roads that the plane is attempting to go down. Um, it's narrow anyway when there aren't any cars on it, I would say. Well, narrow for a plane. I, I drive a Vauxhall Corsa. So <laughs> not a Boeing 727. It's really smaller, yeah, not a 727. Um, but yes, no, I would be a little bit worried if I was Steve the driver right now. But as a few people have said on Twitter, Steve is a legend. Mm. So, and we agree, we agree. So fingers crossed Steve will be able to think of a plan um, and get, get our plane here. Um, Shelley Newman on Facebook says, this is amazing to watch, so tense. Um, we really are live. We really are trying to get a Boeing 727 into our yard. Um, someone else has asked, can you imagine what the owner would say? Um, excuse me, can you move your van? You're blocking a plane coming through. I mean, <laughs> that is quite literally what we will be asking the van owner um, because this is so silly. Um, and then someone else has said, um, will the plane be visible from the road once it's been parked? Well, that's a really good question, actually, because it is going on quite a considerable height, but I don't know if it will be visible from the road. I think it will be from the corner, most definitely. You'll be able to see the nose, you'll be able to see the long span of it, but I don't know if you'll be able to see it over the warehouses. We'll have to well, see. Well, we can see it's on the road there. Maybe that's something that Chris could be able to um, tell us. Will it be visible from the road when it's on its uh, shipping containers? Yes, it will actually. From the corner, as Lucy says, at the very top of the road here, um, Bonville Road, where you turn right, where I was just outside, that corner, which is public property, you'll be able to look down into the, uh, I suppose, this area we're in now, the yard, and that's where the plane will be. So yes, the answer is yes, you will be able to see it from the road. And, and as you just heard, it's going to be raised quite a lot above on those shipping containers, so it should be quite a spect spectacle. Um, let's go back to our feed of Bonville Road now, where on the junction of Emery Road, that's, that's Bonville Road to the bottom. Let's go to Ben's camera. Uh, I can just hear that we're now connected to Ben. Uh, and uh, Ben, can you just paint a picture of how things are at the moment, where you are? I can see that we still have that yeah. car in the way. Uh, yeah, things are pretty much still the same. Um, yeah, nothing's uh, moving at the moment. Uh, you know, I don't think uh, anyone anyone's come to move the van. Right. Um, right. Only having a few, <laughs> a bunch more people have arrived. Uh, it's, I'd say at least a hundred people here now. Wow, a hundred people just, right on that junction. A, yeah. We're drawing a crowd. Yeah. There was a big crowd. It looks like our guys in the car ahead of us in the white van have uh, <laughs> stopped for a break. We're not going anywhere, are we? It's definitely, it's definitely the black van that's now blocking our route. Um, we'll stay on this, Ben. Thanks very much. Just stay there and uh, offer us that shot and we'll keep coming back to you. Uh, I think um, 
I'm just going to look to the team. We were hoping to get the drone shots coming in, which will be pretty spectacular. I am just being told now that we are only uh, a minute or so away from being able to see drone footage from above pitch of the aircraft itself, the 727. Um, the drone is uh, up and we'll bring it to you very, very shortly. We will eventually, when Johnny makes it back, get him on stage. That's in a few minutes as well. A few minutes' time, we will be talking to Johnny as well. Um, just looking around, really, and just seeing what else we can uh, essentially try and do in our time. Because we, we can look outside at the shipping containers, and yet again, um, as you can see, uh, that's the road. If we look at uh, that feed there of outside, which is the shipping containers. And uh, I think they've just, uh, we're just trying to get the drone footage up now. And it's just on its way. I think we've lost our vision mixer by the looks of it. So, uh, okay, um, I think things are starting to happen. So uh, I can now see that, uh, that Johnny has made it into the studio and here he is with his Sabard on. Captain Thank Sachs. you very much. Come on in, Johnny. Oh, what a day. Take a seat. Thanks, Chris. Thanks awesome. very much, Tony. Insurance. Yeah, Insurance. absolutely. Yeah, talking to the mic. Yeah. Here you go. Now, you're back. You're back. But let's not rest on our laurels. We, we aren't here yet. <laughs> you're here, but the plane is still there. Indeed. What are we going to do about this? Well, so if you look, that vehicle on the right-hand side there yes. has been parked there. It's completely legal. He's not done anything wrong. Yep. It's not double yellows. And we have to move that vehicle. So the police are calling in one of their tow trucks. Yep. I need to move it a few metres. Again, you know, I want to make sure yep. that no one feels that Safe that person's done anything and wrong. Legal. It's yep. totally fine. Yep. Um, and then the truck is going to go out wide and turn around and hopefully be able to go through that really sharp bend and get outside this building in a few moments. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and where are the police coming from? They're coming from Bonville Road from the bottom, or is that them trying to get past up there? Mate, they're like mosquitoes. They're everywhere, they're all everywhere. over the place, buzzing around. Yeah. Everywhere you look, there's police. And how many police have been on your journey through? Well, there were four or five motorbikes plus a couple of cars. Yeah. It felt like they were coming and going. There's a few characters who stayed with us the whole way. Um, but yeah, lots, lots of them. Yeah. They were like darting. I'm not sure what they were doing. There was clearly like some kind of process, but they were like two darting on ahead, then yeah. staying back. I'm not sure what it was, but yeah. they seem to do a good job of it. They have done a good yeah. job. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, the switchover between Gloucestershire and Bristol, mm -hmm. Haven, Somerset Police. That was a sort of bit of hairy moment, mm -hmm. wasn't it? It was a bit, because actually it turns out we were going down the M32 and along the Spine Road, which is where Showcase Cinema is, which was news oh, to me. Oh, yes, of That course. was actually the plan. Yeah. And then they changed it to the Ring Road, which is a route that we did take. Right, OK, yeah. OK. Yeah. So actually, I think you could have done either. You're right, because you could have... You could have gone down there and then gone all the way around past the end of Old Market and then brought you down towards uh, uh, the A4 that way, couldn't yes, you? Yes, correct. Would yes. that bring you up Brislington Hill? It would bring up Bris Hill. Yeah. Sound a, bit, now, a, a bit, you know, I was, That ambitious. doesn't sound like it could be right, but there you go. It, I'm not sounds, sure if there is a right way of doing this. I don't think so. Well, as we've just found, we've made <laughs> it all this way. Um, so how long... How far is it back to Kemble from here? Uh, if you drive it this morning, the wife and I and the kids drove and it was about 40 minutes by car. Right. Not very far. So about 40, 50 miles? Less than that. Less I think it's like that. 28. It's just beyond Western Bird, isn't it? I yeah. think we know how far Western Bird is, don't we, Lucy? We do indeed. Yeah? Yes, we do indeed. Half an hour-ish? I mean, it's about 45 minutes from here. Okay, so 10 yeah. minutes from there. So call it 55 minutes. Right, okay. Yeah. So, uh, you did all of that journey and now this is the last bit. You we know something I can share? I can share Go something. On. What's right. the secret? So, Width of roads. Do you know what determines width of roads? This is interesting. Yep. Don't know how factual it is. So, it goes back to uh, cars mm -hmm. being the same width as horse carriages. Right. Horse carriages, the same width as two horses as backsides, side by side. Yeah. Right. Which happens to be about four foot total, I think. Right. And the size of a horse's bum basically is determined the size of roads. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> and that's why when you make an aircraft this big, you can't yeah. move it. And also why sheet material is eight foot wide, because it's a multiple of four foot. Right, OK. Oh, that, I that see. That sounds plausible, doesn't it? It does. It does sound plausible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, you're full of facts like that. I'm glad you're back. But just I'm gonna don't fact check I'm going to stop yeah. you there, because I'm just hearing we have now got the drone footage from above this road, Bonville Road here in... Brislington. Uh, here it comes. Let's see if we can go to it now. 
Oh, wow. There That's we good go. Good drone flying, that is. That's so, exquisite. Talk us through this, Johnny. What can we see? So we're going down Bonville Road here um, in a DJI Mavic Pro, the old one. Um, and we're going to be heading down past, I think that's Clothier Road. Yeah, Clothier Road. And the Road, next yeah. one will be Dixon Road, I think. And then we hit Emery Road. So you can see there's quite a bit of stuff going on here with a few people walking around. Maybe someone to see the aeroplane, maybe someone is going for a walk, who knows. Yeah. They look like a problem. And again, to be clear, they're parked completely legally, what they're doing. Well, these, these, lot, these vans. Yeah, but yeah. we're just hoping that, you know, the aeroplane can get past them. I yeah. think it probably can, I think. And there it is. There it is. There she is. Now, can we talk about the gender of aircraft for a moment? All right, then. It is not a she. What we are you saying? It we is, had then? a big debate about this. I just said, look, everyone, doing this thing with an aeroplane, I want to know, is it a boy or a girl or is it gender neutral? Yeah. Kicked off, yeah? Yeah. Now, well, who won? Uh, well, I think actually the conclusion was, and I, I, would, I think there's other people more qualified to talk than me, that actually most women don't mind that they referred to as she, yeah. but people, including myself, really object to the fact that people associate aircraft with being female for reasons which are not respectful to women, yeah? <laughs> okay. So okay, I decided that pitch air is an it, yeah? It's an it? Yeah. Okay, so the 727 it, there it is. There it is, yeah. And stunning. Look at that majestic yeah. thing. It's just Look, mental. I think we just. I've been have living to... this thing for the last year, as everyone who knows me probably knows by now, and the yeah. wife's sick of hearing about it. But it is—it's just ma majestic, isn't it? We're just taking it in, the size of it. It's mental. Some might say it looks no. like a piece of scrap. I don't think so. <laughs> now, it's a question for you, Johnny. Seeing as you're here, go on. Um, what's going to happen to the tail? Uh, I don't know where the tail is. Right. I don't know where the tail is. So it wasn't there at Kemble? Um, no. So what happened was it landed at Filton yeah. um, to get some D checks or whatever done. Yeah. Something happened with the previous owner. I believe yeah. there was some conflicts and missing paperwork. I'm yeah. not going to guess, but right. some things right. happened. Right. Right. And right. for more administrative reasons, it couldn't fly again, right? Yeah. So that to scrap it. Now, in the scrap an aircraft, most of the value is in the jet engines, as I think Mark said earlier on. Yeah. Uh, and the. Um, they were taken off at Kemble. They took the tail off and the wings off and transported it by road to, uh, to Kemble from Filton. Right, OK. Yeah. And that was in 2012. 2012, I think, yeah. 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 So bits of it have gone missing. They have, indeed. I could get another tail section because could there are you? plenty of old 727s kicking around. Do you think you will? I think reattaching it could be hard. Ah, in fact, me and Mark just yeah. yesterday were talking about should I get the wings down here, the stub wings that's yep. left. Yep. And he said, you know what? The cost and the time and the engineering and the weight don't. Just build new ones. Which yep. camera is live? I'm going to do this a piece of camera. Here. This one also here. Also cute. So yeah. if there's any fiberglass artists out there, please get in contact. We've got a commission for you to build some things that look like wings, about eight to ten foot sticking out. There you go. We need some wings built. We do. We yeah. need some wings. Great stuff. Uh, what I'm going to do while we're waiting, Johnny, uh, we've seen the fantastic drone footage, and I'm just keeping an eye on, the, on Ben's camera there, is you've been living this thing of we've been talking for the last year. I want to just take us inside the plane mm. and I want to look at the 70s designs that essentially uh, are rocking this aircraft. Let's take a look at uh, what it was inside because you've been really uh, nursing this thing and doing it up over the last year. I've done nothing to it yet. Yeah, no, but as in you've been, you've presumably Mentally. put the hoover around or something, have you? No, nothing at all. So it's literally as it's been. You haven't even cleared it or the cobwebs nothing are Nothing at all. There. In fact, I've added more stuff because there's a whole load of car batteries in there right now attempting <laughs> to power up the live stream that didn't work as well as we thought it would. Right, yeah. yes, of course, yeah. We, we saw that at the start. Yeah, yeah. We saw a shot of it at the start. Here's the pictures. Cool. Here Here's the pictures. So talk us through what we can see here. So, what I'm, so first thing to remember is back in the 70s, when they fitted this out, this would have been someone who probably spent millions of pounds on this jet, right? So I'm guessing they didn't cut corners back then. So the woodwork quality is actually amazing. Like it's proper, like French polish, beautiful walnut and oak, I think it is. Maybe it's Sapelia, I'm not it. sure. Um, the chairs, I think, are custom made. They like swivel and turn. However, it would appear that over the last few decades, maybe the integrity of the interior design has been undermined somewhat. You might notice in the bedroom how there's a mixture of um, different colours and different fabrics from different palettes. And it looks a bit like a charity shop at the yeah. moment. So that needs sorting out. Yeah. The cockpit, however, awesome. Yeah. The buttons, Fantastic. mental. Here's the, here's the air stairs. The air stairs, I need a little clean up. Now we found on the internet, someone did a documentary of some guy that used to own this thing. And we saw some shots from like the 80s of what it looked like yeah. inside. Yeah. And that's our visual reference now to right. um, restore it back to that. Absolutely. I saw yeah. those pictures. That's what I was wondering if it was still like it. It is. Um, and there's the bedroom on the left. Yes. Does it have an ensuite? Uh, it does. Oh, yeah. A bathroom and a toilet. Bathroom. I know. So I a, sh a shower? Uh, a shower, yes. It has it's a shower. shower. Wow. With gold taps. 
Gold taps. I know, but really Super nasty ones. Donald Trump. It? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Really fancy gold taps, I'm told, as well, I, I by bet. another person on the internet. Okay. Yeah. I bet. I bet. We uh, don't know what's in there. That's a mystery. There could be anything in that cupboard. We've so tried to open it. It's locked, is it? It's locked. What's in there? Maybe have Has some anyone got food. tools? Maybe when it lands in you know, a few minutes, we can yeah. maybe explore the inside of the aircraft okay, well, I'll until leave we that. have no viewers we, left. We have to do that. No, we have to do that. We've got to see in that cupboard. Yeah, yeah. Because you've now set it up. I have. And we need to see what's Chekhov's, in there. Chekhov's gun? Maybe. On the wall in the first act. Got to use it by the last character. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Theatre uh, Right, good. Now, uh, here we go. So we're back to the studio. So um, let's get an update on... On, before we have a quick update on social media, I know lots of people have been talking. Uh, let's just see the end of the road, if we can. So let's look at the camera on the roof, the robotic camera again. There it is. So we still haven't moved anywhere. Uh, have we still got Ben's feed coming up from the uh, junction of Emery Road? Uh, it, uh, no, it looks like we've lost that for the moment. Um, it might be because it's moving. There it is. OK. So, any update there, Ben? Let's have a look. What can we see? Yeah, the uh, the tow truck has arrived. Excellent. Uh, they've moved to, they moved the uh, the um, escort van, yes. and they seem to be moving into a position in a couple of minutes. I hope so. Excellent. Yeah, I can see it there. Great. So, uh, let me get my bearings. So, Johnny, explain to us where we are. Okay. So we are. Oh, geez. Right. Okay. So that's looking down the road. If we turned right here and went up there, we'd be up here. Yeah, OK. Yeah. So that's the junction that we're waiting at now. Yes. OK, so... Uh, Hang on, that van's still there. That van's still there. Where's the tow truck, Ben? Go that way. Ah, there it is. OK, so they're trying to get the tow truck round the corner. So I think we've got another uh, 15 minutes or so, I think. I think we do. How are we going to fill it? I mean, can I, just, can I just give you a round of Go applause? Oh, Johnny. Yeah. This is impressive. You've seen me on the videos I've done today, trying to fill 30 seconds, and I'm yeah. babbling and just gibbering and repeating well, myself. I, I, I think you, you've, you've done phenomenally well to get it down. Well, I think so well what done, you've well done, done is well done. mind-blowingly awesome. Well, it's been enjoyable, hasn't it? And we're sitting here raising money while we're doing it for the Great Western Air Ambulance as well. We've done all right, um, haven't we? Is just, anyone... I'm going to stop you because <laughs> I'm being told in my ear that we have got a game for you to play. Oh, oh no. Right. And this game, mm -hmm. while we're waiting, is called Guess the Aircraft. I, oh, this sounds good. Good. Yeah, no. Tony would kick my butt at this one. He will. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Tony's out there actually. He's just um. Seven forty-seven, four hundred series. Right. Here they go. In a here South they American are. airport. Right. So what's that? Uh, it's a seven forty-seven, four hundred series. Yep. Not to be confused with the eight hundred series, which is more recent, or the one hundred series, or the SR, which is a short version, which is very rare. Okay. So you know. One. For no, a I bonus do. point, what's the carrier? Uh, the ca oh, I don't know. <laughs> I read, mate. Yeah. <laughs> right. Excellent. Okay. So that's a tick. Yeah. Next one. Uh, that is the Ooh. Guppy, the Super Guppy Airbus for moving the wings of the A340s, I think. The, three, the 380s. The 380s, the wings of the 380s. The 380s, the big ones. Okay, aircraft right usage wrong, okay. Right, right. Uh, it's yeah. the Beluga, isn't it? Is it the Beluga? Oh, it's yeah. the Guppy, the Boeing one. Because uh, Boeing have one as well. Hold your mic up to your mouth just so we can Sorry, hear you. There's, a, there's the Guppy and there's the Beluga. Maybe I've got the Guppy and the Beluga mixed up. That's yeah, interesting. So I, looking at that, I think that's the Airbus, looking at those engines. They look like Rolls Royce. Oh, no, they don't look like Rolls Royce. Oh, sorry. He has got Airbus on the side. <laughs> oh, hang on. Johnny's lost his mic. Hang on. This will be explained. Maybe the battery's gone. You got me? Oh, we got you back. Yeah, we got you back. Okay, so it is the Airbus. Here we go. So that's the Airbus. You got it right. Is it the Beluga? Is it the Guppy? Super Guppy. Any ideas, guys? Beluga. Beluga. No idea. Okay. Okay, right. So, do we know what the answer is for that? That looks like an A3. It's the Airbus Beluga. Yes. That's the A350, I think. Hang Here's on, the mate. Airbus. Yeah, A350. Am I right? The A350. We're just swapping microphones. The A. A350. Ah. Uh, okay. So that is an. Uh, uh, that's wrong. What is it? It's Second seven, guess. Is it seven, uh, seven, seven, eight, seven. No. No. Nope. It's a 777. Oh, seven. uh, really? Yeah. Oh, hang on. We're just we're just changing mics over. We are live on pitch air. The time has just gone three o'clock and we're still waiting for the plane, but we're playing this little game. Johnny's gonna see if he can name these planes. So this one's a wrong, uh -uh. United. 777, it's got the three wheels. Oh, that's okay, okay, next one. Ooh. Yeah, 
Okay, now Ooh. that is either a Tri-Star, a Trident, an, um, a 10, an a 10 11 or a DC-10. Right, which one is it? Good call. So center, center engine on the tail, but underslung yeah. front engine. I'm going to go for a modern. It's modern. I'm going to go for a 10 11, B A B A C or B. Right. A E. -10. You're going right. I go for DC ten. Do you go for DC ten? Okay. What, what's the answer? What? MD eleven. MD eleven. There you go. There you go. Shameful. Shameful on me. McDonnell Douglas with the uh, with the, the very clear engine in the tail. But without the S duct. Yeah. Worth noting. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what the seventy seven. Correct. Later modified. Which is still there. It is. That would make a great water slide. Right. Well, that that is a seven two seven. 100 series, by the way. Absolutely sure. T-tail, tri-jet, yep. S-duct, yep. short. 727 100 series. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Next one. Ooh. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, that is, I think that's a Gulfstream G650. Is it? It might or be. Or a Bombardier Global Express. Bombardier. Bombardier. It's one, of those, one of those really beautiful private jets. What's Abs the model number? Uh, Global Express, uh, 600EX. Am I, am I close? 7,500. Okay, I think that's one Elon Musk had, isn't it? That is up Very there nice with the glow, with the with the with the Gulf Stream in terms Very of coolness. Nice Just a beautiful, beautiful piece of engineering. And uh, here's the last one. <laughs> that is a. Oh, hang on. Right. So it's a top wing. So it's not a Piper. It could be a Cessna. But it's too curvy to be a Cessna. I think that's a Cirrus. A Cirrus. SR22. I think. Incorrect. What is it? It's a Cessna 182. A 182. Yeah. Interesting. I know the 172, much more square and boxy. <laughs> That's the 182 had the variable pitch. Which oh, is what you made go. it different from the 172. Ah, this is getting okay. really nerdy, man. Well, it this is. It is. It is. But stuff. you're here, and yeah. uh, you need to. You, you've done that, and I think you performed very well. So you mm. passed. Yeah, thank on you. Some of those. Yeah. Uh, great. Now, uh, it, there's a bit of movement going on in front of me here. I can see that there are lots of people moving around. Uh, I wonder if that's because we have an update from down the road, and. Do we see if Ben is still there? Ben, uh, Ben is just offline for a moment and uh, we're just going to try and get him back up. But that is our shot. That is where we're waiting for this plane to appear at the bottom of that road. And I think we're going to have another few minutes while we get Ben back up. Don't go anywhere. We are going to stay on this as tension rises and we're really on the edge of our seats now to find out whether or not, whether or not, this plane will make it here today, tomorrow or Christmas 2022. In the meantime, uh, let's just uh, go back to early this morning when we were chatting um, amongst ourselves about raising money for the Great Western Air Ambulance. And the guys from Pitch have been down to see the Air Ambulance over the last couple of days and have seen the great work that the emergency services do here even in Somerset. Take a look at this. My name's Jim Green, I'm the uh, senior pilot for GWAC here. I've been here for seven years. Before that, I was uh, a pilot up in Aberdeen uh, in the North Sea, taking people out to oil rigs. Before that, I did a bit of uh, instructing and sort of charter work, but I've always been a civilian pilot. You know, in order to become a HEMS pilot, you tend to need quite a specific set of experiences. Um, so they want you to have um, kind of a lot of pilot and command time and then low level flying. The most useful thing I think you can have is landing in confined areas. Everyone does a little bit of that as part of their uh, uh, commercial training, but it's very different from yes. you know when you actually do it for real uh, at a HEM site. Okay, so this is a, uh, an EC-135 helicopter it's called. Um, it used to be Eurocopter, it's now Airbus. They got bought out a few years ago. It's twin engined, um, it weighs just under three tonnes. In my mind, it's one of the best kind of aircraft for HEMS um, and for a couple of reasons. First thing is that uh, it's got quite a high rotor disc uh, and that means that, you know, when our crew are getting in and out, rotors running, which they do all the time, it means that it's quite safe for that. And then it's also got this shrouded tail rotor as well, so you can see that that's kind of uh, encased. And a lot of, you know, places we're landing, they're quite bushy, long grass or things like that. Um, and that just adds an extra sort of layer of uh, protection on there as well. 
the typical setup, so normally we have, you know, myself, obviously I sit in this one which has got the controls, um, but um, although it's a single pilot operation, the paramedics are trained to assist me with a lot of the navigation and some of the radios and, and uh, bits and pieces as well. And also they're an important lookout. Um, so they're, they're an essential part of the HEMS team. We can't do air ambulance without, without the, one of the HEMS crew members, the paramedics on board. Um, and uh, so that's how they, they kind of differ from the doctor as far as we're concerned. The doctors are in the rear and they're classified as medical passengers because we're flying them to the job to assist the patient. Um, but the, the paramedics are trained to kind of assist us with all of that as well. When you get a day like today um, and we can get a job anywhere, um, you know, it's it's a really nice job and it's not that challenging at all. Um, but we get all kinds of exemptions to, which allow us to operate in very poor weather um, and, uh, and things like that, which means that you know, sometimes if it's very low cloud and raining and stuff, we might have to negotiate our way around some, some hills and not be able to see very much. Uh, and that's when the paramedics really come into their own because they're able to just, you know, think ahead a little bit, start looking at routes around some of the high ground on the maps and, you know, and, and plan, for, plan for that. Um, final question. 727 as an office, what do you think? I think that's awesome. Yeah, it's really, really cool. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah. thank you very much, Jim. Um, no worries. And uh, that's great. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying our catch-ups with the Great Western Air Ambulance and all of the work that they do here in the West Country. A very special guest has joined me here in the Pitch Air studio right now. It's Wilf, who's got a microphone. Have you been on board this plane? Yes. And so tell me what your relation to this project is. Well, when I went in there, it was like, a, I think back in the old days, it would be like seriously amazing. Yeah. But now in the modern days, I think it's kind of like a nice, all right suite. Mm. Nice, isn't it? Not a wood in there, isn't there? It's quite old fashioned. Yeah. Yeah. So just explain who your dad is. My dad's Johnny Palmer. There he is, Johnny Palmer. Uh, and he's uh, got to, basically, we've got to thank him for all of this because this has been great, hasn't it? Yeah. If you could fly that plane, where would you take it? Mm, I don't know. I'd like to take it to, um, could it be back in time or like the Yeah, you can go back in time, yeah, go on. Okay, yeah. I'd take go? it back into the Victorian times. Victorian times? Because everyone would be like, wow, because, you know. What does it feel like to own your own aeroplane? It's not really mine, it's my dad's. But, oh, it's your dad's, um, yeah. Yeah, I, just, I think it feels really nice because I, re um, I really like that aeroplane. And um, I like pressing all the buttons at the front. In the cockpit? Yeah. Yeah, I bet it's hugely exciting and I bet you can't wait for it to arrive. Thank you, Wilf. Stay around. I'm sure we will be needing you outside. Let's go back over to social media quickly just to see if what people have been saying, Jamie and Lucy. Well, I, I think just in, I think, I think we've actually got a development for the first time today, but a breaking news brought to you from the social media uh, check-in desk. So Lucy was just excitedly telling me that we might have some video of, of the, the, the van being moved. Yes. So, so one of our citizen journalists out there on the street has uh, really pulled through to, for us today, as they have been doing all day, in fact. Uh, so I think we can see it now. Look at this from Prue Coben. Yep, it's He's been very Prue. active in the Facebook chat. Prue has been very active all day, actually. It's been great. She's been on the Bonville Trading Estate giving us live updates. <laughs> and here it is. <laughs> the van being moved. I mean, who'd have thought a plane without wings would inspire so much community collaboration across six hours on a Saturday morning? There it is. I think... Um, I think that's that's music or music to everyone's eyes here yep. in the studio because and the plane now will be able to get I think, to us. I think that van owner is going to be very confused when they come back. Is it back. a taxi? Is, is there something on the back? It, it could well be a taxi, yeah. Well, they're yeah. going to be a bit confused, I think, when they turn back up to collect their vehicle whenever that happens. Just a simple obstruction cleared <laughs> message. Perfect. 
Um, it would also be good to say that we've had uh, £1,079 um, donated now to the chosen charity, which is really great. And we've also had someone on our Facebook, um, April Blackmore. She has said how Vicky was in the team who lifted her husband to Southmead. So it's all about that, really. Those people who are on those videos that you're watching today, they're real life people who are working with um, the Great Western Ambulance team. They're saving lives, helping out our community. So it really is all about that, isn't it, Jamie? Absolutely. That's actually really nice to see. Uh, talking about inspiring community collaboration, all that sort of stuff. The, the stories that are just being shared in the Facebook chat of like real people who've actually uh, experienced the Great Western Air Ambulance charity. So if you haven't donated yet, just take a look at the comments and see the stories that are being typed up in there because I'm sure after reading them, you will be uh, convinced um, that you, of course, will want to text the word FLY to 70085, which will cost you £3 plus your standard network rate. T's and C's online, but let's stick with the air ambulance service because um, we've got a picture on, on Twitter, haven't we, um, of one of the pilots having a good old gander at what was going on down at the road below. Yep, so um, uh, this has come from the GWAC uh, Twitter again. They've posted some pictures of their pilot um, admiring the, um, the road. If I just click on, you can see that he's looking down observing the plane as it was in situ on the M5, I believe. That's when it was potentially on the move or potentially when it was um, uh, delayed. So uh, that, those are lovely pictures, aren't they? Yeah, what a, a nice perfect day for too. it. Uh, we salute the skills of Steve, the pilot of Pitch Air today. I think we'd be in a very sticky situation if we didn't have Steve uh, leading the way for us. But of course, loads more pictures coming in from people on the streets, giving us um, some great shots of uh, where the plane was just a moment ago before we cleared that obstruction. Uh, but keep them coming in, guys. Hashtag pitch air. Um, we'll be giving you further updates throughout the course of the day. So if you've got something to send in, please do. We'll get it on the air for you. Chris. OK, thank you both very much. And I wonder if we could go anywhere near where the plane is. I'm not quite sure where Lauren is. I think, I think Lauren we're just sending a camera now, and uh, because we've been going since uh, 9 o'clock this morning, um, we have run out of battery on many of the phones that we've been using. So as you can imagine, it's been a very, very busy day for everyone who has had their mobile phones out. and All the batteries have gone flat. Um, however, uh, I, we have actually got some incredible footage of the actual plane, the 727, here in a film. So this is the actual plane that was used. So, as you look through there now, it looks a bit, um, a bit posh, doesn't it? People sitting around, having breakfast, and uh, a man reading a copy of the, what looks like the Financial Times. There are those gold taps that Johnny was talking about, and the soap can... Oh, look at that. Gold everywhere, dripping in bling. And a gold shower head as well. I wonder if that's still in there. I'll have to have a look when it arrives. Um, and that's obviously someone who's enjoying the flight. This must have been pre-2012 when it was left at Filton and moved to Kemble. Ah, look, there's the bed. Incredible. It looks quite old. Let's see, how, R Russia in ruins. Oh, how old's that? Is there a date on there? Can't see it. But uh, I, I don't know, I have a feeling this is probably maybe 2000, 2001. Look at that. That's what it looks like inside. That is how it'll be restored with a big world globe map in glass and silver cutlery and decanters full of wine and all sorts of other. There it is, Financial Times, The Herald, The Wall Street Journal. It's incredible, really, just to see how this plane spent its time and I'm just now, okay, let's come away from that. I'm now looking at the feed from the roof cam that now finally, finally, nearly seven hours since it took off from Kemble, there it is. As we discussed, it's an it. It's snaking its way up. It came from Embry Road, now on to Bourneville Road, coming towards the pitch studios here. 
And I imagine Tony Carey is somewhere outside enjoying this, watching from the street. It looks like it's like a huge, a huge whale coming around the corner, um, trying to get up there towards us. It's a phenomenal sight. And uh, I can see Tony just joining us back in the studio here. I might grab him just a moment. Uh, let's stay on that shot and see if we can follow it coming up the road. I understand that we've got Ben, who has a live camera there. We're just going to see if we can cross over to him now and uh, see the plane close up as we head towards that junction there. Clothier Road, there it is. So let's go to Ben's camera that is currently... There it is. So Ben's camera's now to us live. We'll go across to that. There it is. Uh, and at the bottom of the hill, there is the fuselage of the 727. Looks like we're edging our way up the road and we'll be able to finally welcome it to its home. Um, ben, uh, can you hear us on your live feed down there, Ben? What's the uh, atmosphere like? I can just like? about hear you. It's, it's quite loud, though. Yeah, what's the atmosphere, Ben? The atmosphere, there's a lot of people walking up the road just beside uh, on the pavement. Uh, they're just slowly moving up the hill. It's quite a steep hill for the, uh, the weight of the load, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it looks good. We'll stay on you, Ben. Keep it there. We'll watch it come past you. It's quite wide, isn't it? As it's coming up the hill. Uh, Lucy and Jamie, who are on social media on the other side, what do you make of this? This is phenomenal. I mean, I, I honestly worried that we wouldn't get to, to see what we're seeing now. It, 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 I'm, I'm sort of feeling quite relieved to be able to see it. And um, I don't know, Lucy, it must be magic to your eyes. It is bizarre. <laughs> it is absolutely bizarre. We've done some crazy things in the four years that I've worked at Pitch, but I think this could possibly be one of the bizarre things and we've had a rave in our warehouses and that was weird um but this is this is amazing it's incredible that it's coming up this road after you know tony worrying that that corner wouldn't quite work and also me um resonating those worries but i don't think steve doubted himself for a second well this is it steve the legend hashtag steve the legend buy that man a pint when we can because how incredible has this driver been throughout this whole journey? And such a cool cat. Didn't really want to give much away, did he, when in Johnny interviewed him earlier? Which is, we like that. We like a humble, we, we looks humble like Steve. Uh, but we can obviously see it from the, the, the roof cam. And, oh, there we go. We've got the picture back. Um, so that's the roof oh, cam. So we get into those points w which Johnny was worrying about with, with yeah. the cars, uh, the vans on the side of the road. Oh, yes. But luckily, I think there's enough horse bottoms of width in, in that road for it to get through. <laughs> horse bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the police outrider at the front. Looks like we're squeezing past those trees. And we're finally getting up there. I don't know if we can bring the graphic back up, can we, just to get an idea for those watching who don't know Brislington. Is there a, a graphic of the tracker that can show us uh, exactly where that is? I don't know. Or I suppose, actually, it might, be, it might be that it's already here if Johnny's wearing the tracker, thinking about it. So... Uh, so I can tell you, Chris, that there's one more road they have to pass. Oh, here we go. Right. Okay. Oh, no, there's two. There's two. So it's just gone past that corner bit, and it's yep. going to go uh, past Clothier and then past Dixon and yep. then on the home straight to... That's it. Pitch. So, That's it. So the camera, the, the roof camera is pointing behind Pitch Studios. That's right. Yes. It's behind okay. here. So there is so. still a turn to go. Yeah, yeah, there's a turn after Pitch Studios. Uh, probably it's almost like a U-turn, to be honest with you, to get back down the yard. <laughs> and the map doesn't really show a road. It's going to go from the map, uh, if we could go back to the map, it's going to go up. So it's going to go up to that bit where it's green, which is yes. just out here on the right-hand side, and then it's going to bear right. And it's going to go a right and then a right, so oh, behind yes. that building there. Pirates. So where it says pitch studio, that's not actually... So just past those green right. are, the, are the double, uh, are the big metal that's gates right. that we saw earlier that's on right. when yeah. uh, Lauren, yeah. I think it was, was outside. And we are now making our way back up to the end of it. I'm just... 
I've just called Tony back in, who's now coming back into the studio. Uh, I don't know if you... Have you still got a microphone on? No. I, I think I have. Have I got a microphone? Yes, I have. <laughs> yes, I have. Excellent. Take a seat. You've been outside, Tony, watching what's been happening. Uh, we was... are... Uh, look, can you believe it? We are here. Yes, I'm going to... You've uh... been out. Tell us what you've seen. <laughs> a lot of people. Um, the professionals, the, the driver and his colleagues... They, um, they were just sort of sat there, stood there, chatting quietly. <laughs> Fire. Yeah. Well, they got yeah. the, uh, that truck moved, that, that thing moved. And apparently it had been uh, allegedly stolen and um, <laughs> abandoned. Oh, right. Uh, okay. Did you hear that from the police? No, I, th I, th the, I think it was the driver in shell told him that. Oh, okay. Or one of his, one of his crew. Okay. And um, and there it is. I'm just looking at the width now, that, yeah. how it's going past that vehicle there. Because yeah. outside of our studio doors, there's a, yeah. a, a van parked on the road edge. Yeah, there is, yeah. And I'm, I, he's getting past that quite comfortably. But when it comes past this van, there's a lamppost and a, and a eucalyptus tree. Right. So I'm a little bit, a little concerned. Yeah. Plus my, uh, my bicycle is attached to the... Uh, <laughs> To, to the lamppost. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> so, I'm sure it will be absolutely fine. I'm sure it will. You'll get a knock I, on the door in a minute uh, if it's not. The, the, the driver, again, we, we've spoken, we've sung his praises enough today, really, but when I was chatting to him just now, yeah. he wasn't phased by any of this. Good. He wasn't saying, oh, you know, I'm Good. nervous. He's not phased <laughs> at all. Um, which was a point I think we were all making earlier on, that to do a, a, a job like this requires a different type of character. Mm. I mean, as you've seen, I mean, who... Well, we did see, and on the motorway, it was the, the, the convoy was being overtaken by a lorry, and that lorry would have been um, 60 feet long. That's... Uh, is that 15, uh, 15 12? 12 metres is 40 feet. So to be 60 feet is somewhere like 18 metres long. Yeah. And that lorry was only half the length of that combination there. Right. So it, it makes you wonder, you know, you look, you're huge. looking there, it's, you know... Uh, it is feet. huge, isn't it? In yeah. comparison, I can't wait till it gets around the corner. Did you walk down to the junction to have a look yeah, at I it? Yeah, I, I did. I was, um, I was broadcasting live to the Facebook world. <laughs> Um, and I got to the bottom and I suddenly realised you shouldn't have done that because the battery's not very good on that iPad. Uh, <laughs> and, sure enough, and sure enough, when I got back up, or well, as I turned to, it, it switched itself off. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm battery-less again. So what's quite incredible now is as we look at this picture, here it comes, the 727 fuselage up this road. Look at the number of people who are gathering behind it. Yes. And those people there are following it up, following it to home, we have actually just now stopped. The police officer looks like he's just got off his motorbike and is talking to some of the people on the side. Uh, I'm not sure what he's doing. Is he moving them on? I suspect he might have a word with the driver if he's happy to go past that green van. Oh, I see. There's a green... Yes, the green, the green van. van. That's van right. Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah, let's have yeah. a look. There's the green van. OK, so that's the one... Uh, which could actually be a final obstacle for us before we get to the last turn. I'm, I'm of the opinion that, you see, he, he's not over the double yellow lines yet. He, oh, mind you, he would have to be back because, of, you see how there, classic, the fuselage yeah. is actually overhanging the pavement there. Yeah, yeah. Although yeah. the lorry is sort of a couple of feet clear of the curb. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. And there's the roof camera, OK. So I can see, yes, it is looking quite tight. They are advancing, though, so let's just see. Fingers crossed. because We um, have our we, fingers crossed. We've delayed so long. It's been a long journey. And here we go. So we are now progressing. This is the front of the building. While we're waiting, actually, could the uh, operator of that camera just tilt up just to show us a bit of Bristol, just to get a little bit of an idea of where we are? You'll see the valley... There it is. There's the valley in front of us. You see there the Clifton Suspension Bridge straight through those trees. And emerging on the left-hand side is the lorry. 
And there it is. I think we're going to make it past that, uh, that green van. Tony, look, there it is. Yeah, yeah he's, not, he's not really... I'd say he's not slowing down. Steve is a master at his task, isn't he? Look at him. He's absolutely nailed that. Pitch air coming into land. Air traffic control clearance to yard number two. Runway four. And there it is coming past us. Lucy and Jamie, any social media that we haven't conquered so far that we can talk about as we see the final shots of Pitch Air passing us? I don't think anyone's typing. I think they're just watching. I think this is the moment that, I mean, people, lots of people have, been, have said that they've been tuned in since 9 a.m. this morning. That's since great. People have stuck with the stream for nearly seven hours now. I think people are really invested in seeing the, the, del the safe delivery of, of the, the, the Pitch Air 727. Um, I think, a, one, I think one tweet coming in from um, someone earlier on, I think a picture from earlier on, talking about a three-point turn that the plane's doing. But mm. Lisa, have you seen anything? Yeah, no, I, I was just gonna say, I saw someone say, uh, been watching since nine, I should be doing DIY, but I cannot stop watching. So um, it's a shame about your DIY, but hey, it's a lockdown. I'm sure you can do DIY anytime. <laughs> but um, I, I think, I think it, that we need to say a thank you to the people who have stuck with the stream um, for the, the solid um, six approaching seven hours that we've been on air now. It's, um, you know, your guys' interaction and support, which has helped us spread the word about what's happening today at the Pitch Studios. And of course, with that came a bit more um, awareness and exposure for our charity, the Great Western Air Ambulance Charity, who, of course, we are still raising money for. Um, details popping up on your screen all the time. Um, at text FLY, F-L-Y, to 7008 five and that'll donate three pounds to the great western air ambulance charity and talking of which as we now have a little gap and people are running around trying to work out whether we can get it around the corner we're just going to see if i think we'll stay on this let's go back to the shot outside just because i think it might be that steve decides that we can get around that corner. So we're just going to stay on this shot. Beautiful pictures. Look at the incredible Rainbow. spring afternoon there across Bristol. That's north Bristol. I'm pretty sure if my bearings are right. Yeah, that would be that would be looking northeast up there. We have stopped on the corner. We've got a, a, a live camera on the roadside that. Uh, is watching the progress of the uh, initial driver in the white van, who I think will be liaising with Steve, who's the driver of the lorry, just to see if we can manoeuvre around that corner. It's quite a steep corner. We discussed this earlier, Tony, didn't we, that actually it's, it's a kind of back-on-itself job. So whether or not, and here's a question for you, do, do we drive up that road, not this one, the one to the left, so we carry on straight up, yeah and then reverse it around the corner. Is that the answer? I would think that was the answer because... Um, I'm just mm. trying to think how John, John has got this plan to go up on the... Uh... Does it go in nose first or tail first? Maybe we can... It's going in tails... Uh, right, I'm just hearing... Tail, yeah. Great, I'm just hearing that the nose cone will be over the fence. So if you're walking on the road, you'll be able to look up and see yeah, it. So if Steve it's going to have to go in backwards. Go that, go camera straight on up uh, Bonville Road. That's right. And then comes back and steers that into the yard. That's it, yeah, yeah. So now we're just waiting for a bit of instruction to see what Steve the driver might be doing. I think he's probably liaising at the moment with the police and making it safe for everybody who is standing on the corner up there to see if we can move forward. It's very tense here. We've been going so long, everyone's mobile phones have run out of battery. I think... Uh, my, my iPad's gone run out of battery your, twice. Yeah, your battery's <laughs> on your iPad's gone. Um, I will just see if we can get a message out to Johnny, who I think is out there coordinating this. 
and just see if we can find out from Johnny whether or not the plan is still to reverse it in. OK, we've got a bit of movement now at the front. So the lorry may start approaching the white van as it's pulling away. Let's just see what happens now. We are absolutely gripped. We have a Boeing 727-100, former Japan, Japanese Airlines, sitting there on this road, who'd have believed it, waiting to go into its new home to be lowered tomorrow by crane onto a metal structure, its final landing strip, if you like. And, yeah, some information really about that. Here we go, so we're moving off now. I can just talk you through a little bit about what this plane is while we watch it manoeuvring up. It was a, it's a 727 first delivered to JAL, that's Japanese, Japan Airlines, on uh, December the 5th, 1967. Wow. The aircraft originally uh, registered as JA8325. And it's a 727-100, as I said, 133 foot long, 40.5 meters. And it typically flew around 106 passengers in two classes. The first class at the front of the cabin and obviously the second class towards the rear. The passenger jet would have likely flown domestic services when it worked as a, at the operator JAL. However, it's possible the 727 was also put on a regional international service as well. After flying for the Japanese carrier, the jet was re-registered in September 1975 in Germany as D-A-H-L-Q. It flew for international shipping and transportation company HAPAG. And we're just waiting to get that feedback up now. If I keep, keep telling you a little bit more about this plane. Uh, it, it was a company called Hapag Lloyd, which it was signed to until May 1981. After this, it was used as a corporate jet. What a lovely corporate jet it must have been as well, flying under the registrations. Here they are if you are interested in following these. N4245S. It then became VRCBE, VRCLM, VRCMN. And finally, in its life, it became VPCMN. We're currently just watching now the camera on the ground, out the back of the studio here, looking up the road towards the gates. Now, you might remember we talked earlier on to Ed Hall about the Dean Cooper side of the story. Now, this was fascinating. This was a, uh, a pseudonym of an unidentified man who hijacked a Boeing 727. And he extorted $200,000 in ransom money. That's the equivalent of about $1.2 million dollars now in this day. Uh, he parachuted from the plane by lowering the air stair. Uh, we still don't know what his fate was. Uh, it's one of those mysteries, I think, that will live on as an aviation uh, mystery forever. The perpetrator has never been located or identified. It only remains that the, the unsolved case is the only one that remains in commercial aviation history, which is fascinating, I think. Uh, also in uh, November 1971, a middle-aged man carrying a black attaché case approached the flight counter of Northwest Orient Airlines at Portland International Airport. There he is. Uh, after takeoff, D.B. Cooper, as he was known, handed a note to a flight attendant and, quote, Miss, you'd better read that. I have a bomb. Extraordinary. Demands were met. Cash and parachutes were waiting at Seattle Airport. And hostages were released from the plane. The plane took off towards Mexico City. Sometime between taking off and landing, D.B. Cooper jumped out of the plane. A search and recovery operation, arguably the most extensive in U.S. history, uncovered no significant evidence relating to the hijacking. It was an absolute mystery. This is the shot out the back here now. We'll go back to the, the roving camera. There it is. This is the camera showing the plane which has just gone beyond the junction and is now being reversed round the corner. So, Tony, we've talked about this a lot, but that will be the trolley and the back yes. wheels now turning. The back wheels are doing the hard work They're now. doing the hard work, aren't they, as it's bringing it round over the top of those lampposts. Is it going to have to mount that that I think they're uh, looking for me there. It's actually come over the curb. It does look like that, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. 
and, like and there it is. It's, it's now, it's probably going to fall the curb. Here, so the curb is coming. Let's just hope it, it falls off nice and gently and the plane doesn't fall off the trolley. There we go. All right, there we are. Looks, looks like we have got a, uh, a good route through. No. While we're looking okay. at that, can you see yes. the, where the wing has been cut off? Yes. That looks to me like an inverted Air Force section. It's flat on the top yeah. and curved on the underneath. I see it, yeah. Uh, and, and ordinarily, you would have the curve on, on the on upper the top. surface. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to investigate as to why that's done that. It's obviously a purpose. It, it, it might be... No, I can't think what it would be for, to be truthful. But we'll look into that. Here we go. OK, well, I'm now, thank you, Tony, I'm just outside. And I'm wondering if you can see now the aircraft behind. There it is. And uh, as you can see, it's a bit wobbly. But we have finally a little bit of room each side it looks like we have the space to bring it round and it's fantastic seeing it here it's, it's phenomenal seeing it in real because it's so big it is so huge and i can hear the drone buzzing ahead so the drone will be footage that will be available tomorrow i imagine when eventually the next episode of pitch air takes to the air and you'll see this being lowered onto the shipping containers to my right. I'll just step out of the, the camera shot for a moment, just so you can have a look. I'm joined by Tony. Uh, just Tony's the outside guards, here. The mud guards are well above the wheels now, so obviously yes. that's hydraulically lifted. I see. So these are the, the trolley wheels at the back, which, uh, as it says, rear steering. Um, we are now... We are now I think pretty much through the, 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 the gates, aren't we? That's it, it, yeah. He's coming straight back. We're going to go past the nose cone. The guy's being extra careful, making sure that every single move is safe. They're calling each other. And the drone is up as well. And what a sight, seeing it in the flesh, the massive 727 has arrived and has come into land. Bit of, bit of damage at the back there, by the looks of it. And uh, it's, look at those pipes that lead through, they must be the hydraulic pipes for the, the uh, rear, no, no, the, the tail section. Fuel. Those are hydraulic pipes, the steel ones up yonder, maybe? Yes. Okay, so... It's, uh, it's taking up position. Ooh, just a little bit more. We'll just stop for a second. A moment in aviation history for Bristol and the southwest of the UK as a plane. This 727 is being delivered to pitch here in Brislington. And uh, just take a look, Dave. Look at, these, look at these wheels down here. Look at them. They are twisting and turning. Just getting that angle absolutely perfect as it's lining up the back of the plane with this gap that's going to take it down through here to the back of pitch. And there it is. Can you believe it? I'm hoping that in a minute we can drop that air stair and have a look inside. I'm hoping. We'll have to see if we've got a spare zoom camera or something that could run up inside. We've, we've, uh, we've, uh, we can get, we can get it. I think we, I'm being told we can get a camera inside. A lot of people gathering here. Drone pilot, here's Johnny. Johnny's back out. Now, is that mic on? Are we on camera? Yeah, we are. Where? Where? This one here. Okay. Oh, is that mic on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How do you feel? It's amazing, it's awesome, it's just ridiculous, it's laughable. <laughs> I love it, it's brilliant, it's just crazy. Are you emotional? 
Not emotional, no. It's, it's, ah, it's not like the journey. Emotional? It's a journey, the journey. I'm about to lose complete interest in the whole project and walk out of here and go find <laughs> something else to do. Yeah? <laughs> Excellent. Well, yeah. it's finally here, isn't it? Do it you think there's a here. chance now it's here that you can drop the air stairs or not? Yes. Brilliant. This is ceremonial. This is ceremonial. Say right, again. so. Stay apart from each other. Ah. So, um, are we on that one? Yes, this yeah. one here, yeah. So, um, James, our set builder, James, our set builder, is going to do the honours and he's going to drop the air stairs. Now, one of the things that make a 727 more famous... Let's go this way. Let's have a look. Come, okay. Let's go over here. I suppose you want to actually yep. see the aeroplane. Let's, let's have a look at the aircraft. Because all day today yep. we've been yapping about the aeroplane. Yep. Yep. Really let's have a look. Airplane. Let's walk around. Okay. So talk us through. What have we got? Oh, here we are. It's oh, tied James, on. get your ladders out, mate. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the wheels... Yep. Uh, what are they, tied up? Are they, yes, they look like they're a, hanging down. So being a landing gear, it obviously lifts up inside for when it's transporters. Yeah. When yeah. we lift it out, there's probably a strap. We'll let it flap down and then drop a pin through a thing called an oleo strut, which stops it rotating. Yeah, yeah, yep. got you. And that'll Absolutely. be tomorrow. And uh, these are the, well, I suppose with the pitot chutes, there's another one there. These yes. are what uh, give you a good measure of where you're up down, altitude, no, air pressure. No, pitot tubes are specifically rear and front pressure differences. Pressure differences, which yes. Which indicates um, airspeed. Airspeed, yes. airspeed, that's right. Yeah. And uh, I can hear the drone up. I yeah. hope we'll see those pictures we at have, some we point. We have an actual this aircraft. Be, this, this is our real <laughs> aircraft, actually. So yeah. let's go on, Johnny. Take us down. Okay, let's cool. have a look and see if uh, so come here with it us, is. come with us. What a monster. It's actually hard to get your head around the scale of these things. They're absolute monsters. And just for one little tiny visual reference, if you look here, you'll see how thick the aluminium is, and it gives you an indication of what the weight of this thing is. Some parts are quite thin, but it's like chunky as. That's like 12 millimetres of aluminium there. Really, really lumpy stuff. And so, has that been cut? It here, has then? indeed been cut. Okay. Yes. So you'll never get a wing back on there again. We could get something that looks like a wing. You could get a, yeah, go. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not so, flying anytime soon. Though. It's not flying. I know. Yeah. We're going to go to the end. Let's see if we've got enough cable to get up here. The okay. magical end. And there is the back of the plane. Isn't this phenomenal? So I've got to say at this point while we're waiting, yeah, you and I might be the front men here, but we're not the hard workers nah. at all. <laughs> Pete, the guy you met earlier, have you met yeah. Pete? Yes. No. Metal worker. He worked his backside off making all these RSJs. Yeah. James has been doing painting containers, an absolutely horrible, thankless job, tarring the top of containers <laughs> for weeks. Uh, Alex, Alex Thompson has been putting in the water pipes and the three-phase power. Who else has been involved in this? Oh, everyone. Jordan. Um, Jordan has Joe. been. Joe. Joe. Yeah. yeah, Joseph has been the producer behind the scenes. Yeah. And you dragged him on stage. I did. I got All him. All these on. people are awesome. Yeah. Got him on. Got him you on. and I might be, the, you know, the charming, charismatic, good-looking <laughs> guys on the cameras. Yeah. Hard work, not so much. Yeah. Maybe you, but not me. Yeah. And so let's yeah. look at. I will have to stop you there. All these plaudits. Now, yeah. uh, what's going to happen now? Just take us through, because we're now nearly four o'clock, aren't we? What's the next stage? One last big thank you. The wife, Kathy, who doesn't want to go on camera. There she's over there. Yeah. We won't put her on camera, but Most I can see Most of the good ideas it. are hers. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. But thank yeah. you, Cathy. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right, so, air stairs. Quite unique to a Boeing 727, except the Tupelo 154, I think, had them as well. Yeah. So these are stairs that come down at the back of the aircraft. Question is, why can't all aircraft have that? It's yeah. because the engine position doesn't allow it, and they're often too high off the ground. Right. 727s are very low to the ground because the gotcha. engines are high. Gotcha. So what's going to happen is, James, here, set builder, is going to release these ratchet straps, and the air stairs are either going to drop down violently and go bang, or they're going to go pssst, like that. What do you reckon? I don't know. It could go either way. Right. It. From a risk management point of view, we're going to assume they're going to drop violently, yeah? And stand okay. back. Okay. But if they drop gently, that's good. This could be uh, another moment yep. that this is... uh, will mark this uh, day as the air stairs come crashing down. This is what we call a dynamic risk assessment. It is. Something could go wrong. How do we manage that? Stand back. All Stand good. back and just watch. Yep. So uh, <laughs> we're playing this all by ear. Yeah. Uh, they're getting the ladders ready. Yeah. And uh, at some point, uh, we're going to let go and see what happens. So where are they going to come down? Here, this bit? Yeah, so the air stairs are this bit. The hinges in there. Yeah. They run up to here. Great. And then inside there is some inverted stairs that will then be normal. And we have stairs up the back. Great. OK. Yeah. Excellent. And I hear the lorry's off, so we are now calm and waiting for what's happening next. So, waiting Thanks for you guys. Okay. Go for it. Water. Everyone out of the way. Stand back, everyone. Everyone stand back. We're waiting. Of, like fizzy water or something. To, I don't know, should we spray the aeroplane with something? Is, is that a thing? Uh, is that a thing? Ball, yeah. Is that what you do? Smash the bottle? <laughs> it oh, might break. <laughs> Does producer Joseph want to sort that out? Wolf could smash. I think Cathy should. I think my wife Cathy should. Cathy, would you be up for that? Okay, all right. So, 
The straps are off. Straps are off. Hang on, well forth, Max, stand back, stand back. Everyone stand back. Okay, there's another strap here. Anything can happen. Yeah. Kathy, can you please do the champagne? Maybe Paula can talk her into it. She, you accused me of being a self-promoting narcissist and now I'm giving you the chance to be on camera. <laughs> No, it's going to be on camera though, once the stairs drop, babes. What do you want it to do? Just like, I don't know. You can do it, babe. What do you think, Chris? Well, I think probably smashing it might be too much. Why don't you spray it over the plane? Yeah, do that. Yeah, spray yeah. it over the plane. Because yeah. then there's no broken glass. <laughs> and the ladder's going up. Oh, Matt, Max, Max, do you want a video Max? Do you want a video? Or do you want a video? There we go. And... Oh, Laura, that's definitely... Yeah, here we go. Okay. Are we ready for this? Everyone stand back. We... It might crash down. What are we doing? Here we go. Here we, we go. Get, can we get someone else who's actually done some work today? Here we go. Wait yeah? for it. Are we ready? Here we go. Wait. Stand by. Yep. Oh, this is... Whoa! Ah. Uh, oh. Gentle. I was hoping for a crash, to be honest. Look at that. Still yeah. got some uh, hydraulic pressure. What That's do we do? phenomenal. Watch it now, let's go home, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll need to find a camera that will get us on board. Well. Because I don't think we've got enough zoom, just cable zoom on, link this. on a... Yeah, they're coming yeah. around. We'll do that in a right. second. So one's coming round. Um, and the water, I assume the radio mics will work around here because we are right on the edge, probably. But uh, this is the back way up. It is. Can we get, some, can we get some production crew? And I've been working their backsides Bring off Bring them today. out. Bring yeah. out the production crew. Uh, forklift. Yeah. We're just going to bring out the production crew, if we can. Joe in there. Tell Joe to come out. OK, cool. All right. So, Kathy, you're going to fire this. So here we go. Go right, on then, cool. Johnny. Let shoot it the off. Shoot the plane. Shoot the plane. Are you shaking it? Do I have to shake it first? Okay. Hey, Laurie, Lon. Yeah. Gonna fire some no secco, alcohol-free prosecco, so I can guzzle it from the bottle. Yeah. You ready? Go on then. Where shall I shoot it? Up on that. In the hole. In the hole. In the hole. <laughs> Great. You ready? Excellent. Oh. Here we go. Whoa! There we go. Hey. Right. There cool. we go. Chris, after you, mate. Great. Yeah. So we're just waiting yeah. for a camera to appear <laughs> so we could go on. Yeah. And yeah. uh I'm share that out with the crew. So Ooh. we're just waiting for a camera to come so we can get on board. Johnny's enjoying the uh, the <laughs> moment that's uh, <laughs> essentially a culmination of a year right. trying to get this to plane to yeah. Bristol right. and here it is. Right. Put that there. Nice. Whoa. And uh uh I'm just waiting for it to see if we can get a camera. Can we get a camera to go on board so we can see? You could use um you could use a zoom camera, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah, just yeah. waiting for one to come down. Yeah, and, uh, and I assume we can go up the stairs. Uh, hang on, Isn't guys. Chris is going to lead the way. He's the Let's boss, right? He's the, um, he's the presenter. Ha <laughs> ha. Check it out. It looks amazing. <laughs> Have we got a Zoom camera? Is that a Zoom camera? So we're on Zoom now, are we? Great. So here we go. Hopefully the radio mic will work. So should we go up? Can you hear me on it? I can hear yes, you. Yes, the yeah. radio mic is working, yeah. so yes. Let's try. Bring in the hole. Okay. Kathy? It smells a bit like a caravan. A lot like a caravan. Door, can you still hit me out there? <laughs> okay. Hey, Chris, don't you want a camera to show what you're... I am. I'm just waiting for it to come up. Oh, I'm see, getting the see, special distancing. Of course. Look. We'll come up to the end here. And then in we come. Oh. How does this look? This is just insane, isn't it? It's actually <laughs> arrived. It's finally landed. And this is it. This is it. And what a culmination then to the full day that has been getting this to pitch. I think the final word should go to you then, Johnny. Uh, okay, let's go through this way. Should we talk about the big messages here? Go on then. A bit like the wine back on a kid's TV show, yeah? <laughs> okay. From the cockpit, no, no it's doubt. It's probably a bit dark in here, isn't it? Careful of my uh, questionable electrics. Oh, the door. oh I'm going to click on the buttons. Okay. Uh, can you, I don't, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Sorry, mate. 
Have you lost us? Okay, you can hear me. Okay, so it's slightly chaotic now because we essentially you got have me? lost. Cool. Okay, so um, <laughs> thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks, Chris, George, Alex, Joseph, uh, Dave, the interns, Paula, Lucy, everyone amazing. And let's, let's remember <laughs> that we're doing this project as a way of upcycling industrial waste to create a really collaborative uh, community space, which is good for our social capital within our business. Basically, it's a fun project. It's not bad for the environment. It's been a lot of fun. That's what it's about. So I suppose I've not got much else to add to that, have I? No? Okay, thanks. So um, thanks for watching, everyone. And maybe see you on board Pitch Air soon. Thanks for watching indeed. Thank you, Johnny. And thanks everyone for getting involved wherever you are. I'm just going to walk back to the studio and say goodbye. And there we are. Thank you very much indeed. We uh, left Johnny out on the plane celebrating this milestone here. Thank you very, very much indeed for watching. And thanks to the crew here at Pitch for making this possible. And thank you to you for donating to the Great Western Air Ambulance. We raised over £1,000 from myself, Jamie and Lucy here on social media and from everyone here at Pitch. Goodbye. <laughs>